Disobedience leads to failure. Some of these Arab tribes who refused to give the obligatory charity did attack Medina, as they did not expect much resistance, as most of the Muslim soldiers had left with the army led by Usama bin Zayed, may Allah be pleased with him. But as reinforcements had arrived into Medina, the attack was repelled successfully by Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him and his men. In another battle led by Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, they managed to heavily defeat some Arab tribes who had apostatized. As a result, these tribes executed many of their own tribesmen who had been firm on Islam and did not apostatize. But this only strengthened the resolve of the Muslims who fought even harder to defeat the apostates. Eventually, many of these tribes submitted to the truth and repented. They sent their delegates to Medina with their obligatory charities. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, pages 366 to 369. It is important for Muslims to understand a simple yet profound lesson, namely, they will never succeed in this world or the next in worldly or religious matters through the disobedience of Allah, the Exalted. Since the dawn of time to this age and till the end of time no person has ever achieved true success, nor will they ever through the disobedience of Allah, the Exalted. This is quite obvious when one turns the pages of history. Therefore, when a Muslim is in a situation which they desire to achieve a positive and successful outcome from, they should never choose to disobey Allah, the Exalted, irrespective of how tempting or easy it may seem to be. Even if one is advised by their close friends and relatives to do so, as there is no obedience to the creation if it means disobedience to the Creator. And in truth, they will never be able to protect them from Allah, the Exalted, and His punishment in either this world or the next. The same way Allah, the Exalted, grants success to those who obey Him, He removes a successful outcome from those who disobey Him, even if this removal takes time to witness. A Muslim should not be fooled, as this will occur sooner or later. The Holy Quran has made it extremely clear that an evil plan or action only encompasses the doer, even if this punishment is delayed. Chapter 35 Fatir, verse 43 But the evil plot does not encompass except its own people. Therefore, no matter how difficult the situation and choice, Muslims should always choose the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, in both worldly and religious matters, as this alone will lead to true success in both worlds, even if this success is not obvious immediately. Blind Loyalty During the apostate wars, Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, faced another great threat namely, the false prophets and their followers. In most cases, even though the followers of these false prophets were aware of their leader's falsehood, yet they still followed them blindly. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, pages 398 to 399. This type of blind loyalty occurs when people form bonds based on worldly things, such as lineage and friendship. Muslims must avoid this attitude as it leads to trouble in both worlds. With the passing of time, people often become divided and lose the strong connection they once had with one another. There are many causes of this, but a major cause is the foundation on which their connection was formed by their parents and relatives. It is commonly known that when the foundation of a building is weak, the building will either get damaged over time or even collapse. Similarly, when the foundation of bonds connecting people are not correct, the bonds between them will eventually weaken or even break. When the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, brought the companions, may Allah be pleased with them. Together he formed the bonds between them for the sake of Allah, the Exalted. Whereas, most Muslims today bring people together for the sake of tribalism, brotherhood, and to show off to other families. Even though the majority of the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, were not related, but as the foundation of the bonds connecting them was correct namely, for the sake of Allah, the Exalted, their bonds grew from strength to strength. Whereas, many Muslims nowadays are related by blood yet, with the passing of time, become separated, as the foundation of their bonds was based on falsehood namely, tribalism and similar things. 
Muslims must understand that if desire for their bonds to endure and to earn reward for fulfilling the important duty of upholding the ties of kinship and the rights of non-relatives, then they must only forge bonds for the sake of Allah, the Exalted. The foundation of this is that people only connect with one another and act together in a way which is pleasing to Allah, the Exalted. This has been commanded in the Holy Quran. Chapter 5 al maida verse 2 and cooperate in righteousness and piety, but do not cooperate in sin and aggression. Dangerous Cravings During the apostate wars, Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, faced another great threat namely, the false prophets and their followers. In most cases, even though the followers of these false prophets were aware of their leader's falsehood, yet they still followed them blindly. Others accepted them out of greed of obtaining wealth and leadership which they had promised their followers if they supported them. This creed even seized some of the weaker Muslims who had recently accepted Islam. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, pages 398 to 399. In a narration found in Jami at Termidi, number 2376, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, Peace and blessings be upon him, warned that craving for wealth and status is more destructive to one's faith than the destruction caused by two hungry wolves which are set free on a herd of sheep. This shows that hardly any of a Muslim's faith remains secure if they crave after wealth and fame in this world, just as hardly any of the sheep will be saved from two hungry wolves. So this great similitude contains a severe warning against the evil of craving after excess wealth and social status in the world. The first type of craving for wealth is when one has extreme love for wealth and strives without fatigue to acquire it through lawful means. To behave in such a manner is not the sign of wise person, as a Muslim should firmly believe their provision is guaranteed to them, and this allotment can never change. In fact, the provision of the creation was allocated over 50,000 years before the creation of the heavens and the earth. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6748. This person will undoubtedly neglect their duties, as they are too preoccupied with obtaining wealth. A body which is too busy acquiring wealth will never prepare adequately for the hereafter. In fact, this person will dedicate so much effort to acquiring wealth that they may not even get a chance to enjoy it. Instead, they will depart this world and leave it behind for other people to enjoy even though they will be held accountable for it. This person may acquire wealth lawfully, but they will still not find peace of mind, as no matter how much they obtain, they will only desire more. This person is needy and therefore a real pauper, even if they possess much wealth. The only craving which is beneficial is craving for accumulating true wealth, namely, righteous deeds, in order to prepare for one's day of return. The second type of craving for wealth is similar to the first type, but in addition to it, this type of person acquires wealth through unlawful means and fails to fulfill the rights of people, such as the obligatory charity. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has warned against this in many narrations. For example, in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6576, he warned that this attitude destroyed the past nations as they made unlawful things lawful, withheld the rights of others, and killed others for the sake of excess wealth. This person strives for the wealth they are not entitled to, which leads to countless major sins. When one adopts this attitude, they become intensely greedy. As warned by the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1961, the greedy person is far from Allah, the exalted, far from paradise, far from people, and close to hell. In fact, a narration found in Sunan and Nasai, number 3114, warns that extreme greed and true faith will never combine in the heart of a true Muslim. If a Muslim adopts this type of craving, then the extreme danger of it is clear even to an uneducated Muslim. It will destroy their faith until nothing except a little remains, just like the main narration under discussion warns that this destruction to one's faith is more severe than the destruction caused by two hungry wolves which are let loose on a herd of sheep. This Muslim risks losing the little faith they possess at the moment of their death, which is the greatest loss. 
A person's craving for fame and status is arguably more destructive to one's faith than craving for excess wealth. A person will often spend their beloved wealth on obtaining fame and prestige. It is rare for someone to obtain status and fame and still remain firm on the correct path whereby they prioritize the hereafter over the material world. In fact, a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6723, warns that a person who seeks status in society, such as leadership, will be left to deal with it themselves. But if someone receives it without asking for it, they will be aided by Allah, the Exalted, in remaining obedient to Him. This is the reason the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, would not appoint a person who requested to be appointed in a position of authority or even showed desire for it. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6923. Another narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 7148, warns that people will be keen to obtain status and authority, but it will be a great regret for them on the Day of Judgment. This is a dangerous craving as it forces one to strive intensely to obtain it and then strive further in order to hold on to it even if it encourages them to commit oppression and other sins. The worst type of craving for status is when one obtains this through religion. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has warned in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2654, that this person will go to hell. Therefore, it is safer for a Muslim to avoid the craving for excess wealth and high social status, as they are two things which can lead to the destruction of their faith by distracting them from preparing adequately for the hereafter. Leniency During the apostate wars, Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, faced another great threat namely, the false prophets and their followers. In most cases, even though the followers of these false prophets were aware of their leader's falsehood, yet they still followed them blindly. Others accepted them out of greed of obtaining wealth and leadership, which they had promised their followers if they supported them. This greed even seized some of the weaker Muslims who had recently accepted Islam. Two generals of one of the false prophets, Aswad al-Ansi, who was killed during the last days of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, attempted to mobilize forces against the Islamic nation. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, dispatched an army against them and these two were eventually captured and sent to Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, as prisoners of war. They both repented for their actions and declared their re-entry into Islam. As a result Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, set them free. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, pages 410 to 411. Leniency and overlooking the faults of others are important qualities to adopt. All Muslims hope that on Judgment Day Allah, the Exalted, will put aside, overlook and forgive their past mistakes and sins. But the strange thing is that most of these same Muslims who hope and pray for this do not treat others in the same way. Meaning, they often latch on to the past mistakes of others and use them as weapons against them. This is not referring to those mistakes which have an effect on the present or future. For example, a car accident caused by a driver which physically disables another person is a mistake which will affect the victim in the present and future. This type of mistake is understandably difficult to let go and overlook. But many Muslims often latch on to the mistakes of others which do not influence the future in any way, such as a verbal insult. Even though, the mistake has faded away, yet these people insist on reviving and using it against others when the opportunity presents itself. It is a very sad mentality to possess, as one should understand that people are not angels. At the very least a Muslim who hopes for Allah, the Exalted, to overlook their past mistakes should overlook the past mistakes of others. Those who refuse to behave in this manner will find that the majority of their relationships are fractured as no relationship is perfect. They will always be a disagreement which can lead to a mistake in every relationship. Therefore, the one who behaves in this manner will end up lonely as their bad mentality causes them to destroy their relationships with others. It is strange that these very people hate to be lonely, yet adopt an attitude which drives others away from them. This defies logic and common sense. 
All people want to be loved and respected while they are alive and after they pass away. But this attitude causes the very opposite to occur. While they are alive, people become fed up with them, and when they die, people do not remember them with true affection and love. If they do remember them, it is merely out of custom. Letting the past go does not mean one needs to be overly nice to others, but the least one can do is be respectful according to the teachings of Islam. This does not cost anything and requires little effort. One should therefore learn to overlook and let the past mistakes of people go. Perhaps then Allah, the Exalted, will overlook their past mistakes on the Day of Judgment. Chapter 24 and Nur, verse 22. And let them pardon and overlook. Would you not like that Allah should forgive you? And Allah is forgiving and merciful. Avoiding stubbornness. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, dispatched an army to deal with the apostates of Hadramut and Kinder. Their dissension occurred over a simple matter which should have been avoided. The governor of Hadramut was once distributing charity and mistakenly gave the incorrect camel to a person. This person's objections were not answered and when he sought the aid of a prominent member of his tribe, this resulted in an all-out fight. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, pages 412 to 413. This simple matter could have been resolved if stubbornness from both sides was avoided. Some adopt stubbornness in worldly matters, and as a result they do not change their character for the better. Instead, they remain steadfast on their attitude, believing this is somehow a sign of their great strength and wisdom. Steadfastness in matters of faith is a praiseworthy attitude, but in most worldly matters it is only called stubbornness, which is blameworthy. Unfortunately, some believe if they change their attitude it demonstrates weakness, or it shows that they are admitting their fault, and because of this, they stubbornly fail to change for the better. Adults behave like immature children by believing that if they change their behavior, it means they have lost, while others who remain steadfast on their attitude have won. This is simply childish. In reality, an intelligent person will remain steadfast on matters of faith, but in worldly matters they will change their attitude as long as it is not sinful in order to make their life easier. So changing to improve one's life is not a sign of weakness, it is in fact a sign of intelligence. In many cases, a person refuses to change their attitude and expects others in their life to change theirs, such as their relatives. But what often occurs is that due to stubbornness, all remain in the same state, which only leads to regular disagreements and arguments. A wise person understands that if the people around them do not change for the better than they should, this change will improve the quality of their life and their relationship with others, which is much better than going around in circular arguments with people. This positive attitude will eventually cause others to respect them, as it takes real strength to change one's character for the better. Those who remain stubborn will always find something to be annoyed about which will remove peace from their life. This will cause further difficulties in all aspects of their life, such as their mental health. But those who adapt and change for the better will always move from one station of peace to another. If one achieves this peace, does it really matter if others believe they only changed because they were wrong? To conclude, to remain steadfast on the teachings of the Holy Quran and the traditions of Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, is praiseworthy. But in worldly matters and in cases where no sin is committed, a person should learn to adapt and change their attitude so that they find some peace in this world. Objecting to evil During the apostate wars, some Arab tribes who had apostatized were brought back to Islam through the advice and preaching of their fellow tribesmen. These people risked their lives and the lives of their families all for the sake of standing up for the truth out of sincerity to Allah, the Exalted. An example of this was Maran ibn D, may Allah be pleased with him, who publicly addressed his people without any fear of the consequences. Through his sincere efforts Allah, the Exalted, guided his tribe back to Islam. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, pages 420 to 421. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, 
peace and blessings be upon him, has advised the importance of objecting to evil things in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4340. This narration clearly shows that it is a duty on all Muslims to object to all forms of evil, according to their strength and means. The lowest level, as mentioned in this narration, is rejecting the evil with one's heart. This shows internally approving evil actions, is one of the ugliest of those things which are forbidden. In fact, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4345, that the one who is present when an evil is committed and denounces it is like the one who was not present. But the one who was absent and approved the evil deed is like the one who was present when it was committed. The first two aspects of objecting to evil, mentioned in the main narration under discussion, are through one's physical actions and speech. This is only a duty on a Muslim who has the strength to do so, for example, they will not be harmed by their actions or words. It is important to note, objecting to evil with one's hand does not refer to fighting. It refers to correcting the evil actions of others, such as returning the rights of someone which have been unlawfully violated. The one who is in a position to do so yet, refrains from doing so, has been warned of a punishment in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4338. The Holy Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, has advised Muslims in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2191 that they should not fear the creation in respect to speaking the truth. In fact, the one who allows the fear of the creation to prevent them from objecting to evil things has been described as the one who hates themselves and will be criticized by Allah, the Exalted, on Judgment Day. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 4008. It is important to note, this does not refer to the one who remains silent out of fear of being harmed, as this is an acceptable excuse, but it refers to the person who remains silent because of the status people hold in their eyes. A narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4341, advises that a person can give up objecting to evil things through their actions and speech when others obey their greed, follow their incorrect opinions and desires, and when they prefer the material world over the hereafter. It does not take a scholar to conclude this time has arrived. Chapter 5 al maida verse 105 O you who have believed, upon you is responsibility for yourselves. Those who have gone astray will not harm you when you have been guided. But it is important to note, a Muslim should continue with this important duty in respect to their dependents, as this is a duty on them according to a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 2928, and in respect to those they feel physically and verbally safe from as this is the superior attitude. Objecting to evil things which are apparent, is what the main narration under discussion refers to. Meaning, it does not grant permission to Muslims to spy on others in order to find evil things to object to. Spying and anything associated with it in this respect, are forbidden. Chapter 49 Al-Hajarat, verse 12. O oh, you who have believed, do not spy. It is important to note, that a Muslim must object to evil according to the teachings of Islam and not their own desires. A Muslim may believe they are acting for sake of Allah, the Exalted, when they are not. This is proven when they object to evil in a way which contradicts the teachings of Islam. In fact, what is considered a good deed may well become a sin because of this negative attitude. A Muslim must object to evil in a gentle and fair way preferably in private, in accordance to the teachings of the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. The opposite of these characteristics will only push people away from sincerely repenting and may lead to further sins as a result of angering them. Holding on to faith. Prior to the death of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. The false prophet Aswad al-Ansi began to spread his message and forced people to believe in him. Abu Muslim al-Kailani, may Allah have mercy on him, remained firm on Islam, which resulted in Aswad ordering for him to be thrown into a large fire. To the amazement of the people, the fire did not harm Abu Muslim, may Allah have mercy on him. Aswad was then advised to exile him, 
before this miracle became a means for the people to reject him. Abu Muslim, may Allah have mercy on him, eventually reached Medina during the caliphate of Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him. After entering the mosque of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, he was questioned about his identity by Umar ibn Qatab, may Allah be pleased with him. As the latter was perceptive, he inquired if he was the man who Allah, the Exalted, protected from the fire. Abu Muslim, may Allah have mercy on him, was forced to admit the truth and as a result Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, proudly seated him in between himself and Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, praised Allah, the Exalted, for showing him a person who he protected from fire, just like he protected the Holy Prophet Ibrahim, peace be upon him. Chapter 21 Al-Anbiya, verses 28 to 29. They said, Burn him, Prophet Ibrahim, peace be upon him, and support your gods, if you are to act. We, Allah said, O fire, be coolness and safety upon Abraham. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, pages 422 to 423. Generally speaking, this incident indicates the importance of holding on to one's faith in times of extreme difficulties. In a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 7400, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that the one who continues worshipping Allah, the Exalted, during widespread turmoil and seditions is like the one who has emigrated to the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, during his lifetime. The reward of emigrating to the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, during his lifetime was a great deed. In fact, it erased all of one's previous sins according to a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 321. Worshipping Allah, the Exalted, means to continue sincerely obeying Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions and being patient with destiny, according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. It is obvious that the time mentioned in this narration has arrived. It has become very easy to become misguided from the teachings of Islam as worldly desires have opened up for the Muslim nation. Therefore, Muslims should not get distracted by them and avoid controversial issues and people, and instead remain obedient to Allah, the Exalted, in every aspect of their life if they desire to obtain the reward mentioned in this narration. Accountability During his caliphate, Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, would constantly hold his governors accountable for their actions and regularly met them in person to undertake this order. He often reminded them that as leaders they were the servants of the people and just like him, needed to spend their time working tirelessly for the benefit of the people. They needed to lead a simple and rough life so that their people could lead a comfortable life. They needed to rest little and instead deal with the affairs of the people. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, pages 427 to 428. His attitude is a stark contrast from the behavior of the leaders of today. He behave as monarchs over their subjects and are more concerned about their personal comfort than the comfort of their people. Generally speaking, this type of accountability of one's actions must be undertaken by everyone as all people, whether leaders or followers, will be held accountable for their actions on the Day of Judgment. It is important for Muslims to regularly assess their own deeds as no one except Allah, the Exalted, is better aware of them than themselves. When one honestly judges their own deeds it will inspire them to sincerely repent from their sins and encourage them towards righteous deeds. But the one who fails to regularly assess their deeds will lead a life of heedlessness whereby they commit sins without sincerely repenting. This person will find the weighing of their deeds on the day of judgment extremely difficult. In fact, it may well cause them to be hurled into hell. A clever business owner will always regularly assess their accounts. This will ensure their business heads in the right direction and ensures they complete all the necessary accounts, such as a tax return, correctly. But the foolish business owner will not regularly take accounts of their business. This will lead to a loss in profits and a failure in correctly preparing for their accounts. 
Those who fail to file their accounts correctly with the government face penalties, which only makes their lives more difficult. But the key thing to note is that the penalty of failing to correctly assess and prepare one's deeds for the scales of judgment day does not involve a monetary fine. Its penalty is more severe and truly unbearable. Chapter 99 as Zalala, verses 7 to 8. So whoever does an atom's weight of good will see it. And whoever does an atom's weight of evil will see it. Uniting on sincerity. One of major causes of the apostate wars was the blind loyalty of people to their tribes and clans. This blind loyalty encouraged many of the Muslims to apostatize, even though they did not have a problem with being Muslim. Therefore, one of the aims of Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, was to continue the teachings of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, by removing the concept of blind loyalty to one's tribe, clan and family, and instead unite the people under the banner of Islam. This would ensure Muslims would fulfill the rights of others and treat them kindly, even if there were no worldly bonds between them. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, pages 428 to 429. This sincerity to others is in fact a cornerstone of Islam. In a narration found in Sahih Muslim number 196, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that Islam is sincerity towards to the general public. This includes desiring the best for them at all times and showing this through one's words and actions. It includes advising others to do good, forbidding them from evil, to be merciful and kind to others at all times. This can be summed up by a single narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 170. It warns that one cannot be a true believer until they love for others what they desire for themselves. Being sincere to people is so important that according to the narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 57, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, placed this duty next to establishing the obligatory prayer and donating the obligatory charity. From this narration alone, one can understand its importance, as it has been placed with two vital obligatory duties. It is a part of sincerity towards people, that one is pleased when they are happy and sad, whenever they are grieved, as long as their attitude does not contradict the teachings of Islam. A high level of sincerity includes one going to extreme limits to make the lives of others better, even if this puts themselves in difficulty. For example, one may sacrifice purchasing certain things in order to donate the wealth to the needy. Desiring and striving to always unite people on good, is a part of sincerity towards others. Whereas, dividing others is a characteristic of the devil. Chapter 17 Al-Isra, verse 53. Satan certainly seeks to sow discord among them. One way of uniting people is to veil the faults of others and advise them privately against sins. The one who ACTS in this way will have their sins veiled by Allah, the Exalted. This is confirmed in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1426. Whenever possible, one should advise and teach the aspects of religion and the important aspects of the world to others, so that both their worldly and religious lives improve. A proof of one's sincerity to others is that they support them in their absence for example, from the slander of others. Turning away from others and only worrying about oneself is not the attitude of a Muslim. In fact, this is how most animals behave. Even if one cannot change the whole society, they can still be sincere in helping those in their life, such as their relatives and friends. Simply put, one must treat others how they desire people to treat them. Chapter 28 al Qasas, verse 77 And do good as Allah has done good to you. Thinking things through. During his caliphate Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, dispatched an army under the leadership of Khalid bin Walid, may Allah be pleased with him, to fight the false prophet Tulaiha al-Azdi and his followers who had grown into a formidable force. Tulaiha invited the Tai tribe towards his religion, and they initially responded by sending many of their soldiers to join his campaign. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, also dispatched Adi bin Hatim, May Allah be pleased with him, to this tribe, a tribe he belonged to, in order to convince them not to apostatize. 
they eventually accepted his admonishment and promised him to call back the fighters that had went out to join Tulaha. When Khalid eventually met Adi, may Allah be pleased with them, the latter managed to convince the former to hold off attacking the Tai tribe, even though their initial actions resulted in the deaths of some companions, may Allah be pleased with them. Khalid, may Allah be pleased with him, could have acted hastily out of revenge, but instead he agreed to wait for three days. Within this time the soldiers of the Tai tribe, who initially went out to join Tulaiha, returned and all of them, under the supervision of Adi bin Hatim, may Allah be pleased with him, join Khalid and his army, may Allah be pleased with them. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, pages 430 to 437. This incident indicates the importance of thinking things through, as Khalid, may Allah be pleased with him, had the authority to attack the Tai tribe, yet he patiently waited. Therefore, a dangerous and violent situation became one of reconciliation and peace. In a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2012, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that thinking things through is from Allah, the exalted, while being hasty is from the devil. This is an extremely important teaching to understand and act on, as Muslims who perform much righteous deeds often destroy them through hastiness. For example, they may utter some evil words in a fit of rage which may cause them to plunge into hell on judgment day. This has been warned in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2314. The vast majority of sins and difficulties, such as arguments, occur because people fail to think things through and instead act in a hasty way. The sign of intelligence is when one thinks before speaking or acting, and only proceeds when they know their speech or action is good and beneficial in worldly or religious matters. Even though a Muslim should not delay in performing righteous deeds yet, they should still think things through before performing them. This is because a righteous deed may receive no reward simply because its conditions and etiquettes have not been fulfilled because of one's hastiness. In this respect, one should only move forward in any matter after they have thought things through. The one who behaves in this manner will not only minimize their sins and increase their obedience to Allah, the exalted, but they will minimize the difficulties they encounter, such as arguments and disagreements, in all aspects of their life. Overpraising Abu Bakr dispatched Khalid bin Walid, may Allah be pleased with them, to many different areas in order to engage with many different Arab tribes who had apostatized. Khalid, may Allah be pleased with him, moved from one place to the next, gaining victory wherever he went. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, wrote a letter to him, congratulating him on his victories, yet balanced his praise for him by firstly attributing his success to Allah, the Exalted, and by instilling him with the fear of Allah, the Exalted. Vital ingredients needed to avoid arrogance. The letter included, may Allah increase you in goodness that he has blessed you with, and fear Allah, the Exalted, regarding all your affairs, for indeed, Allah, the Exalted, is with those who fear Him and those who do good deeds. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, page 440. In a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 2662, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned against over-praising others. This is a disliked deed, as it firstly can be sinful if the praise is based on falsehood. Even if it is true over praising people especially, the ignorant can cause them to become proud. This is an evil characteristic, as an atom's worth of it is enough to take one to hell. This has been warned in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 265. Overpraising can even cause the praised person to believe they have fulfilled their potential in obeying Allah, the Exalted, and therefore do not need to strive harder in his obedience. A Muslim should not be fooled by the praise of others, as they know their actions and inner hidden character better than any other person. Reflecting on this and the countless times Allah, the Exalted, has concealed their faults from people, should prevent them from becoming proud. In addition, they should remember that the praised quality they possess was granted to them by none other than Allah, the Exalted, therefore all praise belongs to Him. Finally, a Muslim should become more grateful to Allah, the Exalted, by using the blessings they possess in ways pleasing to Him.
they should instead advise others about this narration and warn them not to overpraise others. Only in certain cases is praising others acceptable and must include not overpraising them, sticking with the truth and it should be done in order to encourage them to do more good. This especially applies to children such as praising them in respect to their schoolwork, good behavior and fulfilling the duties of Islam. A serious matter. During the apostate wars, Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, made it clear that even though he was willing to accept the repentance of any of the apostates, as he commanded every army leader to first invite every apostate army they encountered towards repentance while promising them it will be accepted from them. Yet Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, did not create peace deals with them. This is because entering and exiting Islam was a serious matter. And if he had made peace treaties with the apostates, then it would have sent a clear message to everyone else, that whenever they became bored of Islam, they could simply walk away from it. This would have turned Islam into a joke. In addition, apostatizing was a serious crime as it was a clear act of treason against the Islamic State. Treason, even in this day and age, is punishable by death. Therefore, Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, made it clear that even though he would accept the repentance of the apostates, he would not accept anything else from them except death. This tactic also acted as a deterrent to the other Arab tribes who were considering apostatizing. This deterrent prevented the deaths of many people from both sides. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis. The biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, pages 440 to 441. Generally speaking, Islam teaches Muslims that they should never compromise on their faith in order to gain something from the material world. Chapter 4 and Nisa, verse 135. O you who have believed, be persistently standing firm in justice, witnesses for Allah, even if it be against yourselves or parents and relatives. As the material world is temporary, whatever one gains from it will eventually fade away and they will be held accountable for their actions and attitude in the hereafter. On the other hand, faith is the precious jewel which guides a Muslim through all difficulties in this world and in the hereafter safely. Therefore, it is plain foolishness to compromise the thing which is more beneficial and lasting for the sake of a temporary thing. Many people, especially women, will encounter moments in their lives where they will have to choose whether to compromise on their faith. For example, in some cases a Muslim woman may believe that if she removed her scarf and dressed a certain way, she would be more respected at work, and may even climb the corporate ladder more quickly. Similarly, in the corporate world, it is considered important to mingle with colleagues after work hours. So a Muslim might find themselves being invited to a pub or club after work. In times like this, it is important to remember that ultimate victory and success will only be granted to those who remain steadfast on the teachings of Islam. Those who act in this way will be granted worldly and religious success. But more importantly, their worldly success will not become a burden for them. In fact, it will become a means for Allah, the Exalted, to increase their rank and remembrance amongst mankind. Examples of this are the rightly guided caliphs of Islam. They did not compromise on their faith and instead remained steadfast throughout their lives and in return Allah, the Exalted, granted them a worldly and religious empire. All other forms of success are very temporal and sooner or later they become a difficulty for its bearer. One only needs to observe the many celebrities who compromised on their ideals and belief in order to obtain fame and fortune, only for these things to become a cause of their sadness, anxiety, depression, substance abuse, and even suicide. Reflect on these two paths for a moment and then decide which one should be preferred and chosen. Flexibility without compromise. During his caliphate Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, dispatched an army under the leadership of Khalid bin Walid, may Allah be pleased with him, to fight the false prophet Tulaiha al-Azdi and his followers who had grown into a formidable force. Tulaiha invited the Tai tribe towards his religion, and they initially responded by sending many of their soldiers to join his campaign. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, also dispatched Adi bin Hatim, May Allah be pleased with him, to this tribe, a tribe he belonged to, in order to convince them not to apostatize. They eventually accepted his admonishment, 
and promised him to call back the fighters that had went out to join Tulaha. When Khalid eventually met Adi, may Allah be pleased with them, the latter managed to convince the former to hold off attacking the Tai tribe. Even though their initial actions resulted in the deaths of some companions, may Allah be pleased with them. Khalid, may Allah be pleased with him, could have acted hastily out of revenge, but instead he agreed to wait for three days. Within this time the soldiers of the Tai tribe, who initially went out to join Tulaiha, returned and all of them, under the supervision of Adi bin Hatim, may Allah be pleased with him, join Khalid and his army, may Allah be pleased with them. Khalid, may Allah be pleased with him, was then commanded to fight against the two Arab tribes who had apostatized, the Banu Asad and the Banu Qais. The Tai tribe had an old agreement of peace with the Banu Asad, and therefore did not desire to fight them immediately, and therefore requested Khalid, may Allah be pleased with him, if they could march and fight against the Banu Qais instead. He accepted their request, even though Adi, may Allah be pleased with him, became enraged at his people, as he demanded them to defend Islam from all enemies, irrespective of who they were. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, pages 443 to 444. Khalid, may Allah be pleased with him, made the right call, as he did not decide to put the Tai tribe into a compromising position, whereby they may have apostatized again. They were clearly a fickle people, so the chance of this occurring was real, and could have been disastrous for Khalid, may Allah be pleased with him, if they betrayed him during battle. Khalid, may Allah be pleased with him, acted in a flexible manner without compromising on the teachings of Islam. This is an important quality to adopt. Some adopt stubbornness in worldly matters, and as a result they do not change their character for the better. Instead, they remain steadfast on their attitude, believing this is somehow a sign of their great strength and wisdom. Steadfastness in matters of faith is a praiseworthy attitude, but in most worldly matters it is only called stubbornness, which is blameworthy. Unfortunately, some believe if they change their attitude it demonstrates weakness, or it shows that they are admitting their fault, and because of this, they stubbornly fail to change for the better. Adults behave like immature children by believing that if they change their behavior, it means they have lost, while others who remain steadfast on their attitude have won. This is simply childish. In reality, an intelligent person will remain steadfast on matters of faith, but in worldly matters they will change their attitude, as long as it is not sinful, in order to make their life easier. So changing to improve one's life is not a sign of weakness, it is in fact a sign of intelligence. In many cases, a person refuses to change their attitude and expects others in their life to change theirs, such as their relatives. But what often occurs is that due to stubbornness, all remain in the same state, which only leads to regular disagreements and arguments. A wise person understands that if the people around them do not change for the better than they should, this change will improve the quality of their life and their relationship with others, which is much better than going around in circular arguments with people. This positive attitude will eventually cause others to respect them, as it takes real strength to change one's character for the better. Those who remain stubborn will always find something to be annoyed about which will remove peace from their life. This will cause further difficulties in all aspects of their life, such as their mental health. But those who adapt and change for the better will always move from one station of peace to another. If one achieves this peace, does it really matter if others believe they only changed because they were wrong? To conclude, to remain steadfast on the teachings of the Holy Quran and the traditions of Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, is praiseworthy. But in worldly matters and in cases where no sin is committed, a person should learn to adapt and change their attitude so that they find some peace in this world. The Nation's Strength Abu Bakr dispatched Khalid bin Walid, may Allah be pleased with them, to fight the false prophet Tulaha and his followers. When reaching the battlefield Khalid, may Allah be pleased with him, sent a small but awe-inspiring message to Tulaha. The letter read, Indeed, I have come to you with a group of people who love death just as much as you love life. When fighting commenced, eventually Tulai's army was defeated, and he himself fled from the battlefield, fearing for his life. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, page 446. 
the message of Khalid, may Allah be pleased with him, clearly indicates a major reason why the Muslims were undefeatable. As they possessed certainty of faith, they knew that either they would win a battle thereby gaining reward and worldly blessings, or they would be killed and obtain paradise, through the mercy of Allah, the Exalted. Their strong desire for the hereafter prompted them to remain firm on Islam, even at the cost of their lives. Losing this steadfastness, which is rooted in strong faith, is the reason why the strength of the Islamic nation has declined over the years. In a hadith found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4297, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned that a day would soon come when other nations would attack the Muslim nation, and even though they would be great in number, they would be deemed insignificant by the world. Allah, the Exalted, would remove the fear of Muslims from the hearts of the other nations. This would occur because of the Muslim nation's love for the material world and their hatred for death. The companions, may Allah be pleased with them, were small in number, yet they overcame entire nations, whereas the Muslims today are greater in number, yet have no social or political influence in the world. This is because the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, lived their lives according to the teachings of Islam thereby, favoring and preparing for the hereafter over enjoying the lawful pleasures of this world. Whereas, most of the Muslims today have adopted the opposite mindset. It is important to understand that the root of all sins is the love of the material world. This is because any sin which is committed is done out of love and desire for it. The material world can be split into four aspects, fame, fortune, authority and one social life, such as their relatives and friends. It is in the excess pursuit of these things which lead to sins, such as earning unlawful wealth out of love for fortune. It is why a hadith found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2376, warns that love for wealth and authority is more destructive to one's faith than the destruction two hungry wolves would cause if they were let loose on a herd of sheep. Whenever people seek the excess of these aspects of the material world, it always leads to disobedience of Allah, the Exalted. When this occurs, the mercy of Allah, the Exalted, is removed, which leads to nothing but trouble. Even though, some Muslims believe pursuing the excess things of the material world is harmless, it is something the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned against in many hadiths, such as the one found in Sahih Bukhari, number 3158. He warned that he did not fear poverty for Muslims. What he feared was that Muslims would pursue the excess of this material world, such as excess wealth, and this would cause them to compete with each other over it, and this would lead to their destruction. As warned in this hadith, this was the behavior of the past nations. As the material world is limited, it is obvious that people would have to compete over it if they desired more than their necessities. This competition would cause them to adopt the characteristics which contradict the character of a true Muslim such as envy and enmity for others. They would stop caring for each other, as they are too busy competing in gathering and hoarding the material world. And they would contradict the advice given in a hadith found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6011, which advises that Muslims should act like one body when any part of the body suffers from an illness the rest of the body shares in the pain. This competition would drive a Muslim to stop loving for others what they love for themselves, which is a characteristic of a true believer, according to a hadith found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2515, as they desire to outdo their fellow Muslims in worldly things. Persisting on this competition will cause a Muslim to love, hate, give and withhold all for the sake of the material world, instead of for the sake of Allah, the Exalted, which is an aspect of perfecting one's faith, according to a hadith found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4681. This competition is the difference between the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, and many of the Muslims today. If Muslims desire to regain the strength and influence Islam once had, they must strive and prioritize preparing for the hereafter over striving for obtaining and hoarding the excess of this material world. This must occur from an individual level, until it affects the whole nation. A bad leader. Among the apostates were people who decided to repent and even gathered their obligatory charities with the intention to send it to Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, but they prevented from doing so by their leaders. For example, 
the Banu Yabu clan and their leader who prevented them from sending their obligatory charity, Malik ibn Nuwayra. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, pages 458 to 459. Generally speaking, this indicates the importance of choosing and following the correct role model. If one turns the pages of history, they will observe many people who achieved great worldly success and in some cases benefited mankind yet. They will also observe at least one thing which taints their achievements. But if one observes the life of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, they will observe nothing except success and countless things which benefit mankind. Even though, there are people who falsely criticize the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. It is quite evident from his highly accurate and detailed biography, which has been verified by reliable Muslim and non-Muslim historians, that this criticism is based on nothing but falsehood. This is why Muslims must put aside all role models and instead study and adopt the flawless character of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him, as this is the only way to achieve real untainted success in both one's worldly and religious life. Chapter 3 Ali Imran, verse 31 say, if you should love Allah then follow me, so Allah will love you and forgive you your sins. There is no goal greater than this in this world. In fact, this is what people irrespective of their faith strive to achieve. And Allah, the Exalted, has placed all of it in the footsteps of his holy prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. Chapter 33 Al-Azab verse 21 There has certainly been for you, in the Messenger of Allah, an excellent pattern, for anyone whose hope is in Allah and the last day, and who remembers Allah often. It is simple. If a person desires worldly and religious success, they should follow in the footsteps of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. But if they choose a path other than his whatever tainted success they achieve will eventually become a burden for them, and it may lead to a punishment on a great day. Loyalty to Allah, the Exalted one of the apostate groups was situated in Bahrain, but not all of its people abandoned Islam. The people of Juwatha remained loyal to Islam, and as a consequence their forts were besieged by the apostates. Eventually, their food supplies ran out and they were faced with either death from the enemy soldiers camped outside or by hunger. Even then they did not waver in their faith and remained firm on Islam. Eventually Allah, the Exalted, aided them when a Muslim army, dispatched by Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, turned up and defeated the apostate army, thereby saving the inhabitants of Juwatha. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, pages 470 to 471. The people of Juwatha could have compromised for the sake of gaining worldly benefit, yet their actions made it clear that they did not worship Allah, the Exalted, for this reason. Rather, they worshipped Allah, the Exalted, because it is the truth and as a result they remained firm on Islam whether they face times of ease or difficulty. It is important for Muslims to recognize why they worship Allah, the Exalted, as this reason can be a cause for an increase in obedience to Allah, the Exalted, or in some cases it can lead to disobedience. When one worships Allah, the Exalted, in order to gain lawful worldly things from him, they run the risk of becoming disobedient to him. This type of person has been mentioned in the Holy Quran. Chapter 22 Al-Hajj, verse 11 And of the people is he who worships Allah on an edge. If he is touched by good he is reassured by it, but if he is struck by trial he turns on his face to disobedience. He has lost this world and the hereafter. That is what is the manifest loss. As they obey Allah, the Exalted, in order to receive worldly blessings the moment they fail to receive them or encounter a difficulty, they often become angered which turns them away from the obedience of Allah, the Exalted. These people often obey and disobey Allah, the Exalted, according to the situation they are facing, which in reality contradicts true servanthood to Allah, the Exalted. Even though, desiring lawful worldly things from Allah, the Exalted, is acceptable in Islam yet, if one persists with this attitude, they may become like those mentioned in this verse. It is far better to worship Allah, the Exalted, in order to be saved in the hereafter and obtain paradise. 
This person is unlikely to alter their behavior when encountering difficulties. But the highest and best reason is to obey Allah, the Exalted, simply because He is their Lord and the Lord of the universe. This Muslim, if sincere, will remain steadfast in all situations, and through this obedience, they will be granted both worldly and religious blessings, which outstrip the worldly blessings the first type of person would ever receive. To conclude, it is important for Muslims to reflect on their intention, and if necessary, correct it, so that it encourages them to remain firm on the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling His commands, refraining from his prohibitions and by facing destiny with patience in all situations. The Unique Revelation Arguably the most dangerous false prophet was Musaylima, the liar. His evil ways began during the lifetime of the holy prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. In the ninth year after the holy prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, a delegation visited the holy prophet Muhammad, Peace and blessings be upon him. Amongst them was Musaylima the liar, who after arriving to Medina, said he would only follow the holy prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, if he was appointed leader of the Islamic nation after him. The holy prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was warned in a dream that Musaylima the liar would eventually falsely claim prophethood. The holy prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, gave him a stern warning instead of punishing him. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Kathir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 4, page 66. Musaylima, the liar, attempted to compose verses which matched the Holy Quran, thereby trying to fool others into believing he too was receiving divine revelation. His foolishness became more apparent to those who possessed common sense when he attempted this, as his composed poetry was based on pointless things that did not benefit anyone. He gained followers through blind loyalty and by promising them worldly things, such as wealth and authority. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, page 480. Generally speaking, Muslims must strive to gain appreciation for the Holy Quran in order to strengthen their faith through learning and acting on it. This process will allow them to recognize its divine origins and its universal and timeless beneficial teachings. The Holy Quran possesses an uncountable amount of qualities which separates it from any other worldly book. This aspect of the Holy Quran is so intense that it cannot even be explained or discussed over countless lifetimes. But a few of these qualities will be mentioned here. First of all, in the Holy Quran, Allah, the Exalted, has given an open challenge to the entire universe, not just people. And not only a challenge to those who were present when this divine revelation was revealed, but to all of creation till the end of time. The challenge being if the people believed the Holy Quran was not a divine revelation from Allah, the Exalted, then they should produce a chapter that can rival a chapter of the Holy Quran. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 23. And if you are in some doubt concerning what we sent down upon our special devotee, then bring one chapter like it, and call upon all your helpers beside Allah if you are truthful. There is no book on the entire planet that can and has given this type of open challenge. But over 1400 years ago, the Holy Quran gave this challenge to the entire universe, and to this day, this challenge has not been won by the non-Muslims, nor will it ever be God willing. Another quality of the Holy Quran is that it stated the outcome of future events. But the more amazing thing about these statements is that the outcomes seemed impossible at the time. For example, chapter 48 Al-Fath, verse 28. It is he who sent his messenger with guidance and the religion of truth, that he may make it prevail over all other religions, and sufficient is Allah as witness. When this verse was revealed, the entire city of Mecca was Islam. So when the people of Mecca heard this verse, unfortunately for them, they believed that Islam was too feeble and would therefore not survive long, and certainly would not spread beyond the borders of Mecca, let alone the entire world. But within a some years Allah, the Exalted, fulfilled this promise. Another example of how the Holy Quran prophesied a future event which was unimaginable at the time is found in chapter 30 R. Rum, verses 2 to 5. The Romans have been subdued. In the nearby land and after their subjugation they will soon overcome. 
in a few years. The command is of Allah only before and after. And on that day the believers shall rejoice. With the help of Allah, he helps whom he pleases. And he is the might and merciful. These verses of the Holy Quran were revealed during a time where the Romans, Christians, were at war with the Persians, fire worshippers. This war has been confirmed by many authentic historic books. At this particular time, the Persians were on the verge of winning the war. At one point Rome itself was surrounded by the Persians. But Allah, the Exalted, stated that the Romans would eventually reign victorious. The non-Muslims of Mecca, who themselves were idol worshippers, favoured the Persians and agreed with the majority that it was impossible for the Romans to win. But Allah, the Exalted, has always proved these verses true and allowed the Romans victory. A final example which appeals to the scientists of the world is seen in chapter 21 Al-Anbiya, verse 33. And it is he who created the night and the day and the sun and the moon. Each one is floating in a circumference. For centuries scientists have fought over theories on how exactly the solar system is arranged e.g. whether the sun remains still and the earth rotates around or vice versa. Only relatively recently it has been proven by scientists from all different faiths and backgrounds that each object, sun, moon and the earth all rotate on their own axes and rotate around each other in a set orbit. But Allah, the Exalted, declared this over 1400 years ago. All the science-related verses of the Holy Quran are slowly being proven by scientists today. This is a huge piece of evidence that proves that the Holy Quran are the words of the one and only true God, Allah, the Exalted, who has created this universe and everything in it, because only a creator can truly explain his creations. Even though many commands of the Holy Quran may not be understood by people, does not mean they are incorrect. Certain verses of the Holy Quran, whose wisdom was hidden to man, became apparent when society reached a certain level of development. As the whole Holy Quran is a book of wisdom and guidance, it must be accepted irrespective if one understands its commands or not. This situation is just like a child who is suffering from a cold and desires ice cream, but is not given it by their parent. The child will continue to cry without understanding the wisdom behind, but those that possess knowledge will agree with the parent, even though outwardly it appears as if the decision of the parent is wronging the child. When studying the Holy Quran, one will realize that it contains different levels of superiority, through both obvious and subtle meanings that it discusses. Chapter 11 HUD verse 1 This is a book whose verses are perfected, and then presented in detail from one who is wise and aware. The expressions in it are unparalleled, and its meanings are explained in a simple straightforward way. Its verses are extremely eloquent, and no other text can surpass it. The Holy Quran also mentioned the stories of the previous nations in detail, even though the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was not educated in history. It commanded every type of good and forbade every type of evil, those that affect an individual and those that affect an entire society, so that peace and security can spread throughout homes and society. The Holy Quran is free from exaggerations, lies or falsehood unlike poems and stories. All the verses, whether short or long, in the Holy Quran are beneficial. Even when the same story is repeated in the Holy Quran, different important lessons can be learned from it. Unlike all other books, the Holy Quran does not become boring when it is repeatedly recited, and a seeker of truth never gets fed up of studying it. The Holy Quran not only provides warnings and promises, but supports them with unshakable and clear proofs. When the Holy Quran discusses anything which can seem abstract, such as adopting patience, it always provides an easy and practical way of implementing it. It encourages one to fulfill the purpose of their creation and prepare for the eternal hereafter in a simple yet profound way. It makes the straight path clear and appealing to the one who desires true success in both worlds. The knowledge within it is timeless and can be applied to every society and age. It is a healing for every emotional, economical, and physical difficulty when it is understood and applied correctly. It is the cure for every problem an individual or an entire society can ever encounter.
One only needs to turn the pages of history to observe the societies which implemented the teachings of the Holy Quran correctly in order to understand its all-encompassing benefits. Centuries have passed, yet not even a single letter has been edited in the Holy Quran as Allah, the Exalted, promised to safeguard it. No other book in history possesses this quality. Chapter 15 Al-Hijjah, verse 9 Indeed it is we who sent down the message, i.e. the Quran, and indeed we will be its guardian. This is undoubtedly the greatest and timeless miracle of Allah, the Exalted, granted to his final holy prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. But the only one who will benefit from it is the one who seeks the truth, whereas the seekers of their desires will only find it difficult to hear and follow. Chapter 17 Al-Isra, verse 82 And we send down of the Quran that which is healing and mercy for the believers, but it does not increase the wrongdoers except in loss. Remaining on the truth Arguably the most dangerous false prophet was Musaylimah, the liar. Even though many of his tribesmen from Banu Hanifa joined him out of blind loyalty, others did not. For example, Thumama ibn Athal, may Allah have mercy on him, was one of the senior members of his tribe who remained firm on Islam and publicly urged others to do the same even though doing this was extremely dangerous for him and his family. Because of his efforts, many remained firm on Islam. He eventually left his town and joined the army of Khalid bin Walid, may Allah be pleased with him, when he eventually reached Yamama in order to confront Musaylimah, the liar. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, pages 485-486. In a hadith found in Sahih Bukhari, number 2686, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned that failing to fulfill the important duty of commanding good and forbidding evil can be understood with the example of a boat with two levels full of people. The people on the lower level keep disturbing the people on the upper level whenever they desire to access water. So they decide to drill a hole in the lower level, so that they can access water directly. If the people on the upper level fail to stop them, they will all surely drown. It is important for Muslims to never give up commanding good and forbidding evil according to their knowledge in a gentle way. A Muslim should never believe that as long as they obey Allah, the exalted, other misguided people will not be able to affect them in a negative way. A good apple will eventually get affected when placed with rotten apples. Similarly, the Muslim who fails to command others to do good will eventually be affected by their negative behavior, whether it is subtle or apparent. Even if the wider society has become heedless, one should never give up advising their dependents, such as their family, as not only will their negative behavior affect them more, but this is a duty on all Muslims according to a hadith found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 2928. Even if a Muslim is ignored by others, they should discharge their duty by persistently advising them in a gentle way which is supported by strong evidence and knowledge. Only in this way will they be protected from their negative effects and pardoned on the Day of Judgment. But if they only care about themselves and ignore the actions of others, it is feared that the negative effects of others may well lead to their eventual misguidance. Strong Faith Arguably the most dangerous false prophet was Musaylimah, the liar. Abu Bakr dispatched Khalid bin Walid, may Allah be pleased with them, to confront him. Before fighting commenced, some of the followers of Musaylimah, the liar, were captured. Khalid, may Allah be pleased with him, spoke to their leader urging him to accept the truth of Islam. He even made it clear that the poetry Musaylimah, the liar, composed was nothing but useless rubbish by reciting the Holy Quran to him. When the leader failed to give in Khalid, may Allah be pleased with him, finally said, Then Allah, the Exalted, is sufficient for us against you. And he will honor his religion. Indeed, it is against him that you are fighting, even though it is his religion that you are seeking out to destroy. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, pages 490 to 492. This incident highlights the strong faith Khalid, may Allah be pleased with him, possessed.
He did not lead his army and challenge Musailima, the liar, while relying on his superior tactics, manpower and weapons, rather, he challenged falsehood by relying on Allah, the exalted. A reliance which was rooted in strong faith. This is a clear lesson for Muslims to follow in his footsteps by learning and acting on Islamic knowledge in order to obtain certainty of faith. Through this they will overcome all difficulties successfully, just like Khalid, may Allah be pleased with him, did. All Muslims have faith in Islam, but the strength of their faith varies from person to person. For example, the one who follows the teachings of Islam because their family told them to, is not the same as the one who believes in it through evidence. A person who has heard about something will not believe in it in the same way as the one who has witnessed the thing with their own eyes. As confirmed in a hadith found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 224, gaining useful knowledge is a duty on all Muslims. One of the reasons for this is that it is the best way a Muslim can strengthen their faith in Islam. This is important to pursue, as the stronger one's certainty of faith, the greater the chance they will remain steadfast on the correct path especially when facing difficulties. In addition, having certainty of faith has been described as one of the best things one can possess in a hadith found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 3849. This knowledge should be obtained by studying the Holy Quran and the hadith of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, through a reliable source. Allah, the Exalted, did not only declare a truth in the Holy Quran, but he also provided evidence for it through examples. Not only examples which are to be found in the past nations, but examples which have been placed in one's very own life. For example, in the Holy Quran Allah, the Exalted, advises that sometimes a person loves a thing, even though it will cause them trouble if they obtained it. Similarly, they might hate a thing while there is much hidden good in it for them. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 216 But perhaps you hate a thing and it is good for you, and perhaps you love a thing and it is bad for you. And Allah knows while you know not. There are many examples of this truth in history, such as the Pact of Hudaybah. Some Muslims believe this pact, which was made with the non-Muslims of Mecca, would completely favor the latter group. Yet, history clearly shows that it favored Islam and the Muslims. This event is discussed in the Hadiths found in Sahih Bukhari, Numbers 2731 and 2732. If one reflects on their own life, they will find many examples when they believed something was good, when it was actually bad for them, and vice versa. These examples prove the authenticity of this verse and help one's faith strengthen. Another example is found in Chapter 79 and Nazir, Verse 46. It will be, on the day they see it, judgment day, as though they had not remained in the world, except for an afternoon or a morning thereof. If one turns the pages of history, they will clearly observe how great empires came and went. But when they left they passed away, in such a way, as if they were only on earth for a moment. All but a few of their signs have faded away, as if they were never present on earth in the first place. Similarly, when one reflects on their own life, they will realize that no matter how old they are, and no matter how slow certain days might have felt overall their life so far has passed in a flash. Understanding the truthfulness of this verse strengthens one's certainty of faith, and this inspires them to prepare for the hereafter, before their time runs out. The Holy Quran and the Hadith of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, are full of such examples. Therefore, one should strive to learn and act on these divine teachings so that they adopt certainty of faith. The one who achieves this will not be shaken by any difficulty they face and will remain steadfast on the path which leads to the gates of paradise. Chapter 41 Fusilat, verse 53 We will show them our signs in the horizons and within themselves until it becomes clear to them that it is the truth. Opportunities to change Arguably the most dangerous false prophet was Musaylima, the liar. Abu Bakr dispatched Khalid bin Walid, may Allah be pleased with them, to confront him. Washi was the freed slave of Jabir ibn Mutam. During the Battle of Ard, which occurred in the third year, the holy prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina. Washi assassinated the uncle of the holy prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, 
Hamza ibn Abu Matalab, may Allah be pleased with him. Years later, Washi accepted Islam and decided to join the expedition against Musaylimah, the liar. He desired to kill the worst person on earth to make up for killing the best person. During the battle, Washi launched a spear at Musaylimah, the liar, and fatally wounded him. Another companion, Abu Dujana, may Allah be pleased with him, then finished Musaylimah, the liar, off. This has been discussed in a hadith found in Sahih Bukhari, number 4072. Even though Washi killed Hazma, may Allah be pleased with him, Allah, the Exalted, did not immediately punish him. Instead, out of his great forbearance, he gave him a chance to repent and mend his ways. Washi took this opportunity, and Muslims must do the same. Allah, the Exalted, does not hasten the punishment for the one who deserves it out of leniency. Instead, he gives them an opportunity to sincerely repent and rectify their behavior. Chapter 16 and now, verse 61. And if Allah were to impose blame on the people for their wrongdoing, he would not have left upon it, i.e. the earth any creature, but he defers them for a specified term. And when their term has come, they will not remain behind an hour, nor will they precede it. The Muslim who understands this will never give up hope in the mercy of Allah, the Exalted, but will not also cross the limits and adopt wishful thinking by believing Allah, the Exalted, will never punish them. They understand that punishment is only delayed, not abandoned, unless they sincerely repent. So this divine name creates hope and fear in a Muslim. A Muslim should use this delay in order to repent and hasten towards good deeds. A Muslim should act on this divine name by being lenient with people, especially when they demonstrate bad character. They should show leniency towards others, just as they desire Allah, the Exalted, to be lenient with them in their moments of heedlessness. But at the same time, they should not be lenient with their own bad characteristics, knowing that punishment for sins is delayed not permanently abandoned until they sincerely repent. They should also remain steadfast in leniency by replying evil with good according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. Chapter 41 Fasilat, verse 34 And not equal are the good deed and the bad. Repel evil by that deed which is better, and thereupon the one whom between you and him is enmity will become as though he was a devoted friend. Softening Hearts after the battle of Yamama was over and Khalid, may Allah be pleased with him, was granted victory, he married the daughter of one of the chiefs of the Banu Hanifa tribe. In addition, Khalid, may Allah be pleased with him, was tricked into making a peace treaty with the rest of the Banu Hanifa tribe, a trick which he overlooked as it did lead to most of their tribesmen returning to the fold of Islam. Finally, Khalid, may Allah be pleased with him, preferred the treaty over fighting at that time, as his men already endured a difficult battle, where 1200 Muslims were martyred, including many senior companions, may Allah be pleased with them. When Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, was informed about what had occurred, he was initially angered, as he did not desire to make peace treaties with any apostatizing tribe, but later on, he excused Khalid, may Allah be pleased with him, for his actions as they were justified due to the circumstances he was facing. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, pages 510 to 513. The actions of Khalid, may Allah be pleased with him, did soften the hearts of the Banu Hanfiya tribe, which encouraged them to repent and return to the fold of Islam. Khalid, may Allah be pleased with him, managed to balance strictness with softness to his advantage. Generally speaking, the beauty of Islam is found in gentleness. This has been advised by the Holy Prophet Muhammad, Peace and blessings be upon him, in many hadiths, such as the one found in Sunan ibn Majah, number 3689. The Holy Quran even mentions that the companions, may Allah be pleased with them all, constantly lovingly accompanied the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, because of his gentleness and soft nature. Chapter 3 Ali Imran, verse 159. So by mercy from Allah, you were lenient with them. And if you had been rude in speech and harsh in heart, they would have disbanded from about you. The Arabs were infamous for being harsh-hearted, 
but due to the Holy Prophet Muhammad's peace and blessings be upon him, soft temperament their tough hearts melted, and thus they adopted this quality, and became beacons to guide the rest of mankind. This is why the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned in a hadith found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4809, that the one who is deprived of gentleness is deprived of good. Chapter 3 Ali Imran, verse 103. And remember the favor of Allah upon you, when you were enemies and he brought your hearts together and you became, by his favor, brothers. This is a clear message to those who desire to spread the word of Islam. They must possess a gentle constructive mindset, rather than a harsh destructive one. They should unite people, and strive to benefit others, rather than spreading controversy within society. A good example of this is seen in one's attitude towards their children. The parents that showed a gentle nature towards their children, had a greater positive impact on them, than the parents who adopted a harsh temperament. Often some push people further away from Islam with their harsh attitude, and this completely challenges the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. For example, once an uneducated Bedouin urinated in the mosque of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. When the companions, may Allah be pleased with them all, desired to punish him, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, Peace and blessings be upon him, forbade them, and gently explained to the Bedouin the etiquettes of being in a mosque. This incident is mentioned in a hadith found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 529. This soft approach affected the man in a positive way. This important characteristic is also mentioned in many places of the Holy Quran. For example, even though Pharaoh claimed to be the highest Lord yet Allah, the Exalted, commanded the Holy Prophet Mosa and the Holy Prophet Harun, peace be upon them both, to invite Pharaoh towards guidance using gentle and kind speech. Chapter 79 and Nazir, verse 24. And said, I am your most exalted Lord. And chapter 20 Taha, verses 43 to 44. Go both of you to Pharaoh. Indeed he has transgressed and speak to him with gentle speech that perhaps he may be reminded or fear Allah. Children and even animals understand the language of gentleness. So how can an adult not be guided correctly, if one adopts this characteristic when inviting them towards Islam and good? This is why the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, once advised in a hadith found in Sahih Muslim, number 6601 that Allah, the Exalted, is kind and gentle according to His infinite dignity and likes the creation to act softly with each other. Unfortunately, many who spread the word of Islam have adopted the incorrect belief that being gentle is a sign of weakness. This is nothing but a ploy of the devil, as he desires to lead mankind away from Islam. Understand the limits. After the battle of Yamama was over and Khalid, may Allah be pleased with him, was granted victory, a peace treaty was struck with the Banu Hanifa tribe, which resulted in all but a few of them repenting and returning to the fold of Islam. One such man who failed to repent was Salama ibn Amr. He decided to assassinate Khalid, may Allah be pleased with him, but was apprehended before he could act on his evil plan. He was then released after feigning repentance and once again attempted to assassinate Khalid, may Allah be pleased with him. During his second attempt, he was attacked and chased until he fell into a well and died. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, page 516. Generally speaking, even though most people will incline to the truth when it is made clear to them, they are some that will never submit to it, as they have adopted evil as their way. The Holy Quran teaches mankind that certain people are so drowned in the material world, no advice will penetrate their veiled hearts. The Holy Quran describes how this group of people possesses hearts harder than rocks. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 74. Then your hearts became hardened after that, being like stones or even harder. At this point those who desire to spread the word of Islam should separate from this type of person and instead concentrate on others. But it is important to know, even in this case, a Muslim should always demonstrate good character towards the sinful as they can repent at any time. Chapter 25 al furqan verse 63. And when the ignorant address them harshly, they say words of peace. 
Similarly, in another verse of the Holy Quran, Allah, the Exalted, advises that when a limit is reached, it is best to separate and leave the stubborn and misguided people to their false beliefs. A day will undoubtedly come when Allah, the Exalted, will inform mankind who was rightly guided and who was lost in darkness. Chapter 28 al Qasas, verse 55. And when they hear ill speech, they turn away from it and say, For us are our deeds and for you are your deeds. Peace will be upon you, we seek not the ignorant. Muslims should never get depressed and confused when their good advice does not affect others. In some cases, these people are drowned in sins to such an extent their heart becomes veiled. This veil prevents the good advice affecting them in a positive way. A hadith found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 4244, explains how a sin causes a black spot to be etched onto the spiritual heart. The more one sins, the more their spiritual heart becomes engrossed by this darkness. Chapter 83 al mutafifin verse 14. No. Rather, the stain has covered their hearts of that which they were earning. This is similar to another verse where Allah, the Exalted, declares that their ears, eyes and hearts have been veiled from the truth, and they therefore cannot be guided to the truth. Chapter 2 al-Baqarah, verse 7. Allah has set a seal upon their hearts and upon their hearing, and over their vision is a veil. The fault does not lie with the message of Islam, but in the hearts of the misguided. Just like the fault lies in the eyes of a blind person, and not the bright sun. Unfortunately, this stubborn attitude has become a widespread problem within society. Some of these people believe in Islam, yet have closed their hearts and minds to the teachings of the Holy Quran and Hadiths of the Holy Prophet Muhammad peace and blessings be upon him. They refuse to accept any good advice which would benefit them in both worlds. Those who choose to spread the word of Islam should understand that there are two types of mindsets people can adopt. The first is when someone makes their mind up beforehand about an issue, and then searches and accepts only those things which support their predetermined belief. Whereas, the correct attitude is to live with an open mind by searching and accepting strong evidence regarding different issues. The first mentality will only cause problems from a personal level right up to a national level. Unfortunately, this is how some aspects of the media work. They predetermine the information they would like to publish, find bits of weak supporting evidence and then blow it out of proportion for the world to see. Those spreading the word of Islam should avoid the first type of people and instead concentrate on inviting the second group towards the truth. Sincere Repentance even though those who apostatized during the caliphate of Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, caused great distress and trouble for the sincere Muslims, nonetheless, those of them who sincerely repented and returned to the fold of Islam were forgiven and treated with respect and honor, just like they were treated with respect and honor prior to apostatizing. They remained firm on the teachings of Islam thereafter and strove hard in the path of Allah, the Exalted, with their bodies and wealth. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, pages 429 to 430. An example of this was the false prophet Talahia, who killed many sincere Muslims and spread much corruption in the land. After he was defeated and fled for his life, he eventually repented and re-entered the fold of Islam. Sometime after, he passed by Medina with the intention to perform the visitation Umrah at Mecca. When Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, was alerted to this, he simply told people to leave him alone as Allah, the Exalted, guided him to Islam. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, page 448. In a hadith found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 4251, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that people commit sins but the best person who commits sins is the one who sincerely repents. As people are not angels, they are bound to commit sins. The thing that makes these people special is when they sincerely repent from their sins. Sincere repentance includes feeling remorse, seeking the forgiveness of Allah, the exalted, and anyone who has been wronged making a firm promise not to commit the sin or a similar sin again, and making up for any rights which have been violated in respect to Allah, the exalted, and people. It is important to note, 
Minor sins can be erased through righteous deeds which has been advised in many hadiths, such as the one found in Sahih Muslim, number 550. It advises that the five daily obligatory prayers and two consecutive Friday congregational prayers erase the minor sins committed in between them as long as major sins are avoided. Major sins are only erased through sincere repentance. Therefore, a Muslim should strive to avoid all sins, minor and major, and if they happen to occur to immediately sincerely repent, as the time of death is unknown. And they should continue obeying Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions and by facing destiny with patience. Never fool twice. The apostates who repented and returned to the fold of Islam were accepted back into the Muslim society and were treated with justice and kindness. But as they had recently returned to Islam, Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, did not appoint them as leaders or governors. He even forbade them from participating in battles beyond the apostate wars. Even though he extended them their full rights as Muslims, nonetheless, he behaved in this manner in order to protect the general Muslim population and armies he dispatched to fight the superpowers of that time, the Romans and Persians. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr, as Siddiq, pages 449 to 450. If these former apostates abandoned Islam once again while a Muslim army was very far from home and engaging with a superpower in the latter's homeland, then it would have been disastrous for that Muslim army. His behavior indicates the importance of fulfilling the rights of people without blindly trusting them. In a hadith found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6133, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that a believer does not get stung from the same hole twice. This means that a believer does not get fooled by something or someone twice. This includes committing sins. A true believer is not immune to committing sins. But when they happen to commit them, they do not repeat their mistake and instead learn and change for the better by sincerely repenting to Allah, the Exalted. A true believer does not blindly trust people, thereby increasing the chances of being wronged by them. But if they are fooled by anyone, they should overlook and pardon, as this leads to their forgiveness. Chapter 24 and Nur, verse 22 and let them pardon and overlook. Would you not like that Allah should forgive you? But they should also change their behavior by treading cautiously when dealing with this person, thereby ensuring they do not get fooled again. There is a vast difference between forgiving others and blindly trusting them especially after they have wronged someone. This hadith applies to every aspect of one's life, as a true believer is the one who constantly learns from their experiences and knowledge in order to change for the better, so that they increase their obedience to Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions, and by facing destiny with patience according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Superiority and Success a major lesson to learn from the apostate wars is that success and superiority was granted to Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, and the Muslims as they remain firm on the sincere obedience of Allah, the Exalted, which involves fulfilling his commands, refraining from his prohibitions, and facing destiny with patience according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. This is achieved when one sincerely learns an ACTS on the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Chapter 24 and Nur, verses 55 to 56. Allah has promised those who have believed among you and done righteous deeds that he will surely grant them succession to authority upon the earth just as he granted it to those before them and that he will surely establish for them therein their religion which he has preferred for them and that he will surely substitute for them after their fear security, for they worship me, not associating anything with me. But whoever disbelieves after that, then those are the defiantly disobedient. And establish prayer and give zakah and obey the messenger, that you may receive mercy. Even though the number of Muslims have increased over time, it is obvious that the strength of Muslims has only decreased. Each Muslim, irrespective of the strength of their faith, believes in the authenticity of the Holy Quran as doubting it would cause them to lose their faith. In the following verse Allah, the Exalted, 
has given the key to obtaining superiority and success, which would remove the weakness and grief Muslims are experiencing all around the world. Chapter 3 Ali Imran, verse 139 So do not weaken and do not grieve, and you will be superior if you are true believers. Allah, the Exalted, has made it clear that Muslims only need to become true believers in order to achieve this superiority and success in both worlds. True belief involves fulfilling the commands of Allah, the Exalted, refraining from his prohibitions and facing destiny with patience according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. This includes the duties towards Allah, the Exalted, and those towards people, such as loving for others what one loves for themselves, which has been advised in a hadith, found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2515. This requires one to learn and act on Islamic teachings. Through this attitude was success and superiority granted to the companions, may Allah be pleased with them. And if Muslims desire to achieve it, then they must return to this rightly guided attitude. As Muslims believe in the Holy Quran, they should understand this simple teaching and act on it. Gathering the Quran After the Battle of Yamama, which led to many Muslim casualties, many of which had memorized the Holy Quran, Umar ibn Khattab encouraged Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with them, to gather the Holy Quran in book form out of fear that the verses might become lost if the memorizers of the Holy Quran continued to die or be martyred during battles. Prior to this, the verses of the Holy Quran were not contained in a single book. Instead they were either memorized or written on various different objects, such as rocks, which were in the possession of different people. Initially, Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, showed some hesitation, as he did not desire to do something the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, did not do. He was very strict in following the footsteps of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. But when Umar persisted eventually, Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with them, understood that this was the best course of action in order to secure the verses of the Holy Quran for the future generations. Abu Bakr appointed Zayed bin Thabit, may Allah be pleased with them, for this momentous and difficult task. He worked tirelessly in order to gather the Holy Quran in book form. The copy remained with Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, until he died. Then it was passed on to Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, and eventually to his daughter and the mother of the believers Hafsa bint Umar, may Allah be pleased with her. This has been discussed in a hadith found in Sahih Bukhari, number 7191. They worked tirelessly to ensure the Holy Quran reached the future Muslims. Therefore, Muslims must honor their noble legacy by fulfilling the rites of the Holy Quran, as this was the purpose of their sacrifices. In a hadith found in Imam Manzari's Awareness and Apprehension, number 30, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advise that the Holy Quran will intercede on Judgment Day. Those who follow it during their lives on earth will be led to Paradise on Judgment Day. But those who neglect it during their lives on earth will find that it pushes them into Hell on Judgment Day. The Holy Quran is a book of guidance. It is not merely a book of recitation. Muslims must therefore strive to fulfill all aspects of the Holy Quran to ensure that it guides them to success in both worlds. The first aspect is reciting it correctly and regularly. The second aspect is to understand it. And the final aspect is to act on its teachings according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. Those who behave in such a manner are the ones who are given glad tidings of right guidance through every difficulty in this world and its intercession on the Day of Judgment. But as warned by this hadith, the Holy Quran is only guidance and a mercy for those who correctly act on its aspects, according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. But those who misinterpret it and instead act according to their desires in order to gain worldly things, such as fame, will be deprived of this right guidance and its intercession on Judgment Day. In fact, their complete loss in both worlds will only increase until they sincerely repent. Chapter 17 Al-Isra, verse 82 And we send down of the Quran that which is healing and mercy for the believers, but it does not increase the wrongdoers except in loss. Finally, 
It is important to understand that even though the Holy Quran is a cure for worldly problems, a Muslim should not only use it for this purpose. Meaning, they should not only recite it in order to fix their worldly problems thereby. Treating the Holy Quran like a tool which is removed during a difficulty and then placed back in a toolbox. The main function of the Holy Quran is to guide one to the hereafter safely. Neglecting this main function and only using it to fix one's worldly problems is not correct as it contradicts the behavior of a true Muslim. It is like the one who purchases a car with many different accessories, yet it possesses no engine. There is no doubt that this person is simply foolish. Under your care. When one observes the leadership of Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him. It becomes clear that he was a person who fulfilled the rights of those under his care. By extension, all the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, and the true Muslims at that time did the same. This resulted in a peaceful and stable society. In a hadith found in Sahih Bukhari, number 2409, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that each person is a guardian and responsible for the things under their care. The greatest thing a Muslim is a guardian of is their faith. Therefore, they must strive to fulfill its responsibility by fulfilling the commands of Allah, the Exalted, refraining from His prohibitions, and by facing destiny with patience according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. This guardianship also includes every blessing one has been granted by Allah, the Exalted, which includes external things such as wealth and internal things such as one's body. A Muslim must fulfill the responsibility of these things by using them in the way prescribed by Islam. For example, a Muslim should only use their eyes to look at lawful things and their tongue to utter only lawful and useful words. This guardianship also extends to others within one's life such as relatives and friends. A Muslim must fulfill this responsibility by fulfilling their rights such as providing for them and gently commanding good and forbidding evil according to the teachings of Islam. One should not cut off from others, especially over worldly issues. Instead, they should continue to treat them kindly, hoping they will change for the better. This guardianship includes one's children. A Muslim must guide them by leading by example, as this by far is the most effective way in guiding children. They must obey Allah, the Exalted, practically as discussed earlier, and teach their children to do the same. To conclude, according to this hadith, everyone has some sort of responsibility they have been entrusted with. So they should gain and act on the relevant knowledge in order to fulfill them, as this is a part of obeying Allah, the Exalted. Faith brings peace. When one observes the leadership of Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, it becomes clear that he was a person who fulfilled the rights of those under his care. He applied the teachings of the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, in every aspect of his personal and political life. By extension, all the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, and the true Muslims at that time did the same. This resulted in a peaceful and stable society. Unfortunately, they are some who claim that faith is not required in this world and others who are Muslims claim it is enough to profess Islam without supporting it with sincere obedience to Allah, the Exalted. But the increase in crimes within society proves the importance of faith and strengthening it through knowledge and action. This is because crimes and sins only occur as a person feels they will either face no consequences for their actions, such as prison, or they will somehow escape them for example, by fleeing the country. But the person who believes that no matter what action they perform, whether open or secret, big or small, and no matter what tricks they attempt, a day will undoubtedly come where they will be held accountable for all their deeds will always think twice before committing a crime or a sin. If this belief is strengthened through gaining and acting on Islamic knowledge, it will deter one from committing crimes and sins. If people acted in this way, peace and justice would spread across society. The crime rate would decrease and the times would closely match the times of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him and his rightly guided caliphs, may Allah be pleased with them. This fact alone indicates the importance of faith and strengthening it through gaining and acting on knowledge within society. Chapter 16 and now, verse 90. Indeed, Allah orders justice and good conduct and giving, 
help to relatives and forbids immorality and bad conduct and oppression. He admonishes you, that perhaps you will be reminded. Evil Plots A major lesson to learn from the apostate wars, is that when one enacts evil plots eventually, sooner or later, they will face the consequences of their evil behavior in this world. And if they fail to repent, what comes after this world will be even more disastrous for them. Therefore, a Muslim should never plot to do an evil thing, as it will always, one way or another, backfire on them. Even if these consequences are delayed to the next world, they will face them eventually. For example, the brothers of the Holy Prophet Yusuf, peace be upon him, desired to harm him as they desired the love, respect and affection of their father, the Holy Prophet Yaqub, peace be upon him. But it is clear that their scheming only put them further away from their desire. Chapter 12 Yusuf, verse 18 And they brought upon his shirt false blood. Jacob said, Rather your souls have enticed you to something, so patience is most fitting. The more one plots evil, the more Allah, the exalted, will put them further from their goal. Even if they outwardly achieve their desire, Allah, the exalted, will cause the very thing they desire, to become a curse for them in both worlds unless they sincerely repent. Chapter 35 Fatir, verse 43 But the evil plot does not encompass except its own people. Then do they await except the way, i.e., fate of the former peoples. Spreading the message After dealing with the apostates, Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, then shifted his entire focus to dealing with the danger posed by the two superpowers of that time, the Romans and the Persians. Both of these superpowers were making moves against the Muslims. For example, they supplied the apostates with weapons and began to send soldiers to the territories surrounding the borders of the Islamic Empire. In addition, they were preventing the peaceful preaching of Islam in their territories and were threatening their citizens from considering Islam. This was another reason why Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, had to fight against them. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, pages 551 to 552. Generally speaking, whenever one invites others towards Islam, commands good and forbids evil, they will be challenging the heedless lifestyle of many others which will inspire them to resist the truth any way they can. The major reason all the past nations rejected their holy prophets, peace be upon them, was due to this very reason. They could not abandon their lifestyles and characteristics, and in defense of them were prepared to wage war against Allah, the exalted, and their holy prophet, peace be upon him. When one takes up this important duty, they must be prepared to face many hardships caused by others including their own relatives. The holy prophets, peace be upon them, are the most beloved to Allah, the exalted, yet they encountered countless difficulties from their nations. One only needs to study the Holy Quran and the Hadiths of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, to observe this fact. For example, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, once declared in a hadith found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2472, that no one in creation had been persecuted in the path of Allah, the exalted, more than him. In cases like this, one's response to the bad attitude of others should be educated, respectful and gentle. An example of this is found in chapter 19 Mayan, verses 46 to 47. His father said, Have you no desire for my God, O Abraham? If you do not desist, I will surely stone you, so avoid me a prolonged time. Abraham said, Peace i.e. safety will be upon you. I will ask forgiveness for you of my Lord. Indeed, he is ever gracious to me. Hear the kind and respectful response of the Holy Prophet Ibrahim, peace be upon him, to the harsh attitude of his elder is discussed. In most cases, a person must possess a character flaw if they claim to get along with everyone. Due to the differences within the members of society, a person will never get along with everyone. They will always be one or more that disagree with their mentality, lifestyle and advice. This diversity will lead to tension and occasionally problems. But if a person is liked by everyone, then in most cases, it shows they have adopted the mentality of the hypocrites by being two-faced. 
If the holy prophets, peace be upon them, were not loved by all, how can a normal person achieve this status? This is the reason one should not believe in propaganda, as the group that were mistreated the most in this way were the holy prophets, peace be upon them. This is confirmed in a hadith found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 4023. For example, the holy prophet Mosa, peace be upon him, was once falsely accused of illegal relations by a shameless woman. She was enticed into slandering him by the enemy of Allah, the exalted, Quran. When she accused the holy prophet Mosa, peace be upon him, publicly, during a religious gathering, he interrogated her. When she observed his reaction, she immediately retracted her accusation and admitted the truth. As a result, Allah, the exalted, destroyed Quran by commanding the earth to swallow him and his great treasury. This incident has been recorded in Imam Dahabi's The Major Sins, pages 166 to 167. Chapter 28 al Qasas, verse 81. And we caused the earth to swallow him and his home. The holy prophets, peace be upon them, were slandered on many occasions, but they remained steadfast on their mission until they were granted victory by Allah, the Exalted. When Allah, the Exalted, decides to complete a task like aiding the one who spreads the true word of faith, the entire creation combined cannot stop him. Muslims must accept that they too will face hardships when spreading the word of Islam. Therefore, they must follow in the footsteps of the holy prophets, peace be upon them, by remaining steadfast in the face of difficulties. This was the attitude of the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, and the righteous predecessors. If one desires to join them in the next world, they must adopt this attitude also. Making things easy. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, dispatched armies towards the Persians in Iraq, but he commanded his generals, Khalid bin Walid and Iyad ibn Ghanim, may Allah be pleased with them, not to force the Muslim soldiers to join their expeditions. Instead, he commanded them to give an option to each of the soldiers, to either march forward with them or return to their homes. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq pages 555 to 556. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, was someone who always strived to make things easy for others, even if that made his own life harder. The Muslims had a duty to support the Muslim nation during a dangerous time, yet he did not force people to enlist. Generally speaking, one must adopt this behavior of making things easier for others. In this day and age due to ignorance, it has become more difficult to fulfill the rights of people, such as one's parents. Even though a Muslim has no excuse but to strive to fulfill them, it is important for Muslims to be merciful with each other. As advised by the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, in a hadith found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6655, Allah, the Exalted, shows mercy to those who are merciful to others. One aspect of this mercy is for a Muslim not to demand their full rights from others. Instead, they should use the means such as their physical or financial strength to help themselves and make things easy for others. In some cases, when a Muslim demands their full rights from others and they fail to fulfill them, it may lead to their punishment. In order to be merciful to others, they should therefore only demand their rights in some cases. This does not mean a Muslim should not strive to fulfill the rights of others, but it means they should try to overlook and excuse the people they have rights over. For example, a parent can excuse their adult child from a particular house chore and do it themselves if they possess the means to do so without troubling themselves, especially if their child returns home from work exhausted. This leniency and mercy will not only cause Allah, to exalted, to be more merciful to them, but it will also increase the love and respect people have for them. The one who always demands their full rights is not a sinner, but they will lose out on this reward and outcome if they behave in this manner. Muslims should make things easy for others and hope Allah, the Exalted, will make things easy for them in this world and in the next. Hearing and Obeying When Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased be him, dispatched forces towards Iraq, he ordered some of his leaders to follow the leadership of a single leader, as a battle must be ultimately led by one person in order to avoid confusion. All of his leaders submitted to his orders and sincerely obeyed those who they were commanded to follow. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, 
The biography of Abu Bakr, as Siddiq, pages 556 to 557. They behaved in this manner as they were sincere to Allah, the Exalted, and did not desire worldly things such as leadership. They only desired to please Allah, the Exalted, whether that meant they were leading or following others. In a hadith found in Sahih Muslim number 196, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that Islam is sincerity towards the leaders of society. This includes kindly offering them the best advice and supporting them in their good decisions by any means necessary, such as financial or physical help. According to a hadith found in Imam Malik's Mawata, book number 56, hadith number 20, fulfilling this duty pleases Allah, the Exalted. Chapter 4 and Nisa, verse 59. O you who have believed, obey Allah and obey the Messenger and those in authority among you. This makes it clear that it is a duty to obey the leaders of society. But it is important to note, this obedience is a duty as long as one does not disobey Allah, the Exalted. There is no obedience to the creation if it leads to the disobedience of the Creator. In cases like this, revolting against leaders should be avoided as it only leads to the harm of innocent people. Instead, the leaders should be gently advised good and forbidden evil according to the teachings of Islam. One should advise others to act accordingly and always supplicate for the leaders to remain on the correct path. If the leaders remain straight, the general public will remain straight also. To be deceitful towards the leaders is a sign of hypocrisy, which one must avoid at all times. Sincerity also includes striving to obey them in matters which unite society on good and warning against anything which causes disruption in society. Facing Consequences During the expedition to Iraq, Khalid bin Walid and his army, may Allah be pleased with them, moved swiftly in order to support another Muslim army, an army led by Iyad ibn Ghanim, may Allah be pleased with him. When the former reached Damat al-Jandal, one of the leaders of the enemy army, Uqaidir ibn Abdul Malik, encouraged the other enemy leaders to retreat and not engage with Khalid, may Allah be pleased with him, as they had crossed paths before. During the Battle of Tabuk, which occurred in the ninth year after the migration to Medina, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, ordered Khalid, may Allah be pleased with him, to capture Uqaidir, who was one of the leaders of the enemy army. After his capture, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, mercifully freed Uqaidir, after taking a promise from him not to ever fight against Muslims again. He broke this promise and as a result always feared for his life. Uqaidir then fled Dalmat al-Jandal, but was once again caught by Khalid, may Allah be pleased with him. For his many ACTS of treachery, he was executed. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, pages 593 to 594. Generally speaking, it is important to learn that no matter how much physical or social strength a person has, a day will certainly come when they face the consequences of their actions. In most cases, this occurs during their life where the actions of a person leads them to trouble, such as prison, and eventually they will face the consequences of their actions in the hereafter, as well. This applies to all people not just leaders. A Muslim should therefore never mistreat others, such as their relatives. They should learn a lesson from the tyrannical leaders of history who were greater in strength than them yet. A day certainly came when their strength did not benefit them, and they faced the consequences of their evil deeds. Social influence and strength are fickle things as they quickly pass from person to person thereby, never remaining with anyone for long. Therefore, a Muslim who possesses such strength should use it in a way which is pleasing to Allah, the Exalted, by benefiting themselves and others. But if they abuse their authority, then they will eventually face a punishment which no one can protect them from. In addition, it is important not to abuse one's authority, as it may cause them to be hurled into hell on Judgment Day. Every oppressor will have to give their righteous deeds to their victims, and if necessary, take the sins of their victims until justice is established. This will cause many oppressors to be thrown into hell. This has been confirmed in a hadith found in Sahih Muslim, number 6579. To conclude, 
a Muslim should never forget to hold themselves accountable for their deeds. Those who do will avoid disobeying Allah, the exalted, and harming others. But those who do not judge themselves will continue disobeying Allah, the exalted, and harming others heedlessly, not knowing that in actual fact, they are only harming themselves. But when they realize this fact, it will be too late for them to escape punishment. Choosing Good Companions During the Iraq expedition, two Muslims who were living amongst the non-Muslims in Iraq were unintentionally killed during one of the battles. When Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, was informed of this, he wrote a letter to all the Muslims who were living within non-Islamic territories and warned them this occurred because they chose to remain with the non-Muslims. Meaning, they should have migrated to Islamic controlled lands, especially during a time of war. Or at the least, they should have fled to the oncoming Muslim army in order to manifest their faith to the Muslim soldiers. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, pages 598 to 599. Even though they may have been extenuating circumstances which forced the two Muslims to stay in a non-Muslim land, even during times of war, nonetheless, this incident indicates the importance of good companionship, as their companionship with the non-Muslims led to their deaths. In a hadith found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4031, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that a person who imitates a people is counted as one of them. All Muslims, irrespective of the strength of their faith, desire to be counted and end up with the righteous in the next world. But this hadith clearly warns that a Muslim will only be considered a righteous person and end up with them if they imitate the righteous. This imitation is a practical thing, not only a declaration through words. This imitation is correctly done by fulfilling the commands of Allah, the Exalted, refraining from his prohibitions, and by facing destiny with patience according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. But those who verbally declare their love for the righteous, and fail to imitate them, and instead imitate the characteristics found in hypocrites and the sinful, will be considered and judged as one of them. This does not mean they will lose their faith, but it means they will be judged as disobedient Muslims. How can a disobedient Muslim be counted as an obedient Muslim and end up with the righteous? This is only wishful thinking which has no value in Islam. Chapter 59 Al-Hash verse 20 Not equal are the companions of the fire and the companions of paradise. The companions of paradise, they are the attainers of success. A balanced attitude after the success gained in Iraq, Khalid bin Walid, may Allah be pleased with him, ordered his army to remain stationed within it and secretly headed to Mecca to perform the holy pilgrimage, Hajj. He kept it a secret, as he did not want the enemy forces to learn he had left Iraq, as this would have only given them confidence. After he performed the holy pilgrimage, he raced back to his army in Iraq. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, only learned about what occurred after the holy pilgrimage season ended. Initially, Abu Bakr was annoyed that Khalid, may Allah be pleased with them, did not seek his permission to leave his army during a vulnerable time. Nonetheless, he adopted a balanced approach and limited his constructive criticism to just words. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, pages 601-602. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, could have turned the issue into a long-winded argument, but instead wisely chose not to do that, as arguing often leads to more trouble. Generally speaking, in a hadith found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1993, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that whoever avoids arguing, even if they are right, will be given a house in the middle of paradise. It is important to understand that the characteristic of a true Muslim is not to argue or debate in order to promote themselves and their opinion. They should instead present the information in order to promote the truth. This applies to both worldly and religious matters. The one who aims to promote the truth will not argue. Only the one who is trying to promote themselves will. Contrary to what many believe, winning arguments does not increase one's rank in any way. The only time one's rank in both worlds increases is when they avoid arguing, 
and instead present the truth or accept it when it is presented to them. A Muslim should avoid going back and forth with others when discussing things, as this is a characteristic of arguing. It is this correct mentality which has been indicated in chapter 16 and now, verse 125. Invite to the way of your Lord with wisdom and good instruction, and argue with them in a way that is best. A Muslim should understand that their duty is not to force people to accept something. Their duty is to simply present the truth, as being forceful is a characteristic of arguing. A Muslim should not waste their time nor stress if others disagree with their opinion. When one holds on to these disagreements over time, it can cause enmity to build up between them and others, which can lead to fractured and broken relationships. This can even lead to the sin of severing ties with people. So in cases like this, it is important for Muslims to let things go and not harbor negative feelings towards someone who disagrees with their opinion and choice. They should instead push themselves to agree to disagree and move on from the situation without any ill feelings. The one who fails to do this will find themselves always arguing and possessing enmity for others, as they are bound to disagree with others on certain topics and issues due to the difference in their characteristics and mentality. Understanding this principle is a branch of finding peace in this world. Belief with Actions a companion, Shurabil ibn Hazana, once saw and related a dream to Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with them. The long dream indicated that Allah, the Exalted, would grant victory to Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, in Syria, and that his demise was near. When he heard the dream he wept and commented that he would continue to command good, forbid evil, and be stern with those who abandon the commands of Allah, the Exalted. He would strive against the enemies of Islam, and he would not allow weakness or laziness to overcome him in any matter related to the pleasure of Allah, the Exalted. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, pages 621 to 623. This indicates the importance of supporting one's belief with actions. Merely declaring faith with the tongue is not good enough. Disbelief can be a literal rejecting of Islam or through actions, which involves disobeying Allah, the Exalted, even though one believes in Him. This can be clearly understood by an example. If an unaware person is warned by another of an approaching lion, and the unaware person takes practical steps to obtain safety, they will be considered someone who believed in the warning given to them as they adapted their behavior based on the warning. Whereas, if the unaware person does not practically change their behavior after being warned, people will suspect that they do not believe in the warning given to them, even if the unaware person verbally claims belief in the warning given to them. Some people claim that their belief and obedience to their God is in their hearts, and they therefore do not need to demonstrate it practically. Unfortunately, this foolish mentality has infected many Muslims who believe they possess a pure faithful heart, even though they fail to fulfill the obligatory duties of Islam. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has clearly declared in a hadith found in Sunan ibn Majah, number 3984, that when one's heart is pure, the body becomes pure, which means their actions become correct. But if one's heart is corrupt, the body becomes corrupt, which means their actions will be corrupt and incorrect. Therefore, the one who does not obey Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling their duties practically, can never have a pure heart. In addition, demonstrating one's faith in Allah, the Exalted, practically is their proof and evidence which is required on Judgment Day in order to be granted paradise. Not having this practical evidence is as silly as a student who hands back a blank exam paper to their teacher claiming their knowledge is in their mind, so they therefore do not need to write it down by answering the exam questions. The same way this student would undoubtedly fail, so will a person who reaches judgment day without the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, in the form of fulfilling his commands, refraining from his prohibitions and by facing destiny with patience, even if they possess faith in their heart. Seeking Counsel After the success gained in Iraq, Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, desired to combat the Romans in Syria. As the Romans began moving soldiers to the border of the Islamic nation, he understood it was only a matter of time before they attacked them. 
He consulted the senior companions, may Allah be pleased with them, of his thoughts, and they all agreed to hear and obey him in this matter. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, pages 624 to 628. Muslims must follow in the footsteps of Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, by only consulting a few people in respect to their affairs. They should select these few people, according to the advice of the Holy Quran. Chapter 16 and now, verse 43. So, ask the people of the message if you do not know. This verse reminds Muslims to consult those who possess knowledge. As consulting an ignorant person only leads to further trouble. Just like a person would be foolish to consult a car mechanic over their physical health, a Muslim should only consult those who possess knowledge about it and the Islamic teachings linked to them. In addition, a Muslim should only consult those who fear Allah, the Exalted. This is because they will never advise others to disobey Allah, the Exalted. Whereas, those who do not fear or obey Allah, the Exalted, might possess knowledge and experience, but they will easily advise others to disobey Allah, the Exalted, which only increases one's problems. In reality, those who fear Allah, the Exalted, possess true knowledge and only this knowledge will guide others through their problems successfully. Chapter 35 Fatir, verse 28 Only those fear Allah from among his servants who have knowledge. Guiding others After Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, resolved to fight against the Roman Empire, he dispatched letters to the Muslims of Yemen encouraging them, not commanding them, to join this expedition. He reminded them of their duty to defend Islam from external threats and the fact that Allah, the Exalted, is only pleased with Muslims who support their declaration of faith with actions. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, pages 628 to 629. Throughout his life, Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, encouraged others towards the sincere obedience of Allah, the Exalted. In a hadith found in Jami at Termidi, number 2674, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that the one who guides others to something good will receive the same reward as those who act on their advice. And those who guide others to sins will be held accountable as if they committed the sins. It is important for Muslims to be careful when advising and guiding others. A Muslim should only advise others in matters of good so that they gain reward from it and avoid advising others to disobey Allah, the Exalted. A person will not escape punishment on Judgment Day by simply claiming they are only inviting others towards sins even if they did not commit the sins themselves. Allah, the Exalted, will hold both the guide and the follower accountable for their actions. Muslims should therefore only advise others to do the things they would do themselves. If they dislike an action being recorded in their book of deeds, they should not advise others to perform that action. Because of this Islamic principle, Muslims should ensure they gain the adequate knowledge before advising others, as they can easily multiply their own sins if they incorrectly advise others. In addition, this principle is an extremely easy way for Muslims to gain reward for actions they cannot perform themselves due to a lack of means such as wealth. For example, a person who is not financially able to donate charity can encourage others to do so and this will result in them gaining the same reward as the one who gave charity. Firm Hearts After Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, resolved to fight against the Roman Empire, he dispatched letters to the Muslims of Yemen encouraging them, not commanding them, to join this expedition. He reminded them of their duty to defend Islam from external threats and the fact that Allah, the Exalted, is only pleased with Muslims who support their declaration of faith with actions. In response, many Muslims from Yemen volunteered for this expedition. Many of them reached Medina and after entering the mosque of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and listening to the Holy Quran being recited, they wept because of the deep penetrating truths mentioned within it. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, also wept and commented that this is how they used to behave towards the Holy Quran, but with the passing of time, their spiritual hearts became hardened. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, pages 628 to 631.
Even though Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, was being modest in his comment, in reality, the hearts of the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, became so firm on the teachings of the Holy Quran that it led to them becoming calm and collective, even though their spiritual hearts were completely humbled towards Allah, the Exalted. One must follow in their footsteps by learning and acting on the Holy Quran. In a hadith found in Imam Manzari's Awareness and Apprehension, number 30, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that the Holy Quran will intercede on Judgment Day. Those who follow it during their lives on earth will be led to paradise on Judgment Day. But those who neglect it during their lives on earth will find that it pushes them into hell on Judgment Day. The Holy Quran is a book of guidance. It is not merely a book of recitation. Muslims must therefore strive to fulfill all aspects of the Holy Quran to ensure that it guides them to success in both worlds. The first aspect is reciting it correctly and regularly. The second aspect is to understand it. And the final aspect is to act on its teachings according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. Those who behave in such a manner are the ones who are given glad tidings of right guidance through every difficulty in this world and its intercession on the Day of Judgment. But as warned by this hadith, the Holy Quran is only guidance and a mercy for those who correctly act on its aspects, according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. But those who misinterpret it and instead act according to their desires in order to gain worldly things, such as fame, will be deprived of this right guidance and its intercession on Judgment Day. In fact, their complete loss in both worlds will only increase until they sincerely repent. Chapter 17 Al-Isra, verse 82 And we send down of the Quran that which is healing and mercy for the believers, but it does not increase the wrongdoers except in loss. Finally, it is important to understand that even though the Holy Quran is a cure for worldly problems, a Muslim should not only use it for this purpose. Meaning, they should not only recite it in order to fix their worldly problems thereby, treating the Holy Quran like a tool which is removed during a difficulty and then placed back in a toolbox. The main function of the Holy Quran is to guide one to the hereafter safely. Neglecting this main function and only using it to fix one's worldly problems is not correct as it contradicts the behavior of a true Muslim. It is like the one who purchases a car with many different accessories yet it possesses no engine. There is no doubt that this person is simply foolish. In addition, learning and acting on the Holy Quran, in light of the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, leads to a soft spiritual heart. In a hadith found in Sahih Bukhari, number 52, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that if one's spiritual heart is sound the whole body will become sound, but if their spiritual heart is corrupt, then the whole body will become corrupt. First of all, this hadith refutes the foolish belief where one claims to have a purified heart even though their speech and actions are bad. This is because what is inside will eventually manifest outwardly. The purification of the spiritual heart is only possible when one eliminates evil characteristics from themselves and replaces them with good characteristics discussed in Islamic teachings. This is only possible when one learns an ACTS on Islamic teachings so that they can sincerely fulfill the commands of Allah, the Exalted, refrain from his prohibitions, and face destiny with patience according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Behaving in this manner will lead to a purified spiritual heart. This purification will then reflect in the outward limbs of the body, such as one's tongue and eyes meaning they will only use their organs in ways pleasing to Allah, the Exalted. This is in fact a sign showing the love Allah, the Exalted, has for his righteous servant, according to a hadith found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6502. It is important to note that this purification will guide one through all worldly difficulties successfully so that they achieve both worldly and religious success. The Superior Ones after Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, resolved to fight against the Roman Empire, he dispatched letters to the Muslims of Yemen encouraging them, not commanding them, to join this expedition. He reminded them of their duty to defend Islam from external threats and the fact that Allah, the Exalted, 
is only pleased with Muslims who support their declaration of faith with actions. In response, many Muslims from Yemen volunteered for this expedition. Many of these volunteers reached Medina. One of these volunteers was a rich noble leader of the people of Yemen named Dil Kila. He, like most rich leaders, enjoyed the luxuries of the world, such as fine clothing and food. He observed Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, and his simple nature. He was not wearing any fine clothing or precious jewels, even though he was the leader of the entire Islamic nation. Being moved by what he observed, Dil Killer removed his fine clothing and jewels and exchanged them for simple clothing. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, pages 631 to 633. Dil Killer was moved to change his behavior by simply observing Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him. This indicates that he affected others in a positive way through his actions as well as through his speech. In a hadith found in Sunan ibn Majah, number 4119, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that the best people are those who remind others of Allah, the Exalted, when they are observed. This does not refer to those who adopt an Islamic outward appearance, such as growing a beard or wearing a scarf, as many of these people do not remind others of Allah, the Exalted, at all. This hadith refers to those who learn and act on Islamic knowledge so that they sincerely obey Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions, and by facing destiny with patience according to traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. This leads to the purification of one's heart, which leads to the purification of their outward limbs. This has been advised in a hadith found in Sunan ibn Majah, number 3984. This will cause others to remember Allah, the Exalted, when they observe these righteous Muslims. And this remembrance will only increase when these righteous Muslims speak as they only speak in ways pleasing to Allah, the Exalted, meaning, they avoid evil and vain speech, and only speak on beneficial matters in respect to the world and the hereafter. This remembrance further increases when one observes their actions as they practically implement the teachings of Islam thereby, acting only in ways pleasing to Allah, the Exalted. For example, they love, dislike, give and withhold only for the sake of Allah, the Exalted. This leads to perfecting one's faith according to a hadith found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4681. A simple leader. After Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, resolved to fight against the Roman Empire, he dispatched letters to the Muslims of Yemen encouraging them, not commanding them, to join this expedition. He reminded them of their duty to defend Islam from external threats and the fact that Allah, the Exalted, is only pleased with Muslims who support their declaration of faith with actions. In response, many Muslims from Yemen volunteered for this expedition. Many of these volunteers reached Medina. One of these volunteers was a rich noble leader of the people of Yemen named Dil Kila. He, like most rich leaders, enjoyed the luxuries of the world, such as fine clothing and food. He observed Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, and his simple nature. He was not wearing any fine clothing or precious jewels, even though he was the leader of the entire Islamic nation. Being moved by what he observed, Dil Killer removed his fine clothing and jewels and exchanged them for simple clothing. When his people criticized him for embarrassing them in front of the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, he questioned whether they desired for him to live like a tyrant, just like he did before he accepted Islam. He added that obedience to Allah, the Exalted, is only achieved through humility and detachment from the material world. Many of the other rich leaders from Yemen followed his behavior and had their expensive clothes admitted into the public treasury of the Muslims. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, pages 631 to 633. In a hadith found in Sunan ibn Majah, number 4118, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that simplicity is a part of faith. Islam does not teach Muslims to give up all their wealth and lawful desires, but it instead teaches them to adopt a simple lifestyle in all aspects of their life, such as their food, clothing, housing and business, so that it provides them free time to prepare for the hereafter adequately. 
This involves fulfilling the commands of Allah, the Exalted, refraining from his prohibitions and facing destiny with patience according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. This simple life includes striving in this world in order to fulfill one's needs and the needs of their dependents without excessiveness, waste or extravagance. A Muslim should understand that the simpler life they lead, the less they will stress over worldly things and therefore the more they will be able to strive for the hereafter thereby, obtaining peace of mind, body and soul. But the more complicated a person's life is, the more they will stress, encounter difficulties and strive less for their hereafter as their preoccupations with worldly things will never seem to end. This attitude will prevent them from obtaining peace of mind, body and soul. Simplicity leads to a life of ease in this world and a straightforward accounting on the day of judgment. Whereas, a complicated and indulgent life will only lead to a stressful life and a severe and difficult accountability on the day of judgment. In a hadith found in Sahih Bukhari, number 2886, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, criticized the slaves of wealth and fine clothing. These people are pleased when they receive these things and become displeased when they do not. In reality, this applies to all non-essential worldly things. This criticism is not directed at those who strive in the material world in order to fulfill their needs and the needs of their dependents, as this is a part of obeying Allah, the Exalted. But it is directed at those who either pursue the unlawful in order to obtain wealth and other worldly things in order to satisfy their desires and the desires of others. And it is directed at those who pursue non-essential lawful things in such a way that it causes them to neglect obeying Allah, the Exalted, correctly. This obedience involves fulfilling His commands refraining from his prohibitions and facing destiny with patience according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. This prevents them from preparing adequately for the hereafter and their final judgment. In addition, this criticism is for those who are impatient when they do not obtain their unnecessary desires in this world. This attitude can cause a Muslim to obey Allah, the exalted, on the edge meaning they obey him when they obtain their desires, but when they do not they angrily turn away from his obedience. The Holy Quran has warned of a severe loss in both worlds for the one who adopts this attitude. Chapter 22 Al-Hajj, verse 11 And of the people is he who worships Allah on an edge. If he is touched by good he is reassured by it, but if he is struck by trial he turns on his face to unbelief. He has lost this world and the hereafter. That is what is the manifest loss. Muslims should instead learn to be patient and content with what they possess, as this is true richness, according to a hadith found in Sahih Muslim, number 2420. In reality, the person full of desires is needy meaning, poor even if they possess much wealth. A Muslim should know Allah, the Exalted, grants people what is best for them and not according to their desires, as this in most cases would lead to their destruction. Chapter 42 Ash-Shirah, verse 27 And if Allah had extended excessively provision for his servants, they would have committed tyranny throughout the earth. But he sends it down in an amount which he wills. Indeed he is of his servants, aware and seeing. Noble advice. One of the four armies, Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, Dispatched to Syria was led by Yazid ibn Abu Sufyan, may Allah be pleased with him. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, walked alongside him while bidding farewell and gave him the following advice, which has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, pages 634 to 635. The first thing he advised was that he was appointing him leader in order to test his ability. If he done well, he would maintain his position and be given more duties. But if he done poorly, he would be removed from his post. Even though Yazid, may Allah be pleased with him, was a senior member of the Quraysh tribe, the same tribe of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, nonetheless, he was treated based on his merits and not his lineage. This indicates the importance of equality in Islam. In a hadith found in Sahih Muslim, number 6543, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that Allah, the Exalted, 
does not judge people based on their outward appearance or their wealth. Instead he observes and judges people's inward intention and their physical actions. The first thing to note is that a Muslim should always correct their intention when performing any deed, as Allah, the Exalted, will only reward them when they perform righteous deeds for his sake. Those who perform deeds for the sake of other people and things will be told to gain their reward from those who they acted for on Judgment Day, which will not be possible. This has been warned in a hadith found in Jamie at Termidi, number 3154. In addition, this hadith indicates the importance of equality in Islam. A person is not superior to others by worldly things such as their ethnicity or wealth. Even though, many Muslims have erected these barriers, such as social castes and sex thereby believing some are better than others, Islam has clearly rejected this concept and declared that in this respect all people are equal in the sight of Islam. The only thing which makes one Muslim superior to another is their piety meaning how much they fulfill the commands of Allah, the Exalted, refrain from his prohibitions and face destiny with patience. Chapter 49 Al-Hajarat, verse 13 Indeed, the most noble of you in the sight of Allah is the most righteous of you. A Muslim should therefore busy themselves in obeying Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling his rights and the rights of people, and not believe that something they possess or belong to will somehow save them from punishment. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has made it clear in a hadith found in Sahih Muslim, number 6853, that the Muslim who lacks in righteous deeds meaning the obedience of Allah, the exalted, will not be increased in rank because of their lineage. In reality, this applies to all worldly things such as wealth, ethnicity, gender or social brotherhoods and castes. The next thing Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, advised was that he should fear Allah, the exalted, constantly, as he sees the inward state of a person just like he observes their outward state. Allah, the exalted, is fully aware of all things including the inner intention and feelings of a person as well as their outward actions. The Muslim who understands this will ensure they not only perform righteous deeds but will do so with the correct intention knowing that they might be able to fool people but Allah, the Exalted, is fully aware of their intention and inward state and will hold them accountable according to it. A Muslim must act on this divine name by striving to gain and act on useful worldly and religious knowledge sincerely for the sake of Allah, the Exalted. In addition, they must constantly supervise their inward and outward states. Through this they will become aware of their faults and strive to rectify them. A Muslim should not live heedless to the purpose of their creation. They should instead live in full awareness and therefore obey Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling his commands, refraining from his prohibitions and by facing destiny with patience. The next thing Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, advised was that the closest person to Allah, the Exalted, was the one who was most obedient to him and performed deeds for his sake. In a divine hadith of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6502, Allah, the Exalted, declares that when one strives in fulfilling the obligatory duties and performing voluntary righteous deeds Allah, the Exalted, blesses their five senses so that they use them in obedience to Him. This righteous servant will very rarely commit sins. This increase in guidance has been indicated in chapter 29 al ankabat verse 69. And those who strive for us, we will surely guide them to our ways. This Muslim reaches the level of excellence which has been discussed in a hadith found in Sahih Muslim, number 99. This is when a Muslim performs actions, such as the prayer, as if they observe Allah, the Exalted. The one who reaches this level will guard their mind and body from sins. This is the one who when they speak they speak for Allah, the Exalted. When they are silent they are silent for Allah, the Exalted. When they act they act for Him, and when they are still they are for His sake. This is an aspect of monotheism and understanding the oneness of Allah, the Exalted. The next thing mentioned in the main hadith under discussion is that this Muslim's supplication will be fulfilled and they will be granted the refuge and protection of Allah, the Exalted. This is a clear lesson for those who desire lawful worldly things. They should not seek to obtain them using any means except through the sincere obedience of Allah, the Exalted. No spiritual teacher or anyone else will be able to grant things to a person 
unless the person strives in the obedience of Allah, the exalted, and they are destined to obtain those things. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, then warned him not to return to the pre-Islamic ways of ignorance, as Allah, the exalted, hates those ways and the people which followed those ways. In a hadith found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4606, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned that any matter which is not based on Islam will be rejected. If Muslims desire lasting success in both worldly and religious matters, they must strictly adhere to the teachings of the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Even though certain actions which are not directly taken from these two sources of guidance can still be considered a righteous deed, it is important to prioritize these two sources of guidance over all else. Because the fact is that the more one ACTS on things which are not taken from these two sources, even if it is a righteous deed, the less they will act on these two sources of guidance. An obvious example is how many Muslims have adopted cultural practices into their lives which do not have a foundation in these two sources of guidance. Even if these cultural practices are not sins, they have preoccupied Muslims from learning and acting on these two sources of guidance as they feel satisfied with their behavior. This leads to ignorance of the two sources of guidance which in turn will only lead to misguidance. This is why a Muslim must learn and act on these two sources of guidance which have been established by the leaders of guidance and only then act on other voluntary righteous deeds if they have the time and energy to do so. But if they choose ignorance and made up practices, even if they are not sins over learning and acting on these two sources of guidance, they will not achieve success. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, then advised him that when he reached his soldiers in Syria, he should be a good companion to them. This is best achieved when one treats others the way they desire to be treated by people. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, once advised in a hadith found in Sahih Bukhari, number 13, that a person cannot become a true believer until they love for others what they love for themselves. This does not mean a Muslim will lose their faith if they fail to adopt this characteristic. It means that a Muslim's faith will not be complete until they act on this advice. This hadith also indicates that a Muslim will not perfect their faith until they also dislike for others what they dislike for themselves. This is supported by another hadith found in Sahih Muslim, number 6586. It advises that the Muslim nation is like one body. If one part of the body is in pain, the rest of the body shares the pain. This mutual feeling includes loving and hating for others what one loves and hates for themselves. A Muslim can only achieve this status when their heart is free from evil traits, such as envy. These evil traits will always cause one to desire better for themselves. So in reality, this hadith is an indication that one should purify their heart by adopting good characteristics, such as being forgiving, and eliminate evil traits, such as envy. This is only possible through learning and acting on the teachings of the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. It is important for Muslims to understand that desiring good for others will cause them to lose out on good things. The treasury of Allah, the exalted, has no limits, so there is no need to adopt a selfish and greedy mentality. Desiring good for others includes striving to aid others in any way one can, such as financial or emotional support, in the same way a person would desire others to aid them in their moment of need. Therefore, this love must be shown through actions, not just words. Even when a Muslim forbids evil and offers advice which contradicts the desire of others, they should do so gently, just like they would want others to advise them kindly. As mentioned earlier, the main hadith under discussion indicates the importance of eliminating all bad characteristics which contradict mutual love and care, such as envy. Envy is when a person desires to possess a specific blessing which is only obtainable when it is taken away from someone else. This attitude is a direct challenge to the distribution of blessings chosen by Allah, the Exalted. This is why it is a major sin and leads to the destruction of the envious good deeds. This has been warned in a hadith found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4903. If a Muslim must desire the lawful things others possess, they should wish and supplicate to Allah, the Exalted, 
to grant them the same or similar thing without the other person losing the blessing. This type of jealousy is lawful and is praiseworthy in aspects of religion. This has been advised in a hadith found in Sahih Muslim, number 1896. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that Muslims should only be jealous of a wealthy person who uses their wealth correctly and be jealous of a knowledgeable person who uses their knowledge to benefit themselves and others. A Muslim should not only love for others to obtain lawful worldly blessings, but also for them to gain religious blessings in both worlds. In fact, when one wishes this for others, it encourages them to strive harder in the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions and by facing destiny with patience. This type of healthy competition is welcomed in Islam. Chapter 83 al mutafifun verse 26 So for this let the competitors compete. This encouragement will also inspire a Muslim to assess themselves in order to find and eliminate any faults in their character. When these two elements combine meaning, striving in sincere obedience to Allah, the Exalted, and purifying one's character, it leads to success in both worlds. A Muslim must therefore not only claim to love for others what they desire for themselves verbally, but show it through their actions. It is hoped that the one who is concerned for others in this way will receive the concern of Allah, the Exalted, in both worlds. This has been indicated in a hadith found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1930. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, then advised him that when he advised his soldiers, he should be brief in speech, as the nature of speech is that part of it makes the listener forget other parts of it. Every Islamic discourse should deliver a concise and useful message. Unfortunately, some only attend gatherings which are composed of storytelling with no real purpose and meaning. These gatherings are only held in order to please the masses with flowery but meaningless speech. Some lecturers incorrectly believe they must provide their listeners with hours worth of information in order to achieve success. But they fail to realize a few good words which inspire the audience towards improvement is much better. A gathering is only useful when the audience leaves with the sincere intention to reform themselves. But this requires the one who desires to spread the word of faith to turn away from the incorrect attitude of searching for new ideas and concepts before acting on the basics. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, then advised him that he should improve himself and as a result the people around him will improve also. It is important for all Muslims, especially parents, to act on what they advise to others. It is obvious if one turns the pages of history, that those who acted on what they preached had a much more positive effect on others compared to those who did not lead by example. The best example being the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, who not only practiced what he preached, but adhered to those teachings more strictly than anyone else. Only with this attitude will Muslims especially, parents have a positive impact on others. For example, if a mother warns her children not to lie, as it is a sin, but often lies in front of them, her children are unlikely to act on her advice. A person's actions will always have more of an impact on others than their speech. It is important to note that this does not mean one needs to be perfect before advising others. It means they should sincerely strive to act on their own advice before advising others. The Holy Quran has made it clear in the following verse that Allah, the Exalted, hates this behavior. In fact, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has warned in a hadith found in Sahih Bukhari, number 3267, that the a person who commanded good but refrained from it themselves and prohibited evil yet acted on it themselves will be punished in severely hell. Chapter 61 Asaf, verse 3. Greatly hateful in the sight of Allah is that you say what you do not do. So it is vital for all Muslims to strive to act on their advice themselves, then advise others to do the same. Leading by example is the tradition of all the holy prophets, peace be upon them, and is the best way to affect others in a positive way. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, advised that he must perform the obligatory prayers on their times and complete them with perfection and remain heedful during them. It is important to note, this advice was given during a time of war, when an enemy attack could occur at any moment. 
In a hadith found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2618, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned that the difference between belief and disbelief is abandoning the obligatory prayers. In this day and age, this has become far too common. Many give up their obligatory prayers for trivial reasons, all of which are undoubtedly rejected. If the obligation of the prayer has not been removed for the one who is engaging in battle, how can it be removed from anyone else? Chapter 4 and Nisa, verse 102. And when you, i.e. the commander of an army are among them and lead them in prayer, let a group of them stand in prayer with you and let them carry their arms. And when they have prostrated, let them be in position behind you and have the other group come forward which has not yet prayed and let them pray with you, taking precaution and carrying their arms. Neither is the traveler or the sick exempt from offering their obligatory prayers. The traveler has been advised to reduce the amount of cycles in some of the obligatory prayers in order to reduce the burden for them, but they have not been exempt from offering them. Chapter 4 and Nisa, verse 101. And when you travel throughout the land, there is no blame upon you for shortening the prayer. The sick have been advised to perform dry ablution if contact with water will harm them. Chapter 5 al Maida, verse 6. But if you are ill or on a journey or one of you comes from the place of relieving himself, or you have contacted women and do not find water, then seek clean earth and wipe over your faces and hands with it. In addition, the sick can perform the obligatory prayer in a way which is easier for them. Meaning, if they cannot stand, they are allowed to sit, and if they cannot sit, they can lay down and offer the obligatory prayer. This is confirmed in a hadith found in Jamie at Termidi, number 372. But again, no complete exemption is granted to the sick unless one is mentally ill, which prevents them from comprehending the obligation of the prayer. The other major issue is that some Muslims delay their obligatory prayers and offer them beyond their correct times. This clearly contradicts the Holy Quran, as the believers have been described as those who offer their obligatory prayers on time. Chapter 4 and Nisa, verse 103. Indeed, prayer has been decreed upon the believers a decree of specified times. Many believe that the following verse of the Holy Quran refers to those who unnecessarily delay their obligatory prayers. This has been discussed in Tafsir ibn Katir, volume 10, pages 603 to 604. Chapter 107 al Ma'an, verses 4 to 5. So woe to those who pray, but who are heedless of their prayer. Here Allah, the Exalted, has clearly cursed those who have adopted this evil trait. How can one find success in this world or the next if they have been removed from the mercy of Allah, the Exalted? The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, declared in a hadith found in Sunan an Nasai, number 512, that delaying one's obligatory prayers unnecessarily is a sign of hypocrisy. The Holy Quran has made it clear that one of the main reasons people will enter hell is failing to establish the obligatory prayers. Chapter 74 al Mudathir, verses 42 to 43. And asking them, what put you into Sakar? They will say, we were not of those who prayed. Abandoning the obligatory prayers is such a serious sin that the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, declared in a hadith found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2621, that whoever commits this sin has disbelieved in Islam. In addition, no other good deed will benefit a Muslim until their obligatory prayers are not established. A hadith found in Sahih Bukhari, number 553, clearly warns that one's good deeds are destroyed if they miss the afternoon obligatory prayer. If this is the case for abandoning one obligatory prayer, can one imagine the penalty of abandoning them all? Observing the obligatory prayers at their correct times has been advised to be one of the most beloved deeds to Allah, the Exalted, in a hadith found in Sahih Muslim, number 252. From this one can determine that delaying the obligatory prayers beyond their time or completely missing them is one of the most hated deeds by Allah, the Exalted. It is an important duty for all elders to encourage the children under their care to offer the obligatory prayers from a young age so that they establish them before it becomes legally binding on them.
Those adults that delay this and wait until children are older have failed in this extremely important duty. The children who were only encouraged to offer the obligatory prayers when it became obligatory on them very rarely established them quickly. In most cases, it takes years for them to fulfill this important duty correctly. And the blame falls on the elders of the family especially, the parents. This is why the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has advised in a hadith found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 495, that families most encourage their children to offer the obligatory prayers when they turn seven years old. Another major issue many Muslims face is that they may offer the obligatory prayers but fail to do so correctly. For example, many do not complete the stages of the prayer correctly and instead rush through it. In fact, a hadith found in Sahih Bukhari, number 757, clearly warns that the one who prays like this has not prayed at all. Meaning, they are not recorded as a person who offered their prayer and therefore their obligation has not been fulfilled. A hadith found in Jamie at Termidi, number 265, clearly warns that the prayer of the one who does not settle in each position of the prayer is not accepted. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, described the one who does not bow or prostrate correctly in the prayer as the worst thief. This has been warned in a hadith found in Mawata Malik, book number 9, hadith number 75. Unfortunately, Many Muslims who have spent decades offering their obligatory and many voluntary prayers like this will find that none of them have counted and thus they will be treated as one who did not fulfill their obligation. This is confirmed in a hadith found in Sunan and Nasai, number 1313. The Holy Quran indicates the importance of offering the obligatory prayers with congregation usually at a mosque. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 43 and bow with those who bow in worship and obedience. In fact, due to this verse and hadiths of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, some reliable scholars have declared this obligatory on Muslim men. For example, one hadith found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 550, clearly warns that the Muslims who would not offer their obligatory prayers with congregation at the mosque were considered hypocrites by the companions, may Allah be pleased with them. In fact, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, even threatened to burn the houses of the men who failed to perform their obligatory prayers at the mosque with congregation without a valid excuse. This is confirmed in a hadith found in Sahih Muslim, number 1482. Those Muslims who are in a position to perform this important deed should do so. They should not fool themselves into claiming they are performing other righteous deeds, such as helping their family with house chores. Even though this is a tradition of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, according to a hadith found in Sahih Bukhari, number 676, but it is important not to rearrange the importance of his traditions according to one's desires. Whoever does this is not following his traditions, they are only following their own desires, even if they are performing a righteous deed. In fact, this same hadith concludes by advising that when it was time for the obligatory prayer, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, would leave for the mosque. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, then advised him that when he sought the advice of others, he should be truthful in speech, and as a result, he would be given truthful counsel. Generally speaking, adopting truthfulness leads to goodness in all aspects of one's life. In a hadith found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1971, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, discussed the importance of truthfulness and avoiding lies. The first part advises that truthfulness leads to righteousness, which in turn leads to paradise. When a person persists on truthfulness, they are recorded by Allah, the exalted, as a truthful person. It is important to note that truthfulness has three levels. The first is when one is truthful in their intention and sincerity meaning they act only for the sake of Allah, the exalted, and do not benefit others for an ulterior motive such as fame. This in fact is the foundation of Islam as every action is judged on one's intention. This is confirmed in a hadith found in Sahih Bukhari, number one. The next level is when one is truthful through their words. This in reality means they avoid all types of verbal sins, not just lies. 
as the one who indulges in other verbal sins, cannot be a real truthful person. An excellent way of achieving this is by acting on a hadith found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2317, which advises that a person can only make their Islam excellent when they avoid getting involved in the things which do not concern them. The majority of verbal sins occur because a Muslim discusses something which does not concern them. The final stage is truthfulness in actions. This is achieved through the sincere obedience of Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions, and being patient with destiny, according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon Him, without cheery picking or misinterpreting the teachings of Islam which suit one's desires. They must adhere to hierarchy and priority order set by Allah, the Exalted, in all actions. The consequences of the opposite of these levels of truthfulness, namely, lying, according to the main hadith under discussion, is that it leads to disobedience, which in turn leads to the fire of hell. When one persists on this attitude, they will be recorded as a great liar by Allah, the exalted. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, then advised him that as a leader, he must not be afraid of punishing those who deserved it. One of the major reasons why society seems to be digressing is because people have abandoned acting justly. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, once warned in a hadith found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6787, that previous nations were destroyed as the authorities would punish the weak when they broke the law, but would pardon the rich and influential. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, being the head of state even declared in this hadith, that if his own daughter committed a crime, he would enforce the full legal punishment on her. Even though members of the general public might not be in a position to advise their leaders to remain just in their actions, but they can influence them indirectly by acting justly in all their dealings and actions. For example, a Muslim must act justly in respect to their dependents, such as their children, by treating them equally. This has been specifically advised in a hadith found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 3544. They should act justly in all their business dealings irrespective of who they deal with. If people act with justice on an individual level, then communities can change for the better, and in turn those who are in influential positions, such as politicians, will act justly whether they desire to or not. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, then advised him he should never spy on his soldiers or expose their secrets. He should rather be content with what his soldiers showed him outwardly. It is a major sin to spy on others in order to uncover faults which have been concealed by Allah, the Exalted. Chapter 49 Al-Hajarat, verse 12 And do not spy. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has warned in a hadith found in Sahih Bukhari, number 7042, that whoever spies on others, such as eavesdropping on their private conversations, will have molten lead poured into their ears on the day of judgment. Muslims should understand that if Allah, the exalted, is all-knowing yet still conceals the faults of others, then Muslims who possess limited God-given knowledge should not spy on others with the intention to uncover their faults and personal issues. Whoever uncovers the faults of others will have their faults exposed by Allah, the Exalted. This is confirmed in a hadith found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 2546. Instead Muslims should act on the other part of this hadith, which is to conceal the faults of others, so that Allah, the Exalted, conceals their faults. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, then advised him that he should not accompany foolish people who waste their time. Instead, he should accompany the truthful and faithful ones. In a hadith found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4031, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that a person who imitates a people is counted as one of them. All Muslims, irrespective of the strength of their faith, desire to be counted and end up with the righteous in the next world. But this hadith clearly warns that a Muslim will only be considered a righteous person and end up with them if they imitate the righteous. This imitation is a practical thing, not only a declaration through words. This imitation is correctly done by fulfilling the commands of Allah, the Exalted, refraining from His prohibitions, and by facing destiny with patience according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him.
But those who verbally declare their love for the righteous and fail to imitate them and instead imitate the characteristics found in hypocrites and the sinful will be considered and judged as one of them. This does not mean they will lose their faith, but it means they will be judged as disobedient Muslims. How can a disobedient Muslim be counted as an obedient Muslim and end up with the righteous? This is only wishful thinking which has no value in Islam. Chapter 59 Al-Hash verse 20 Not equal are the companions of the fire and the companions of paradise. The companions of paradise, they are the attainers of success. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, then advised him that he should be sincere and true when he confronted the enemy. This reminds Muslims the importance of remaining steadfast whenever they are attacked by their enemies namely, the devil, their inner devil and those who invite them towards the disobedience of Allah, the Exalted. A Muslim should not turn their back on the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, whenever they are tempted by these enemies. They should instead remain steadfast on the obedience to Allah, the Exalted, which involves fulfilling his commands, refraining from his prohibitions and facing destiny with patience. This is achieved by avoiding the places, things and people who invite and tempt them towards sins and the disobedience of Allah, the Exalted. Avoiding the traps of the devil is only achieved through gaining and acting on Islamic knowledge. The same way traps on a path are only avoided by possessing knowledge of them similarly. Islamic knowledge is required to avoid the traps of the devil. For example, a Muslim might spend much time reciting the Holy Quran, but because of their ignorance, they might destroy their righteous deeds without realizing it through sins such as backbiting. A Muslim is bound to face these attacks, so they should therefore prepare for them through the sincere obedience of Allah, the Exalted, and in return gain an uncountable reward. Allah, the Exalted, has guaranteed right guidance for those who struggle in this way for his sake. Chapter 29 al ankaba verse 69 and those who strive for us, we will surely guide them to our ways. Whereas facing these attacks with ignorance and disobedience will only lead one to difficulties and disgrace in both worlds. The same way a solider that possesses no weapons to defend themselves would be defeated. An ignorant Muslim will have no weapon to defend themselves when facing these attacks which will result in their defeat. Whereas, the knowledgeable Muslim is provided with the most powerful weapon which cannot be overcome or beaten, namely, sincere obedience of Allah, the Exalted. This is only achieved through sincerely gaining and acting on Islamic knowledge. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, then advised him that he should not behave cowardly, otherwise his soldiers would also behave cowardly. In a hadith found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 2511, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned against behaving cowardly. This attitude prevents trust in Allah, the Exalted, and in what he has promised, such as one's guaranteed provision. It can cause one to seek their provision in doubtful and unlawful means which will destroy a person in both worlds. Allah, the Exalted, does not accept any deed which has a foundation in the unlawful. This has been warned in a hadith found in Sahih Muslim, number 2342. In addition, being a coward prevents one from striving against the devil and one's inner devil, which requires genuine struggle. This will lead one to fail in obeying Allah, the Exalted, which involves fulfilling his commands, refraining from his prohibitions and facing destiny with patience according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him and it will therefore prevent them from fulfilling the rights of people. Both worldly and religious success requires effort and time. A coward will be too afraid to undertake this struggle, and will instead be lazy, which leads to failure in both worldly and religious matters. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, then advised him that he must not wrongfully take from the spoils of war, as this brings one closer to poverty and repels victory. Generally speaking, it is a major sin to utilize the unlawful. This includes using unlawful wealth, using items which are unlawful, and eating unlawful foods. It is important to note that the specific things which have been labeled unlawful by Islam such as alcohol are not the only things which are unlawful. In fact, even lawful things can become unlawful if they have been gained through unlawful things. For example, a lawful food can become unlawful if it is bought with unlawful wealth. 
Therefore, it is important for Muslims to ensure they only deal with lawful things, as it only takes one element of the unlawful to ruin someone. In fact, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, once warned in a hadith found in Sahih Muslim, number 2346, that the one who utilizes the unlawful will have all their supplications rejected. If their supplications are rejected by Allah, the exalted, can one expect any of their good deeds to be accepted? This in fact has been answered in another hadith found in Sahih Bukhari, number 1410. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, clearly warned that Allah, the Exalted, only accepts the lawful. Therefore, any deed which has a foundation in the unlawful, such as performing the holy pilgrimage with unlawful wealth, will be rejected. In fact, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned in a hadith found in Sahih Bukhari, number 3118, that this type of person will be sent to hell on Judgment Day. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 188 And do not consume one another's wealth unjustly or send it in bribery to the rulers in order that they might aid you to consume a portion of the wealth of the people in sin, while you know it is unlawful. The next thing Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, said was that he must not wrongfully take from the spoils of war, as this brings one closer to poverty and wards off victory. Success lies in remembrance. One of the four armies Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, dispatched to Syria, was led by Shurabil ibn Hazana, may Allah be pleased with him. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, walked alongside him while bidding farewell, and gave him the same advice he gave to Yazid ibn Abu Sufyan, may Allah be pleased with him, but added, that even during times of war, he must remember Allah, the Exalted, constantly and in every possible situation. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, pages 640 to 641. In a hadith found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6407, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that the difference between the person who remembers Allah, the Exalted, and the one who does not, is like a living person compared to a dead person. It is important for Muslims who desire to create a strong connection with Allah, the Exalted, so that they can overcome all difficulties in this world and in the hereafter successfully, to remember Allah, the Exalted, as much as possible. Put simply, the more they remember Him, the more they will achieve this vital goal. This is achieved by practically acting on the three levels of the remembrance of Allah, the Exalted. The first level is to remember Allah, the Exalted, internally and silently. This includes correcting one's intention so that they only act in order to please Allah, the Exalted. The second is by remembering Allah, the Exalted, through one's tongue. But the highest and most effective way of strengthening one's bond with Allah, the Exalted, is practically remembering Him with one's limbs. This is achieved by fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions, and by facing destiny with patience according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. This requires one to gain and act on Islamic knowledge, which in turn is the root of all good and success in both worlds. Those who remain on the first two levels will receive reward depending on their intention, but they are unlikely to increase the strength of their faith and piety unless they move to the third and highest level of the remembrance of Allah, the Exalted. These stages are the key to peace and success in both worlds. Chapter 13 Arad, verse 28 Unquestionably, by the remembrance of Allah do hearts find peace. Important advice. One of the four armies Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, dispatched to Syria, was led by Abu Ubaidah ibn Jarrah, may Allah be pleased with him. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, gave him the same advice he gave Yazid ibn Abu Sufyan, may Allah be pleased with him, which has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, pages 641 to 642. But he added that he should listen carefully to good advice, intending thereby to execute the commands that are given to him. Even though the number of preachers has increased over time and accessing information has become easier, yet the strength of Muslims has only weakened. One of the reasons is that many Muslims have adopted a mentality which has hindered them from learning and acting on Islamic knowledge namely, 
they believe merely listening to Islamic knowledge is good enough to succeed. This is a trap of the devil and completely contradicts the attitude of the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, and the righteous predecessors. They not only listened to religious knowledge, but they fully intended and fulfilled this intention by acting on the knowledge they heard. Failing to act in this way has caused the faith of Muslims to weaken. It is the reason why some Muslims have spent decades attending religious gatherings and talks, yet have not changed for the better at all. The danger of this attitude is that eventually, people will fall lower by believing that they can simply declare Islam with their tongues without the need to listen or act on religious teachings. Muslims will be left with ignorance as their guide, which will only lead them to destruction. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, also added that when it comes to the truth, he should treat everyone equally. In a hadith found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 5116, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, clearly warned that nobility does not lie in one's lineage, as all people are the descendants of the Holy Prophet Adam, peace be upon him, and he was made of dust. Therefore, people should give up boasting about their relatives and lineage. It is important to understand that even though some ignorant Muslims have adopted the attitude of other nations by creating castes and sects thereby believing some people are superior to others based on these groups, Islam declared a simple criterion for superiority, namely, piety. Meaning, the more a Muslim fulfills the commands of Allah, the exalted, refrains from his prohibitions and faces destiny with patience, the greater they are in rank in the sight of Allah, the exalted. Chapter 49 Al-Hajarat, verse 13 Indeed, the most noble of you in the sight of Allah is the most righteous of you. This verse destroys all other standards which have been created by ignorant people such as one's race, ethnicity, wealth, gender or social status. In addition, if a Muslim is proud of a pious person in their lineage, they should correctly demonstrate this belief by praising Allah, the exalted, and following in their footsteps. Boasting about others without following in their footsteps will not help someone in either this world or the next. This has been made clear in a hadith found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2945. Finally, the one who is proud of others but fails to follow in their footsteps is indirectly dishonoring them as the outside world will observe their bad character and assume their righteous ancestor behaved in the same manner. These people should therefore strive harder in the obedience of Allah, the exalted, because of this reason. These are like those people who adopt the outward traditions and advice of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, such as growing a beard or wearing a scarf yet, fail to adopt his inner character. The outside world will only think negatively about the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, when they observe the bad character of these Muslims. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, also added that he should always seek help from Allah, the Exalted, as he is sufficient for him as a helper. Even though having hope in people is not a sin, but as they are imperfect, a Muslim always runs the risk of being let down, in fact it is inevitable. They should instead strive to rely on Allah, the Exalted. This is only achieved through his obedience by fulfilling his commands, refraining from his prohibitions and by facing destiny with patience, as a Muslim who is disobedient will not depend on Allah, the Exalted. They should then fulfill their duties in respect of the creation without expecting or hoping in anything in return from them. This will aid in eliminating their dependency on them. Allah, the Exalted, has made it crystal clear that whoever correctly depends on him through his sincere obedience will be sufficed from all issues they might face in both worlds. Chapter 65 at Talak verse 3 And whoever relies upon Allah, then he is sufficient for him. As Allah, the Exalted, is firm on his promises when one depends on him, they too will become steadfast and firm when facing difficulties. But if they rely on people who are prone to change with the passing of time, they will become fickle and fail to remain steadfast. The stronger one's helper and refuge, the stronger they will become. If a Muslim seeks refuge with Allah, the Exalted, who has power over all things, through sincere obedience, they will become empowered to overcome all difficulties. But if they seek refuge and depend on people who by their nature are weak, they too will become weak in the face of difficulties. 
This is like a person who seeks refuge in a strong fortified castle during a storm and another who seeks refuge in a straw hut. It does not take a genius to determine who is more likely to overcome the difficulty of the storm successfully. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, also added that he should always place his trust in Allah, the Exalted, as he is sufficient as a guardian. In a hadith found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2459, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, described the difference between true hope in the mercy of Allah, the Exalted, and wishful thinking. True hope is when one controls their soul by avoiding the disobedience of Allah, the Exalted, and actively struggles for preparing for the hereafter. Whereas, the foolish wishful thinker follows their desires and then expects Allah, the Exalted, to forgive them and fulfill their wishes. It is important for Muslims not to confuse these two attitudes so that they avoid living and dying as a wishful thinker, as this person is highly unlikely to succeed in this world or the next. Wishful thinking is like a farmer who fails to prepare the land for planting, fails to plant seeds, fails to water the land, and then expects to harvest a huge crop. This is plain foolishness, and this farmer is highly unlikely to succeed. Whereas, true hope is like a farmer who prepares the land, plants seeds, waters the land, and then hopes Allah, the exalted, will bless them with a huge harvest. The key difference is that the one who possesses true hope will actively strive to obey Allah, the exalted, by fulfilling his commands, refraining from his prohibitions and by facing destiny with patience according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. And whenever they slip up, they sincerely repent. Whereas, the wishful thinker will not actively strive in obeying Allah, the Exalted, and instead follow their desires and still expect Allah, the Exalted, to forgive them and fulfill their wishes. Muslims must therefore learn the key difference so that they can abandon wishful thinking and instead adopt true hope in Allah, the Exalted, which always leads to nothing except good and success in both worlds. This has been indicated in a hadith found in Sahih Bukhari, number 7405. A specific type of wishful thinking which affected the past nations and even the Muslim nation is when a person believes that they can ignore the commands and prohibitions of Allah, the Exalted, and somehow someone on the Day of Judgment will intercede for them and save them from hell. Even though the intercession of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, is a fact and has been discussed in many hadiths, such as the one found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 4308. Nonetheless, even with his intercession, some Muslims whose punishment will be reduced by it will still enter hell. Even a single moment in hell is truly unbearable. So one should abandon wishful thinking and instead adopt true hope by practically striving in the obedience of Allah, the Exalted. The devil convinces those who do not believe in Judgment Day that even if it occurs they will make peace with Allah, the Exalted, on that day by claiming that they were not so bad as they avoided major crimes such as murder. They have convinced themselves that their pleas will be accepted and they will be sent to Paradise even though they disbelieved in Allah, the Exalted, during their lives on Earth. This is incredibly foolish, as Allah, the Exalted, will not treat the person who believed in him and tried to obey him like the one who disbelieved in him. A single verse has erased this type of wishful thinking. Chapter 3 Ali Imran, verse 85 And whoever desires other than Islam as religion, never will it be accepted from him, and he in the hereafter will be among the losers. Uniting Muslims one of the four armies Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, dispatched to Syria, was led by Abu Ubaidah ibn Jarrah, may Allah be pleased with him. After giving him advice, Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, summoned and spoke to Qais ibn Habra, may Allah be pleased with him, a renowned warrior who would be joining the army of Abu Ubaidah, may Allah be pleased with him. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, gave him some important advice thereby aiming to unify the Muslims under their appointed leader. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, pages 642 to 643. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, first mentioned the merits of his leader, Abu Ubaidah, may Allah be pleased with him. He reminded Qais ibn Habra that Abu Ubaidah, may Allah be pleased with them, was given the title of the trustworthy one by none other than the holy prophet Muhammad, 
Peace and blessings be upon him. This has been mentioned in a hadith found in Sahih Muslim, number 6252. In a hadith found in Sahih Bukhari, number 2749, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned that betraying trusts is an aspect of hypocrisy. This includes all the trusts one possesses from Allah, the exalted, and people. Every blessing one possesses has been entrusted to them by Allah, the exalted. The only way to fulfill these trusts is by using the blessings in the way which is pleasing to Allah, the exalted. This will ensure they gain further blessings, as this is true gratitude. Chapter 14 Ibrahim, verse 7 And remember when your Lord proclaimed, If you are grateful, I will surely increase you in favor. The trusts between people are important to fulfill also. The one who has been entrusted with someone else's belongings should not misuse them and only use them according to the wishes of the owner. One of the greatest trusts between people is keeping conversations secret unless there is some obvious benefit in informing others. Unfortunately, this is often overlooked amongst Muslims. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, first mentioned the merits of his leader, Abu Ubaidah, may Allah be pleased with him. He also reminded him that Abu Ubaidah, may Allah be pleased with him, was someone who did not transgress on others, even when they transgressed against him. When he was wronged, he would forgive. A hadith found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6853, advises that the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, never took revenge for himself but instead pardoned and overlooked. Muslims have been given permission to defend themselves in a proportionate and reasonable way when they are left with no other options. But they should never step over the line, as this is a sin. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 190 Fight in the way of Allah those who fight against you but do not transgress. Indeed, Allah does not like transgressors. As stepping over the mark is difficult to avoid a Muslim should therefore adhere to patience, overlook and forgive others, as it is not only the tradition of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, but also leads to Allah, the exalted, forgiving their sins. Chapter 24 and Nur, verse 22. And let them pardon and overlook. Would you not like that Allah should forgive you? Forgiving others is also more effective in changing the character of others in a positive way, which is the purpose of Islam, and a duty on Muslims, as taking revenge only leads to further enmity and anger between the people involved. Finally, those who have the bad habit of not forgiving others and always hold on to grudges, even over minor issues, may well find that Allah, the Exalted, does not overlook their faults and instead scrutinizes each of their small sins. A Muslim should learn to let things go, as this leads to forgiveness and peace of mind in both worlds. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, first mentioned the merits of his leader, Abu Ubaidah, may Allah be pleased with him. He reminded him that Abu Ubaidah, may Allah be pleased with him, was someone who mended ties with people, even if others severed them. In a hadith found in Sahih Muslim, number 6586, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, declared that the Muslim nation is like one body. If any part of the body suffers pain, the rest of the body shares in its pain. This hadith, like many others, indicates the importance of not becoming so self-absorbed into one's own life thereby behaving as if the universe revolves around them and their problems. The devil inspires a Muslim to focus so much on their own life and their problems that they lose focus on the bigger picture which leads to impatience and causes them to become heedless of others thereby failing their duty in supporting others according to their means. A Muslim should always bear this in mind and strive to aid others as much as they can. This extends to beyond financial help and includes all verbal and physical help such as good and sincere advice. Muslims should regularly observe the news and those who are in difficult situations all over the world. This will inspire them to avoid becoming self-centered and instead aid others. In reality, the one who only cares about themselves is lower in rank than an animal as even they care about their offspring. In fact, a Muslim should be better than animals by practically caring for others beyond their own family. Even though a Muslim cannot remove all the problems of the world, but they can play their part and help others according to their means, 
as this is what Allah, the Exalted, commands and expects. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, first mentioned the merits of his leader, Abu Ubaidah, may Allah be pleased with him. He reminded him that Abu Ubaidah, may Allah be pleased with him, was merciful towards the believers. In a hadith found in Sahih Bukhari, number 7376, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned that Allah, the Exalted, will not show mercy to the one who does not show mercy to others. Islam is a very simple religion. One of its fundamental teachings is so simple that even uneducated people can understand and act on them namely, how people treat others is how they will be treated by Allah, the Exalted. For example, those who learn to overlook and forgive the mistakes of others will be forgiven by Allah, the Exalted. Chapter 24 and Nur, verse 22. And let them pardon and overlook. Would you not like that Allah should forgive you? Those who support others in beneficial worldly and religious matters such as emotional or financial aid will be supported by Allah, the Exalted, in both worlds. This has been advised in a hadith found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4893. This same hadith advises that the one who conceals the faults of others will have their faults concealed by Allah, the Exalted. Simply put, if one treats others with kindness and respect according to the teachings of Islam, they will be treated similarly by Allah, the Exalted. And those who mistreat others will be treated similarly by Allah, the Exalted, even if they fulfill the obligatory duties which are connected to him, such as the obligatory prayers. This is because a Muslim must fulfill both duties in order to achieve success, namely, the duties towards Allah, the Exalted, and people. Finally, it is important to note a Muslim will only be treated kindly by Allah, the Exalted, if they treat others kindly for his sake. If they do it for any other reason, then they will undoubtedly forfeit the reward mentioned in these teachings. The foundation of all ACTS and Islam itself is one's intention. This has been confirmed in a hadith found in Sahih Bukhari, number 1. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, first mentioned the merits of his leader, Abu Ubaidah, may Allah be pleased with him. He reminded him that Abu Ubaidah, may Allah be pleased with him, was harsh against disbelievers. This harshness refers to remaining firm on the sincere obedience of Allah, the Exalted, when one is invited towards evil. One must be harsh against evil which results from disbelief, not harsh against people. Muslims must not befriend those who direct them away from the sincere obedience of Allah, the Exalted. This involves fulfilling the commands of Allah, the Exalted, refraining from his prohibitions and facing destiny with patience. This in reality, can apply to both Muslims and non-Muslims. As warned in a hadith found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4833, a Muslim is on the religion of their friend. This means a person will adopt the characteristics, good or bad, which their companions possess. In addition, treating all people kindly, Muslims and non-Muslims, is the characteristic of a true Muslim and true believer. A hadith found in Sunan and Nasai, number 4998, advises that a true Muslim is the one who keeps other people, including non-Muslims, safe from their evil speech and actions. And a true believer does not harm people or their possessions through their speech or actions. So this advice warns Muslims to accompany the pious, as they will direct them towards the mercy and obedience of Allah, the Exalted. It is important to understand that there is a difference between healthy social conduct with others and deep friendship with others. Deep friendship can lead one to compromising on their faith out of love for their companion, whereas good social conduct with others will never take one to this level. Therefore, Muslims must adopt good character and manners towards everyone, but reserve deep friendship for those who will encourage them towards the sincere obedience of Allah, the Exalted. This only a Muslim can do for another Muslim. A non-Muslim, on the other hand, will either directly or indirectly encourage a Muslim to disobey Allah, the Exalted, even if they do not intend this. This is because a non-Muslim lives by a separate code of conduct than a Muslim. And the behavior which is acceptable to a non-Muslim may not be acceptable in the eyes of Islam. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, first mentioned the merits of his leader, Abu Ubaidah, may Allah be pleased with him. 
Then he ordered him not to disobey the commands of Abu Ubaidah, may Allah be pleased with him, or oppose his views, as he would only command that which was good. In a hadith found in Sahih Muslim number 196, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that Islam is sincerity towards the leaders of society. This includes kindly offering them the best advice and supporting them in their good decisions by any means necessary, such as financial or physical help. According to a hadith found in Imam Malik's Mawata, book number 56, hadith number 20, fulfilling this duty pleases Allah, the Exalted. Chapter 4 and Nisa, verse 59. O you who have believed, obey Allah and obey the Messenger and those in authority among you. This makes it clear that it is a duty to obey the leaders of society. But it is important to note, this obedience is a duty as long as one does not disobey Allah, the Exalted. There is no obedience to the creation if it leads to the disobedience of the Creator. In cases like this, Revolting against leaders should be avoided as it only leads to the harm of innocent people. Instead, the leaders should be gently advised good and forbidden evil according to the teachings of Islam. One should advise others to act accordingly and always supplicate for the leaders to remain on the correct path. If the leaders remain straight, the general public will remain straight also. To be deceitful towards the leaders is a sign of hypocrisy which one must avoid at all times. Sincerity also includes striving to obey them in matters which unite society on good and warning against anything which causes disruption in society. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, also reminded Qais ibn Haybara, may Allah be pleased with him, to remain sincere to Allah, the Exalted, and reminded him that those who use their strength and ability to promote the cause of Islam will obtain a tremendous reward. This is connected to chapter 47 Muhammad, verse 7. O oh, you who have believed, if you support Allah, he will support you and plant firmly your feet. This verse means that if one aids Islam, then Allah, the Exalted, will help them in both worlds. It is strange how countless people desire the help of Allah, the Exalted, yet do not fulfill the first part of this verse through the sincere obedience of Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling his commands, refraining from his prohibitions and by facing destiny with patience. The excuse most people give is that they do not have time to perform righteous deeds. They desire the help of Allah, the Exalted, yet will not make time to do the things which please him. Does this make sense? Those who do not fulfill the obligatory duties and then expect the aid of Allah, the Exalted, in their moment of need are quite foolish. And those who do fulfill the obligatory duties, yet refuse to go beyond them, will find that the aid they receive is limited. How one behaves is how they are treated. The more time and energy dedicated to Allah, the Exalted, the more support they will receive. It really is that simple. A Muslim needs to understand that the majority of the obligatory duties, such as the five daily prayers, only takes a small amount of time in one's day. A Muslim cannot expect to barely dedicate an hour a day to offering the obligatory prayers and then neglect Allah, the Exalted, for the rest of the day and still expect his continuous support through all difficulties. A person would dislike a friend who treated them in such a manner. How then can one treat Allah, the Exalted, the Lord of the worlds like this then? Some only dedicate extra time to pleasing Allah, the Exalted, when they encounter a worldly problem then demand him to fix it as if they done Allah, the Exalted, a favor by performing voluntary good deeds. This foolish mentality clearly contradicts servanthood to Allah, the Exalted. It is amazing how this type of person finds time to do all their other leisurely activities, such as spending time with family and friends, watching TV and attending social functions, yet finds no time to dedicate to pleasing Allah, the Exalted. They cannot seem to find time to recite and adopt the teachings of the Holy Quran. They do not seem to find time to study and act on the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. These people somehow find wealth to spend on their unnecessary luxuries, yet seem to find no wealth to donate in voluntary charity. It is important to understand that a Muslim will be treated according to how they behave. Meaning, if a Muslim dedicates extra time to please Allah, the Exalted, then they will find the support they need to journey through all difficulties safely. 
But if they fail to fulfill the obligatory duties or only fulfill them without dedicating any other time to pleasing Allah, the Exalted, then they will find a similar response from Allah, the Exalted. Put simply, the more one gives, the more they shall receive. If one does not give much, they should not expect much in return. Focusing on obedience. During the expedition to Syria, Abu Bakr dispatched Amr ibn al-As, may Allah be pleased with them, as the leader of an army to Palestine. Before he departed Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, gave him some advice which has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq pages 717 to 718. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, reminded him to fear Allah, the exalted, in public and private. In a hadith found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2347, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that his true friend is the one who obeys Allah, the exalted, by fulfilling his commands, refraining from his prohibitions and by facing destiny with patience according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, in public and in private. Doing so in private indicates a person's sincerity to Allah, the Exalted, meaning, they only perform righteous deeds for his sake. This is the one who firmly remembers that no matter where they are, the inner and outer aspects of their being is constantly being observed by Allah, the Exalted. If one persists on this belief, they will adopt excellence of faith, which is mentioned in a hadith found in Sahih Muslim, number 99. It means they act, such as performing the prayer, as if they can observe Allah, the Exalted, watching them. This encourages righteous deeds and prevents sins. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, also reminded him to strive for the sake of Allah, the Exalted, and work for the hereafter. In a hadith found in Sunan ibn Majah, number 3989, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned that even slightly showing off is polytheism. This is a minor type of polytheism, which does not cause one to lose their faith. Instead, it leads to the loss of reward, as this Muslim acted for the sake of pleasing people, when they should have acted to please Allah, the Exalted. In fact, these people will be told on Judgment Day, to seek their reward from those they acted for, which will not be possible. This has been warned in a hadith found in Jamie at Termidi, number 3154. If the devil cannot prevent one from performing righteous deeds, he will attempt to corrupt their intention, thereby destroying their reward. If he cannot corrupt their intention in an obvious way, he tries to corrupt it through subtle ways. This includes when people subtly show off their righteous deeds to others. Sometimes it is so subtle that the person themselves are not fully aware of what they are doing. As gaining and acting on knowledge is a duty on all, according to a hadith found in Sunan ibn Majah, number 224, claiming ignorance will not be accepted by Allah, the Exalted, on Judgment Day. Subtly showing off often occurs through social media and one's speech. For example, a Muslim might inform others they are fasting, even though no one directly asked them if they were fasting. Another example is when one publicly recites the Holy Quran from memory in front of others, thereby showing others they have memorized the Holy Quran. Even criticizing oneself publicly can be considered showing off one's humility to others. To conclude, showing off subtly destroys a Muslim's reward and must be avoided in order to safeguard their righteous deeds. This is only possible by learning and acting on Islamic knowledge, such as how to safeguard one's speech. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, also advised him to behave as a loving father to those under his leadership. In a hadith found in Sahih Bukhari, number 2409, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that each person is a guardian and responsible for the things under their care. The greatest thing a Muslim is a guardian of is their faith. Therefore, they must strive to fulfill its responsibility by fulfilling the commands of Allah, the Exalted, refraining from his prohibitions, and by facing destiny with patience according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. This guardianship also includes every blessing one has been granted by Allah, the Exalted, which includes external things such as wealth and internal things such as one's body. 
a Muslim must fulfill the responsibility of these things by using them in the way prescribed by Islam. For example, a Muslim should only use their eyes to look at lawful things and their tongue to utter only lawful and useful words. This guardianship also extends to others within one's life, such as relatives and friends. A Muslim must fulfill this responsibility by fulfilling their rights, such as providing for them and gently commanding good and forbidding evil, according to the teachings of Islam. One should not cut off from others, especially over worldly issues. Instead, they should continue to treat them kindly, hoping they will change for the better. This guardianship includes one's children. A Muslim must guide them by leading by example, as this by far is the most effective way in guiding children. They must obey Allah, the Exalted, practically as discussed earlier, and teach their children to do the same. To conclude, according to this hadith, everyone has some sort of responsibility they have been entrusted with. So they should gain and act on the relevant knowledge in order to fulfill them, as this is a part of obeying Allah, the Exalted. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, also advised him to strictly adhere to the obligatory prayers and ensure his soldiers did the same. In a hadith found in Sahih Bukhari, number 574, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that whoever establishes the two cool obligatory prayers will enter paradise. The two cool obligatory prayers refer to the dawn and late afternoon obligatory prayers, as during these two times, the weather is cooler than at other times, meaning before sunrise and before sunset. Establishing the obligatory prayers includes fulfilling all their conditions and etiquettes correctly, according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him, such as offering them on time. In fact, offering them as soon as they occur is one of the most beloved deeds to Allah, the Exalted. This has been advised in a hadith found in Sahih Muslim, number 252. Even though there are five obligatory prayers which must be established yet, only two have been mentioned in the main hadith under discussion. This is because these two prayers are arguably the two hardest to establish. The obligatory dawn prayer occurs at a time when most people are asleep. Therefore, it requires much energy and motivation in order to leave one's comfortable bed in order to offer it correctly. The obligatory late afternoon prayer mostly occurs at a time where most people have completed their working day and have returned home tired. So to leave one's relaxation after a tiring and even stressful day of work in order to correctly offer their obligatory prayer is difficult. Therefore, if one correctly establishes these two prayers, they will through the mercy of Allah, the Exalted, find it easier to establish the other obligatory prayers, which usually occur at more convenient times. Muslims should therefore strive to establish all their obligatory prayers, as it is the very essence of Islam, and it in fact separates belief from disbelief. This has been confirmed in a hadith found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2618. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, also advised him to encourage his soldiers to recite and act on the Holy Quran. In a hadith found in Sahih Muslim number 196, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that Islam is sincerity towards the Holy Quran. This includes having deep respect and love for the words of Allah, the Exalted. This sincerity is proven when one fulfills the three aspects of the Holy Quran. The first is to recite it correctly and regularly. The second is to understand its teachings through a reliable source and teacher. The final aspect is to act on the teachings of the Holy Quran with the aim of pleasing Allah, the Exalted. The sincere Muslim gives priority to acting on its teachings over acting on their desires which contradict the Holy Quran. Modeling one's character on the Holy Quran is the sign of true sincerity towards the Book of Allah, the Exalted. This is the tradition of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, which is confirmed in a hadith found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 1342. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, also advised him to forbid his soldiers from discussing the days of pre-Islamic ignorance, as this only leads to the love of tribalism, which in turn leads to disunity. In a hadith found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 5116,
The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, clearly warned that nobility does not lie in one's lineage, as all people are the descendants of the Holy Prophet Adam, peace be upon him, and he was made of dust. Therefore, people should give up boasting about their relatives and lineage. It is important to understand that even though some ignorant Muslims have adopted the attitude of other nations by creating castes and sects thereby believing some people are superior to others, based on these groups, Islam, declared a simple criterion for superiority, namely, piety. Meaning, the more a Muslim fulfills the commands of Allah, the exalted, refrains from his prohibitions and faces destiny with patience, the greater they are in rank in the sight of Allah, the exalted. Chapter 49 Al-Hajarat, verse 13 Indeed, the most noble of you in the sight of Allah is the most righteous of you. This verse destroys all other standards which have been created by ignorant people such as one's race, ethnicity, wealth, gender or social status. In addition, if a Muslim is proud of a pious person in their lineage, they should correctly demonstrate this belief by praising Allah, the exalted, and following in their footsteps. Boasting about others without following in their footsteps will not help someone in either this world or the next. This has been made clear in a hadith found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2945. Finally, the one who is proud of others but fails to follow in their footsteps is indirectly dishonoring them, as the outside world will observe their bad character and assume their righteous ancestor behaved in the same manner. These people should therefore strive harder in the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, because of this reason. These are like those people who adopt the outward traditions and advice of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, such as growing a beard or wearing a scarf yet, fail to adopt his inner character. The outside world will only think negatively about the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, when they observe the bad character of these Muslims. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, also advised him to turn away from the temptations of the material world and remain steadfast on focusing on the hereafter until he dies. One must gain the correct perception and understanding in respect to this material world and the hereafter in order to achieve this noble aim. In a hadith found in Sunan ibn Majah, number 4108, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that the material world compared to the hereafter is like a drop of water compared to an ocean. In reality, this parable was given in order for people to understand how small the material world is compared to the hereafter. But in reality, they cannot be compared as the material world is temporal, whereas the hereafter is eternal. Meaning, the limited cannot be compared to the unlimited. The material world can be split into four categories, fame, fortune, authority, and one's social life, such as their family and friends. No matter what worldly blessing one obtains which falls within these groups, it will always be imperfect, transient, and death will cut a person off from the blessing. On the other hand, the blessings in the hereafter are lasting and perfect. So in this respect, the material world is no more than a drop compared to an endless ocean. In addition, a person is not guaranteed to experience a long life in this world, as the time of death is unknown. Whereas, everyone is guaranteed to experience death and reach the hereafter. So it is foolish to strive for a day, such as one's retirement, which they may never reach over striving for the hereafter which they are guaranteed to reach. This does not mean one should abandon the world, as it is a bridge which must be crossed in order to reach the hereafter safely. Instead, a Muslim should take from this material world enough to fulfill their necessities and the necessities of their dependents, according to the teachings of Islam, without waste, excessiveness or extravagance. And then dedicate the rest of their efforts in preparing for the eternal hereafter by fulfilling the commands of Allah, the Exalted, refraining from his prohibitions and by facing destiny with patience according to the teachings of Islam. An intelligent person will not prioritize the drop of water over an endless ocean, and an intelligent Muslim would not prioritize the temporal material world over the eternal hereafter. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, also advised him to adhere to the characteristics in the following verse in order to become a great leader. Chapter 21 Al-Anbiya, verse 73 And we made them leaders guiding by our command. 
and we inspired to them the doing of good deeds, establishment of prayer and giving of zakah, and they were worshippers of us. Remaining humble After the success gained in Iraq, Abu Bakr ordered Khalid bin Walid, may Allah be pleased with them, to move towards Syria, meaning towards the Roman Empire. He also reminded him, and others, that he should not become proud at the victories he obtained, as they were granted by none other than Allah, the Exalted. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, pages 602 to 603. This is connected to chapter 25 al furqan verse 63. And the servants of the most merciful are those who walk upon the earth easily. The servants of Allah, the Exalted, have understood that anything good they possess is solely because Allah, the Exalted, granted it to them. And any evil they are saved from is because Allah, the Exalted, protected them. Is it not foolish to be proud of something that does not belong to someone? Just like a person does not boast about a sports car which does not belong to them, Muslims must realize nothing in reality belongs to them. This attitude ensures one remains humble at all times. The humble servants of Allah, the Exalted, fully believe in the hadith of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, found in Sahih Bukhari, number 5673, which declares that the righteous deeds of a person will not take them to paradise. Only the mercy of Allah, the Exalted, can cause this to occur. This is because every righteous deed is only possible when Allah, the Exalted, provides one with the knowledge, strength, opportunity and inspiration to perform it. Even the acceptance of the deed is dependent on the mercy of Allah, the Exalted. When one bears this in mind, it saves them from pride and inspires them to adopt humility. One should always remember that being humble is not a sign of weakness, as Islam has encouraged one to defend themselves if necessary. In other words, Islam teaches Muslims to be humble without weakness. In fact, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has confirmed in a hadith found in Jami at Termidi, number 2029, that whoever humbles themselves before Allah, the Exalted, will be raised by him. So in reality, humility leads to honor in both worlds. One only needs to reflect on the most humble of the creation to understand this fact, namely, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Allah, the Exalted, has clearly ordered people by ordering the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, to adopt this important quality. Chapter 26 Ash-Shu'ara, verse 215 And lower your wing, i.e., show kindness to those who follow you of the believers. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, led a humble life. For example, he happily carried out the domestic duties at home, thereby proving these chores are gender neutral. This is confirmed in Imam Bukhari's Adab al-Mufrad, number 538. Humility is an inner characteristic that manifests outwards, such as the way one walks. This is discussed in another verse, chapter 31, Luke Man, verse 18. And do not turn your cheek in contempt toward people, and do not walk through the earth exultantly. Allah, the Exalted, has made it clear that paradise is for the humble servants who possess no trace of pride. Chapter 28 al Qasas, verse 83. That home of the hereafter we assign to those who do not desire exaltedness upon the earth or corruption. And the best outcome is for the righteous. In fact, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has confirmed in a hadith found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1998, that whoever possesses an atom's worth of pride will not enter paradise. Only Allah, the Exalted, has the right to be proud, as He is the Creator, Sustainer, and Owner of the entire universe. It is important to note, pride is when one believes they are superior to others and rejects the truth when it is presented to them, as they dislike accepting the truth when it comes from other than them. This is confirmed in a hadith found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4092. Building trust in Allah, the Exalted. After being commanded to head to Syria to engage with the Roman Empire, Khalid bin Walid, may Allah be pleased with him, decided on taking an extremely dangerous path to Syria from Iraq in order to avoid alerting the Romans who were guarding their borders.
After taking practical steps to prepare for the long and difficult journey, he commented that as long as the help of Allah, the Exalted, is with a Muslim, they should not be bothered by any difficulty they face. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, pages 605 to 606. Khalid, may Allah be pleased with him, fulfilled both aspects of trusting in Allah, the Exalted. The first is using the means provided by Allah, the Exalted, in ways pleasing to him. And the second is to confidently believe that the outcome of the situation, which is always decided by Allah, the Exalted, will be best for everyone involved. Muslims often question how they can build up and strengthen their trust in Allah, the Exalted, especially during difficulties. One of the main ways of doing this is through the sincere obedience of Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions and by facing destiny with patience. This is because the one who is disobedient to Allah, the Exalted, will always believe Allah, the Exalted, will not help them, which in turn weakens their trust in Him. Whereas, the obedient Muslim will firmly believe that as they have fulfilled their duties Allah, the Exalted, will definitely respond to them in their moment of need, which in turn strengthens their trust in Allah, the Exalted. In addition, a hadith found in Sahih Bukhari, number 7405, advises that Allah, the Exalted, responds to a person according to their perception of Him. The disobedient person will always have negative thoughts about Allah, the Exalted, because of their disobedience. Whereas, an obedient Muslim will always have positive thoughts about Allah, the Exalted, because of their obedience. This thinking can weaken or strengthen a Muslim's trust in Allah, the Exalted. The obedient Muslim trusts that if they fulfilled their side of a business contract, their business partner would do the same. Similarly, an obedient Muslim trusts that as they through the mercy of Allah, the Exalted, have fulfilled their duties Allah, the Exalted, will fulfill His promises by aiding them throughout their life especially through difficulties. Whereas, the one who does not fulfill their side of a business contract would not trust or hope that their business partner will fulfill their side. Similarly, a disobedient person would not trust that Allah, the Exalted, would aid them as they failed to fulfill their duties. To conclude, having and building trust in Allah, the Exalted, is directly linked to His obedience. The more one is obedient, the more they will trust in Him. The less they are obedient, the less they will trust in Him. Unified for Allah, the Exalted. While in Syria, Khalid bin Walid and his army, may Allah be pleased with them, reached Kanat Basra. There, he found many of the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, who were part of a different army, and they too were attacking the city. These companions, may Allah be pleased with them, willingly accepted the leadership of Khalid, may Allah be pleased with him, and worked together to conquer the city. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, page 609. It is obvious that the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, adopted the important Islamic principle of unity. They always put aside their differences and abandoned all worldly motives and instead unified under the banner of pleasing Allah, the Exalted. They took the practical steps required to create unity, steps all Muslims must take. A hadith found in Sahih Muslim, number 6541 discusses some aspects of creating unity within society. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, firstly advised Muslims not to envy each other. This is when a person desires to obtain the very blessing someone else possesses meaning. They desire for the owner to lose the blessing. And it involves disliking the fact that the owner was given the blessing by Allah, the Exalted, instead of them. Some only desire this to occur in their hearts without showing it through their actions or speech. If they dislike their thought and feeling, it is hoped that they will not be held accountable for their envy. Some exert efforts through their speech and actions in order to confiscate the blessing from the other person, which is undoubtedly a sin. The worst kind is when a person strives to remove the blessing from the owner, even if the envier does not obtain the blessing. Envy is only lawful when a person does not act on their feelings, dislikes their feeling, and if they strive to obtain a similar blessing without the owner losing the blessing they possess. Even though this type is not sinful yet, 
It is disliked if the envy is over a worldly blessing and only praiseworthy if it involves a religious blessing. For example, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, mentioned two examples of the praiseworthy type in a hadith found in Sahih Muslim, number 1896. The first is when a person envies the one who acquires and spends lawful wealth in ways pleasing to Allah, the exalted. The second is when a person envies the one who uses their wisdom and knowledge in the correct way and teaches it to others. The evil type of envy, as mentioned earlier, directly challenges the choice of Allah, the exalted. The envious person behaves as if Allah, the exalted, made a mistake giving a particular blessing to someone else instead of them. This is why it is a major sin. In fact, as warned by the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, in a hadith found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4903, envy destroys good deeds just like fire consumes wood. An envious Muslim must strive to act on the hadith found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2515. It advises that a person cannot be a true believer until they love for others what they love for themselves. An envious Muslim should therefore strive to remove this feeling from their heart by showing good character and kindness towards the person they envy, such as praising their good qualities and supplicating for them until their envy becomes love for them. Another thing advised in the main hadith quoted at the beginning is that Muslims should not hate each other. This means one should only dislike something if Allah, the exalted, dislikes it. This has been described as an aspect of perfecting one's faith in a hadith found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4681. A Muslim should therefore not dislike things or people according to their own desires. If one dislikes another according to their own desires, they should never allow it to affect their speech or actions, as it is sinful. A Muslim should strive to remove the feeling by treating the other according to the teachings of Islam meaning with respect and kindness. A Muslim should remember that other people are not perfect, just like they are not perfect. And if others possess a bad characteristic, they will undoubtedly possess good qualities also. Therefore, a Muslim should advise others to abandon their bad characteristics, but continue to love the good qualities they possess. Another point must be made on this topic. A Muslim who follows a particular scholar who advocates a specific belief should not act like a fanatic and believe their scholar is always right thereby hating those who oppose their scholar's opinion. This behavior is not disliking something someone for the sake of Allah, the exalted. As long as there is a legitimate difference of opinion amongst the scholars, a Muslim following a particular scholar should respect this and not dislike others who differ from what the scholar they follow believes. The next thing mentioned in the main hadith under discussion is that Muslims should not turn away from each other. This means they should not sever ties with other Muslims over worldly issues, thereby refusing to support them according to the teachings of Islam. According to a hadith found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6077, it is unlawful for a Muslim to sever ties with another Muslim over a worldly issue for more than three days. In fact, the one who severs ties for more than a year over a worldly issue is considered like the one who has killed another Muslim. This has been warned in a hadith found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4915. Severing ties with others is only lawful in matters of faith. But even then, a Muslim should continue to advise the other Muslim to sincerely repent and only avoid their company if they refuse to change for the better. They should still support them on lawful things when they are requested to do so, as this act of kindness may inspire them to sincerely repent from their sins. Another thing mentioned in the main hadith under discussion is that Muslims are commanded to be like brothers to one another. This is only achievable if they obey the previous advice given in this hadith and strive to fulfill their duty towards other Muslims according to the teachings of Islam such as helping others in matters of good and warning them from evil matters. Chapter 5 al maida verse 2 And cooperate in righteousness and piety, but do not cooperate in sin and aggression. A hadith found in Sahih Bukhari, number 1240, advises that a Muslim should fulfill the following rights of other Muslims. They are to return the Islamic greeting of peace, 
to visit the sick, to take part in their funeral prayers, and to reply to the sneezer who praises Allah, the exalted. A Muslim must learn and fulfill all the rights other people, especially other Muslims, have over them. Another thing mentioned in the main hadith under discussion is that a Muslim should not wrong, forsake or hate another Muslim. The sins a person commits should be hated, but the sinner should not be as they may sincerely repent at any time. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has warned in a hadith found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4884, that whoever humiliates another Muslim Allah, the exalted, will humiliate them. And whoever protects a Muslim from humiliation will be protected by Allah, the exalted. The negative characteristics mentioned in the main hadith quoted at the beginning can develop when one adopts pride. According to a hadith found in Sahih Muslim, number 265, pride is when one looks down on others in contempt. The proud person sees themselves as perfect while seeing others as imperfect. This prevents them from fulfilling the rights of others and encourages them to dislike others. Another thing mentioned in the main hadith is that true piety is not in one's physical appearance, such as wearing beautiful clothes, but it is an internal characteristic. This internal characteristic manifests outwardly in the form of fulfilling the commands of Allah, the Exalted, refraining from His prohibitions and by facing destiny with patience. This is why the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has declared in a hadith found in Sahih Muslim, number 4094, that when the spiritual heart is purified the whole body becomes purified, but when the spiritual heart is corrupt the whole body becomes corrupt. It is important to note that Allah, the Exalted, does not judge based on outward appearances, such as wealth, but He considers the intentions and actions of people. This is confirmed in a hadith found in Sahih Muslim, number 6542. Therefore, a Muslim must strive to adopt internal piety through learning and acting on the teachings of Islam, so that it manifests outwardly in the way they interact with Allah, the Exalted, and the Creation. The next thing mentioned in the main hadith under discussion is that it is a sin for a Muslim to hate another Muslim. This hatred applies to worldly things and not disliking others for the sake of Allah, the Exalted. In fact, loving and hating for the sake of Allah, the Exalted, is an aspect of perfecting one's faith. This is confirmed in a hadith found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4681. But even then, a Muslim must show respect to others in all cases and dislike only their sins without actually hating the person. In addition, their dislike must never cause them to act against the teachings of Islam, as this would prove their hatred is based on their own desires and not for the sake of Allah, the Exalted. The root cause of despising others for worldly reasons is pride. It is vital to understand that an atom's worth of pride is enough to take one to hell. This is confirmed in a hadith found in Sahih Muslim, number 265. The next thing mentioned in the main hadith is that a Muslim's life, property and honor are all sacred. A Muslim must not violate any of these rights without a just reason. In fact, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has declared in a hadith found in Sunan an nasai number 4998, that a person cannot be a true Muslim until they protect other people, including non-Muslims, from their harmful speech and actions. And a true believer is the one who keeps their evil away from the lives and property of others. Whoever violates these rights will not be forgiven by Allah, the Exalted, until their victim forgives them first. If they do not, then justice will be established on Judgment Day, whereby the good deeds of the oppressor will be given to the victim, and if necessary, the sins of the victim will be given to the oppressor. This may cause the oppressor to be hurled into hell. This is warned in a hadith found in Sahih Muslim, number 6579. To conclude, a Muslim should treat others exactly how they want people to treat them. This will lead to much blessings for an individual and create unity within their society. Facing difficulties. During the expedition to Syria, Khalid bin Walid and his army, may Allah be pleased with them, suffered a defeat during a battle as they were greatly outnumbered and virtually surrounded from all sides. They were forced to retreat and headed to the border of Syria. 
During the battle many Muslims were killed, including Khalid's son, may Allah be pleased with them. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, pages 619 to 620. It is important for Muslims to understand that Allah, the Exalted, does not demand Muslims to overcome the difficulties which the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and his companions, may Allah be pleased with them, endured. For example, they migrated from Mecca to Medina, whereby they left behind their families, homes, businesses, and migrated to a strange land all for the sake of Allah, the Exalted. In comparison, the difficulties Muslims face now are not as difficult as those the righteous predecessors faced. Muslims should therefore be grateful that they are only required to make a few small sacrifices, such as sacrificing some sleep to offer the obligatory dawn prayer and some wealth to donate the obligatory charity. Allah, the Exalted, is not commanding them to leave their homes and families for His sake. This gratitude must be shown practically by using the blessings one possesses in ways pleasing to Allah, the Exalted. In addition, when a Muslim faces difficulties, they should remember the difficulties the righteous predecessors faced and how they overcame them through steadfast obedience to Allah, the Exalted, which involves fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions and facing destiny with patience. This knowledge can provide a Muslim the strength to overcome their difficulties, as they know the righteous predecessors were more beloved to Allah, the Exalted, yet they endured more severe difficulties with patience. In fact, a hadith found in Sunan ibn Majah, number 4023, advises that the holy prophets, peace be upon them, endured the most difficult of tests, and they are undoubtedly the most beloved to Allah, the Exalted. If a Muslim follows the steadfast attitude of the righteous predecessors, it is hoped they will end up with them in the hereafter. The Company of Allah, the Exalted During the expedition to Syria, the leaders of the Muslim armies requested reinforcements from Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, as the Roman armies were both vast in number and strong in battle. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, wrote back to them, informing them that he would send them reinforcements, but reminded them that the Muslim soldiers were superior to others as they fought for the sake of Allah, the Exalted, and therefore even if they were outnumbered, an unbreakable support was with them namely, Allah, the Exalted. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, pages 649 to 651. In a long divine hadith found in Sahih Bukhari, number 7405, Allah, the Exalted, advises that he is with anyone who remembers him. With the rise of mental problems and disorders, such as depression, it is vital for Muslims to understand the importance of this declaration. There is a small chance of a person experiencing a mental issue when they are constantly surrounded and aided by someone that truly loves them. If this is true for a person, it is undoubtedly more befitting for Allah, the Exalted, who has promised to be with the one who remembers him. Acting on this declaration alone would eliminate all mental issues, such as depression. It is the reason why being secluded from others or being amongst others did not affect the mental state of the righteous predecessors, as they were always in the company of Allah, the Exalted. It is obvious that when one obtains the company of Allah, the Exalted, they will overcome all obstacles and difficulties successfully until they reach His proximity in the hereafter. In addition, out of His infinite mercy Allah, the Exalted, has not restricted this declaration in any way. For example, He did not declare He was only with the righteous or with those who perform specific good deeds. He in fact encompassed every Muslim irrespective of the strength of their faith or how many sins they have committed. So a Muslim should never lose hope in the mercy of Allah, the Exalted. But it is important to note the condition mentioned in this hadith, namely, to remember Allah, the Exalted. This is not only remembering Him with one's tongue, but more importantly, it is to remember Him through one's actions. This is only achieved by fulfilling the commands of Allah, the Exalted, refraining from His prohibitions and by facing destiny with patience. This is the true remembrance of Allah, the Exalted. The one who behaves in such a manner will be blessed with the company and support of Allah, the Exalted.
Simply put, the more one obeys Allah, the exalted, the more they will receive his company. What one gives is what they shall receive. Gaining reward. During the expedition to Syria, the Muslim armies needed reinforcements as they were heavily outnumbered. As a result, Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, asked for volunteers to join them, and a large army was formed under the leadership of Hashim ibn Akbar ibn Abu Waqas, may Allah be pleased with him. When departing his uncle, the senior companion, Sa'd ibn Abi Waqas, may Allah be pleased with him, reminded him to proceed and fight only for the sake of Allah, the exalted, and not for any worldly motive. He added, that a person will only take a truthful step and a good deed they perform for the sake of Allah, the exalted, with them, when they depart from this world. Hashim, may Allah be pleased with him, replied that he would strive to live up to this advice, and commented that he would undoubtedly be a loser if he acted for the sake of people, instead of for the sake of Allah, the exalted. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr, as Siddiq, pages 653 to 655. In a hadith found in Jami at Termidi, number 3154, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned that those who perform deeds for the sake of people, such as showing off, instead of doing them for the pleasure of Allah, the exalted, will be told to gain their reward on judgment day, from the people they acted for, which in reality is not possible to do. It is important to understand that the foundation of all deeds and even Islam itself is one's intention. It is the very thing which Allah, the Exalted, judges people on according to a hadith found in Sahih Bukhari, number one. A Muslim should ensure they perform all religious and useful worldly actions for the sake of Allah, the Exalted, so that they gain reward from Him in both worlds. A sign of this correct mentality is that this person neither expects nor desires people to appreciate or show gratitude to them for the deeds they perform. If one desires this, then it indicates their incorrect intention. In addition, acting with the correct intention prevents sadness and bitterness, as the one who ACTS for the sake of people will eventually encounter ungrateful people who will make them annoyed and bitter as they feel they wasted their effort and time. Unfortunately, this is seen in parents and relatives, as they often fulfill their duties towards their children and relatives, for their sake, instead of for the pleasure of Allah, the Exalted. But the one who ACTS for the sake of Allah, the Exalted, will fulfill all their duties towards others, such as their children, and never become bitter or enraged when they fail to show gratitude towards them. This attitude leads to peace of mind and general happiness, as they know Allah, the Exalted, is fully aware of their righteous deed and will reward them for it. This is the way all Muslims must act, otherwise they may well be left empty-handed on the Day of Judgment. Keeping Blessings During the expedition to Syria, the Muslim armies needed reinforcements as they were heavily outnumbered. As a result, Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, asked for volunteers to join them, and a large army was formed under the leadership of Sa'id ibn Amir ibn Hudhaim, may Allah be pleased with him. Bilal, the original caller for the prayers, requested Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with them, for permission to leave with this army. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, was reluctant to let him go because of the great love he possessed for him, but nonetheless, he gave him permission. Before departing Abu Bakr, advised Bilal, may Allah be pleased with them, to always perform good deeds as they would be his sustenance in this world and lead to a good reward after his death. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, pages 655 to 656. Good deeds involves using the blessings one has been granted in ways pleasing to Allah, the exalted. The one who does them will not only find peace and success in this world, but they will also take these worldly blessings with them to the hereafter in the form of everlasting reward. But those who misuse their blessings will not gain peace in this world, and these worldly blessings will abandon them when they reach their grave. In a hadith found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6442, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advise that a person's true wealth is what they send ahead to the hereafter whereas what they leave behind is in reality the wealth of their inheritors. It is important for Muslims to send as many blessings, such as their wealth, 
as they can to the hereafter by using them in ways which are pleasing to Allah, the Exalted. This includes spending on one's needs and the needs of their dependents without being wasteful, excessive or extravagant. This has been advised in a hadith found in Sahih Bukhari, number 4006. But if a Muslim does not use their blessings correctly, they will become a burden for them in both worlds. And if they hoard them and leave them behind for their inheritors, then they will be held accountable for obtaining them, even though others will enjoy them after they depart. This has been indicated in a hadith found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2379. In addition, if their inheritors use the blessings correctly, then they will obtain reward from Allah, the Exalted, while the one who collected it will be left empty-handed on Judgment Day. Or their inheritor will misuse the blessings, which will become a great regret for both the one who earned the blessing and their inheritor, especially if they did not teach their inheritor, such as their child, how to correctly use the blessings, as this is a duty on them. This is confirmed in a hadith found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 2928. Muslims should therefore fulfill their responsibilities towards Allah, the Exalted, and people, and ensure they take the rest of their blessings with them to the hereafter by using them correctly as prescribed by Islam. Otherwise, they will be left empty-handed and full of regrets on Judgment Day. Being lenient. Many Muslims were entering Medina in order to enlist and join the expedition to Syria. Many of these Muslims did not possess much knowledge about Islamic manners and etiquettes, and as a result, they would often unintentionally offend the residents of Medina. Some of these residents complained to Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, who publicly urged them to remain patient and lenient towards the foreign Muslims, as their intention was to serve Islam and please Allah, the Exalted. The residents of Medina accepted his plea and showed the best of manners towards their foreign Muslim brothers. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, pages 656 to 657. In a hadith found in Jami at Termidi, number 2701, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that Allah, the Exalted, loves gentleness in all matters. This is an important characteristic which must be adopted by all Muslims. It should be used in all aspects of one's life. It is important to understand that being gentle benefits the Muslim themselves more than anyone else. Not only will they receive blessings and reward from Allah, the Exalted, and minimize the amount of sins they commit, as a gentle person is less likely to commit sins through their speech and actions, but it benefits them in worldly affairs also. For example, the person who treats their spouse gently will gain more love and respect in return than if they treated their spouse in a harsh manner. Children are more likely to obey and treat their parents with respect when they are treated gently. Colleagues at work are more likely to help the one who is gentle with them. The examples are endless. Only in very rare cases is a harsh attitude required. In most cases, gentle behavior will be much more effective than a harsh attitude. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, possesses countless good qualities yet, Allah, the Exalted, specifically highlighted his gentleness in the Holy Quran as it is a key ingredient required to affect others in a positive way. Chapter 3 Al-Imran, verse 159 So by mercy from Allah you were lenient with them. And if you had been rude in speech and harsh in heart, they would have disbanded from about you. A Muslim must remember that they will never be better than a holy prophet. Peace be upon them. Nor will the person they interact with be worse than Pharaoh yet. Allah, the Exalted, commanded the holy prophet Mosa and the holy prophet Harun, peace be upon them, to deal with Pharaoh in a kind manner. Chapter 20 Taha, verse 44 and speak to him with gentle speech that perhaps he may be reminded or fear Allah. Therefore, a Muslim should adopt gentleness in all affairs as it leads to much reward and affects others, such as one's family, in a positive way. United in Islam During the expedition to Syria, the leaders of the Muslim armies decided, with the permission of Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, to retreat to the land of Yarmouk, which was close to the border of the Roman Empire. 
Abu Bakr decided to appoint Khalid bin Walid, may Allah be pleased with them, as the leader of all the armies. He wrote a letter to the leaders informing them of his decision, but also went out of his way to highlight their noble characteristics, so that they would not feel alienated over the appointment of Khalid, may Allah be pleased with him. Khalid, may Allah be pleased with him, did the same as he did not want any negative feelings between him and his Muslim brothers. But as these leaders were noble companions, may Allah be pleased with them, who only sought the pleasure of Allah, the Exalted, they welcomed his leadership with open arms. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, pages 661 to 664. They behaved in this manner as they were united for the pleasure of Allah, the Exalted, and not worldly reasons. With the passing of time, people often become divided and lose the strong connection they once had with one another. There are many causes of this, but a major cause is the foundation on which their connection was formed by their parents and relatives. It is commonly known that when the foundation of a building is weak, the building will either get damaged over time or even collapse. Similarly, when the foundation of bonds connecting people are not correct, the bonds between them will eventually weaken or even break. When the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, brought the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, together he formed the bonds between them for the sake of Allah, the Exalted. Whereas, most Muslims today bring people together for the sake of tribalism, brotherhood, and to show off to other families. Even though the majority of the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, were not related, but as the foundation of the bonds connecting them was correct namely, for the sake of Allah, the Exalted, their bonds grew from strength to strength. Whereas, many Muslims nowadays are related by blood yet, with the passing of time, become separated, as the foundation of their bonds was based on falsehood namely, tribalism and similar things. Muslims must understand that if desire for their bonds to endure and to earn reward for fulfilling the important duty of upholding the ties of kinship and the rights of non-relatives, then they must only forge bonds for the sake of Allah, the Exalted. The foundation of this is that people only connect with one another and act together in a way which is pleasing to Allah, the Exalted. This has been commanded in the Holy Quran. Chapter 5 al maidah verse 2 And cooperate in righteousness and piety, but do not cooperate in sin and aggression. Practicing Faith After Khalid bin Walid, may Allah be pleased with him, aided one of the Muslim armies which were struggling to retreat to the land of Yarmouk, all the Muslims eventually reached Yarmouk where they set up camp. The Roman army, which was nearly six times larger than the Muslim army, also set up camp at Yarmouk. Each Muslim deputy, in charge of a unit of soldiers, gave sermons encouraging the Muslims to remain steadfast against the enemy. All of them highlighted the importance of practicing one's faith through actions, in this case fighting in the path of Allah, the Exalted. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, pages 669 to 671. This indicates the importance of differentiating between wishful thinking and hope in Allah, the Exalted. Wishful thinking prevents one from practically obeying Allah, the Exalted, whereas the essence of hoping in Allah, the Exalted, is his sincere obedience. Even though there is no doubt that the mercy of Allah, the Exalted, is infinite and can overcome all sins. And giving up hope in the infinite mercy of Allah, the Exalted, is defined as unbelief in chapter 12 Yusuf, verse 87. Indeed, no one despairs of relief from Allah except the disbelieving people. Yet, nonetheless it is extremely important for Muslims to understand a fact. Namely, a Muslim has not been guaranteed to leave this world with their faith meaning, a Muslim is in danger of dying as a non-Muslim. This is the greatest loss. If this happens, it does not take a scholar to conclude where this person will reside in the hereafter. This can occur when a Muslim persists on sins especially, major sins, such as drinking alcohol and failing to offer their obligatory prayers and reaches their end without sincerely repenting from their sins. 
This is the reason why Muslims must sincerely repent from all their sins and strive to fulfill all their obligatory duties, as this is a task they can undoubtedly fulfill. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 286 Allah does not charge a soul except with that within its capacity. They should not be fooled into believing they possess hope in the mercy of Allah, the Exalted. As true hope in the mercy of Allah, the Exalted, is supported by obedience to Allah, the Exalted, through actions. This involves fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions and facing destiny with patience. Failing to do this and then expecting the mercy and forgiveness of Allah, the Exalted, is not hope in His mercy, it is merely wishful thinking which has no weight or significance. This has been clearly warned by the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2459. Coming with Sincerity Before the Battle of Yamo commenced, one of the Roman commanders, Jarjar, requested to meet Khalid bin Walid, may Allah be pleased with him, in the open battlefield for a conversation. He questioned Khalid, may Allah be pleased with him, about some teachings of Islam that he was unsure about. After hearing some basic things, such as the importance of equality, he decided to return to the Muslim camp with Khalid, may Allah be pleased with him, and accepted Islam. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, pages 675 to 677. Jarjar did not ask about complicated or deep spiritual issues which amazed him, nor was he shown any miracle to convince him of the truthfulness of Islam. Yet he submitted to the truth and completely changed his belief, behavior and way of life. This is because he came seeking the truth with sincerity. When one adopts sincerity by declaring that they will accept the truth and follow it to the best of their ability, even if it contradicts their desires, then even the simplest of truths, the truths overlooked by others, will completely change them. Whereas, the one who comes to Allah, the Exalted, with a cherry-picking attitude and only accepts and follows the things which please them and ignores the things which challenge their desires, will never correctly submit to the truth, even if they are Muslim. It is because of this sincerity that many people in history accepted Islam after encountering the simplest of things and not through deep spiritual experiences. It is this sincerity Muslims must strive to adopt as following Islam correctly cannot be achieved without it. Feeling for others During the Battle of Yarmouk, one of the leaders of the Muslim army, Ikramah ibn Abu Jahl, may Allah be pleased with him, and many of his soldiers were fatally wounded. While lying on the battlefield, they were offered drinking water, but instead of drinking themselves, they would command the water carrier to give it to others first. As a result, many of them died without tasting any water. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, pages 678 to 679. This was the deep level of sincerity they possessed for each other. In a narration found in Sahih Muslim number 196, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that Islam is sincerity towards the general public. This includes desiring the best for them at all times and showing this through one's words and actions. It includes advising others to do good, forbidding them from evil, to be merciful and kind to others at all times. This can be summed up by a single narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 170. It warns that one cannot be a true believer until they love for others what they desire for themselves. Being sincere to people is so important that according to the narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 57, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, placed this duty next to establishing the obligatory prayer and donating the obligatory charity. From this narration alone, one can understand its importance as it has been placed with two vital obligatory duties. It is a part of sincerity towards people, that one is pleased when they are happy and sad, whenever they are grieved, as long as their attitude does not contradict the teachings of Islam. A high level of sincerity includes one going to extreme limits to make the lives of others better, even if this puts themselves in difficulty. For example, 
one may sacrifice purchasing certain things in order to donate the wealth to the needy. Desiring and striving to always unite people on good is a part of sincerity towards others. Whereas, dividing others is a characteristic of the devil. Chapter 17 Al-Isra, verse 53 Satan certainly seeks to sow discord among them. One way of uniting people is to veil the faults of others and advise them privately against sins. The one who ACTS in this way will have their sins veiled by Allah, the Exalted. This is confirmed in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1426. Whenever possible, one should advise and teach the aspects of religion and the important aspects of the world to others so that both their worldly and religious lives improve. A proof of one's sincerity to others is that they support them in their absence for example, from the slander of others. Turning away from others and only worrying about oneself is not the attitude of a Muslim. In fact, this is how most animals behave. Even if one cannot change the whole society, they can still be sincere in helping those in their life, such as their relatives and friends. Simply put, one must treat others how they desire people to treat them. Chapter 28 al Qasas, verse 77 And do good as Allah has done good to you. An honest reply. After some intense fighting, the Battle of Yarmouk ended with a clear victory for the Muslims. When Herakl, the Roman king, heard the news he was both angry and sad. He interrogated his leaders on how this defeat was possible when their army was around six times larger than the Muslim army. Only one elderly leader had the courage to give an honest reply, which has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, pages 685 to 686. The elderly leader replied that they were defeated because the Muslims stood up at night to pray to Allah, the Exalted. In a divine narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 1145, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that Allah, the Exalted, descends every night to the nearest heaven according to his infinite majesty and invites people to ask him to fulfill their needs so that he can fulfill them. Voluntary nighttime worship proves one's sincerity towards Allah, the Exalted, as no other eyes are watching them. Offering it is a means to having an intimate conversation with Allah, the Exalted. And it is a sign of one's servanthood to Him. It has countless virtues, for example, a narration found in Sunan and Nasai, number 1614, declares that it is the best voluntary prayer. No one will have a rank higher on Judgment Day or in Paradise than the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and this rank has been directly connected to the voluntary night prayer. This shows that those who establish the night voluntary prayer will be blessed with the highest ranks in both worlds. Chapter 17 Al-Isra, verse 79 And from part of the night, pray with it, i.e. recitation of the Quran as additional worship for you, it is expected that your Lord will resurrect you to a praise station. A narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 3579, advises that a Muslim is closest to Allah, the Exalted, in the last part of the night. Therefore, one can derive countless blessings if they remember Allah, the Exalted, at this time. All Muslims desire their supplications to be answered and their needs to be fulfilled. Therefore, they should strive to offer the voluntary night prayer as a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 1770, advises that there is a special hour in every night when good supplications are always answered. Establishing the voluntary night prayer is an excellent way to prevent one from committing sins, it helps a person to stay away from pointless social gatherings, and it protects a person from many physical illnesses. This has been advised in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 3549. One should prepare for the voluntary night prayer by not overeating or drinking especially before bed as it induces laziness. One should not unnecessarily tire themselves out during the day. A short nap during the day can help with this. Finally, one should avoid sins and strive to obey Allah, the Exalted, 
by fulfilling his commands, refraining from his prohibitions, and by facing destiny with patience as the obedient find it easier to offer the voluntary night prayer. The elderly leader also added that they were defeated because the Muslims fasted during the day. In a divine narration found in Sunan an nasr number 2219, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advise that all righteous deeds people perform are for themselves except for fasting as this is for Allah the exalted and he shall reward it directly this narration indicates the uniqueness of fasting one of the reasons it is described in this manner is because all other righteous deeds are visible to people such as the prayer or they are between people such as secret charity whereas fasting is a unique righteous deed as others cannot know someone is fasting by only observing them in addition, fasting is a righteous deed which puts a lock on every aspect of oneself. Meaning, a person who fasts correctly will be prevented from committing verbal and physical sins, such as looking at and hearing unlawful things. This is also achieved through the prayer, but the prayer is only performed for a short time and is visible to others whereas, fasting occurs throughout the day and is invisible to others. Chapter 29 al ankaba verse 45 Indeed, prayer prohibits immorality and wrongdoing. It is clear from the following verse a person who does not complete the obligatory fasts without a valid reason will not be a true believer, as the two have been directly connected. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 183 O you who have believed, decreed upon you is fasting as it was decreed upon those before you that you may become righteous. In fact, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has warned in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 723, that if a Muslim does not complete a single obligatory fast without a valid reason, they cannot make up for the reward and blessings lost even if they fasted every day for their entire life. In addition, as indicated by the verse quoted earlier, fasting correctly leads to piety. Meaning, simply starving during the day does not lead to piety but paying extra attention to abstaining from sins and performing righteous deeds during the fast will lead to piety. It is why a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 707, warns that a fast will not be significant if one does not abstain from speaking and acting on falsehood. A similar narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 1690, warns that some fasting people obtain nothing except hunger. When one becomes more aware and careful in obeying Allah, the exalted, while they are fasting this habit will eventually affect them, so they behave in a similar way even when they are not fasting. This is in fact true piety. The righteousness mentioned in the verse quoted earlier is connected to fasting as fasting reduces one's evil desires and passions. It prevents pride and the encouragement of sins. This is because fasting hinders the appetite of the stomach and one's carnal desires. These two things lead to many sins. In addition, the desire for these two things is greater than the desire for other unlawful things. So whoever controls them through fasting will find it easier to control the weaker evil desires. This leads to true righteousness. As briefly indicated earlier, there are different levels of fasting. The first and lowest level of fasting is when one abstains from the things which will break their fast, such as food. The next level is abstaining from sins which damages one's fast, thereby reducing the reward of their fast, such as lying. This has been indicated in a narration found in Sunan and Nasai, number 2235. Fasting which involves each member of the body is the next level. This is when each body part fasts from sins for example, the eyes from looking at the unlawful, the ears from listening to the unlawful, and so on. The next level is when one behaves in this manner, even when they are not fasting. Finally, the highest level of fasting is abstaining from all things which are not connected to Allah, the exalted. A Muslim should also fast inwardly as their body fasts outwardly by abstaining from sinful or vain thoughts. They should fast from persisting on their own plans in respect to their desires and try to concentrate on fulfilling their duties and responsibilities. In addition, 
They should fast from inwardly challenging the decree of Allah, the Exalted, and instead accept destiny and whatever it brings, knowing Allah, the Exalted, only chooses the best for His servants, even if they do not understand the wisdom behind these choices. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 216 But perhaps you hate a thing and it is good for you, and perhaps you love a thing and it is bad for you. And Allah knows while you know not. Finally, a Muslim should aim for the highest reward by keeping their fast a secret and not informing others if it is avoidable, as informing others unnecessarily leads to a loss of reward as it is an aspect of showing off. The elderly leader also added that they were defeated because the Muslims fulfilled their promises. In a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 2749, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned that breaking promises is an aspect of hypocrisy. The greatest of promises a Muslim has made is with Allah, the Exalted, which is to obey him sincerely. This involves fulfilling his commands, refraining from his prohibitions and facing destiny with patience. All other promises made with people must also be kept unless one has a valid excuse especially, the ones a parent makes with children. Breaking promises only teaches children bad character and encourages them to believe being deceitful is an acceptable characteristic to possess. In a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 2227, Allah, the Exalted, declares that he will be against the one who makes a promise in his name and then breaks it without a valid excuse. How can the one who has Allah, the Exalted, against them on Judgment Day, possibly succeed? The elderly leader also added that they were defeated because the Muslims command good and forbid evil. In a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 2686, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned that failing to fulfill the important duty of commanding good and forbidding evil can be understood with the example of a boat with two levels full of people. The people on the lower level keep disturbing the people on the upper level whenever they desire to access water. So they decide to drill a hole in the lower level so that they can access water directly. If the people on the upper level fail to stop them, they will all surely drown. It is important for Muslims to never give up commanding good and forbidding evil according to their knowledge in a gentle way. A Muslim should never believe that as long as they obey Allah, the exalted, other misguided people will not be able to affect them in a negative way. A good apple will eventually get affected when placed with rotten apples. Similarly, the Muslim who fails to command others to do good will eventually be affected by their negative behavior, whether it is subtle or apparent. Even if the wider society has become heedless, one should never give up advising their dependents, such as their family, as not only will their negative behavior affect them more, but this is a duty on all Muslims, according to a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 2928. Even if a Muslim is ignored by others, they should discharge their duty by persistently advising them in a gentle way, which is supported by strong evidence and knowledge. Only in this way will they be protected from their negative effects and pardoned on the Day of Judgment. But if they only care about themselves and ignore the actions of others, it is feared that the negative effects of others may well lead to their eventual misguidance. The elderly leader also added that they were defeated because the Muslims upheld justice. In a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 4721, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advise that those who acted with justice will be sitting on thrones of light close to Allah, the Exalted, on Judgment Day. This includes those who are just in their decisions, in respect to their families and those under their care and authority. It is important for Muslims to always act with justice in all occasions. One must show justice to Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions and by facing destiny with patience. They must use all the blessings they have been granted in the correct way according to the teachings of Islam. This includes being just to their own body and mind by fulfilling their rights of food and rest, as well as using each limb according to its true purpose. 
Islam does not teach Muslims to push their body and minds beyond their limits, thereby causing them self-harm. One should be just in respect to people, by treating them how they wish to be treated by others. They should never compromise on the teachings of Islam, by committing injustice to people, in order to obtain worldly things. This will be a major cause of people entering hell, which has been indicated in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6579. They should remain just even if it contradicts their desires and the desires of their loved ones. Chapter 4 and Nisa, verse 135. O you who have believed, be persistently standing firm in justice, witnesses for Allah, even if it be against yourselves or parents and relatives. Whether one is rich or poor, Allah is more worthy of both. Point one, so follow not personal inclination, lest you not be just. One must be just towards their dependents, by fulfilling their rights and necessities, according to the teachings of Islam, which has been advised in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 2928. They should not be neglected, nor handed over to others such as school and mosque teachers. A person should not take on this responsibility, if they are too lazy to act with justice in regards to them. To conclude, no person is free of acting with justice, as the minimum is acting with justice in respect to Allah, the exalted, and oneself. The elderly leader also added that they were defeated because the Muslims stood up at night to pray to Allah, the exalted. They fasted during the day, they fulfilled their promises, they commanded good and forbade evil, and upheld justice. Whereas the Romans drank alcohol, while knowing it is sinful. In a narration found in Sunan ibn Majah, number 3371, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned that a Muslim must never consume alcohol, as it is the key to all evil. Unfortunately, this major sin has increased amongst the Muslims over time. This is the key to all evil, as it gives rise to other sins. This is quite obvious, as a drunk loses control over their tongue and physical actions. One only needs to look at the news, to observe how much crime is committed due to drinking alcohol. Even those who drink moderately only cause damage to their bodies, which science has proven. The physical and mental diseases associated with alcohol are numerous, and cause a heavy burden on the National Health Service and the taxpayers. It is the key to all evil, as it negatively affects all three aspects of a person, namely, their body, mind and soul. Chapter 5 al maida verse 90 O you who have believed indeed intoxicants, gambling, sacrificing on stone altars to other than Allah, and divining arrows are but defilement from the work of Satan, so avoid it that you may be successful. The fact that drinking alcohol has been placed next to things which are associated with polytheism in this verse highlights how important it is to avoid. It is such a serious sin that the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned in a narration found in Sunan ibn Majah, number 3376, that the one who drinks alcohol regularly will not enter paradise. Spreading the Islamic greeting of peace is a key to obtaining paradise, according to a narration found in Sunan ibn Majah, number 68. Yet, a narration found in Imam Bukhari's Adab al-Mufrat, number 1017, advises Muslims not to greet someone who regularly drinks alcohol. Alcohol is a unique major sin, as it has been cursed from ten different angles in a single narration found in Sunan ibn Majah, number 3380. This includes the alcohol itself, the one who produces it, the one it is produced for, the one who sells it, the one who buys it, the one who carries it, the one to whom it is carried to, the one who uses the wealth obtained through selling it, the one who drinks it and the one who pours it. The one who deals with something that has been cursed like this will not obtain true success, unless they sincerely repent. The elderly leader also added that they were defeated because the Muslims stood up at night to pray to Allah, the exalted. They fasted during the day, they fulfilled their promises, they commanded good and forbade evil, and upheld justice. Whereas, the Romans took part in unlawful relationships. This is connected to chapter 25 al-Furqan, verse 68. 
and do not commit unlawful sexual intercourse. And whoever should do that will meet a penalty. The true servants of Allah, the exalted, avoid all forms of illegal relationships. The fact that adultery has been placed next to polytheism and killing an innocent person in this verse indicates its severity. Muslims should take precautions in order to avoid being tempted into illegal relationships. Firstly, they should learn to lower their gaze. This does not mean one should always stare at their shoes, but it means they should avoid looking around unnecessary, especially in public places. They should avoid staring at others and maintain respect for the opposite gender. Just like a Muslim would not like someone staring at their sister or daughter, they should not stare at other people's sisters and daughters. Chapter 24 and Nur, verse 30. Tell the believing men to reduce some of their vision one and guard their private parts. That is purer for them. Whenever possible, a Muslim should avoid spending time alone with the opposite gender unless they are related in a way which prohibits marriage. This has been advised by the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 1862. Muslims should dress and behave with modesty. Dressing modestly avoids attracting the glances of strangers, and behaving modestly prevents one from taking the initial steps which could lead to an illegal relationship, such as talking unnecessarily to the opposite gender. Understanding the blessings of avoiding illegal relationships is another way to protect oneself from them. For example, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has guaranteed paradise to the one who safeguards their tongue and chastity. This is confirmed in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2408. Fearing the punishment of being involved in illegal relationships will also aid a Muslim to avoid them. For example, faith will depart from the person who is committing fornication. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4690. In reality, a Muslim does not need illegal relationships as Islam prescribes marriage. Those who cannot afford to marry should fast often as this also helps to control one's desires and actions. This has been advised in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 3398. The elderly leader also added that they were defeated because the Muslims stood up at night to pray to Allah, the Exalted. They fasted during the day, they fulfilled their promises, they commanded good and forbade evil, and upheld justice. Whereas, the Romans broke their promises and openly oppressed others, in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6579, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned that the bankrupt Muslim is the one who accumulates many righteous deeds, such as fasting and prayer. But as they mistreated people, their good deeds will be given to their victims, and if necessary, their victims' sins will be given to them on Judgment Day. This will lead to them being hurled into hell. It is important to understand that a Muslim must fulfill two aspects of faith in order to achieve success. The first are the duties in respect to Allah, the Exalted, such as the obligatory prayer. The second aspect is in respect to people, which includes treating them kindly. In fact, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has declared in a narration found in Sunan an nasai number 4998 that a person cannot be a true believer until they keep their physical and verbal harm away from the life and possessions of others. It is important to understand that Allah, the Exalted, is infinitely forgiving meaning. He will forgive those who sincerely repent to Him. But He will not forgive the sins which involve other people until the victim forgives first. As people are not so forgiving a Muslim should be fearful that those who they have wronged will exact revenge on them by taking away their precious good deeds on Judgment Day. Even if a Muslim fulfills the rights of Allah, the Exalted, they may still end up in hell simply because they have wronged others. It is therefore important for Muslims to strive to fulfill both aspects of their duties in order to obtain success in both worlds.
The elderly leader also added that they were defeated because the Muslims stood up at night to pray to Allah, the Exalted. They fasted during the day, they fulfilled their promises, they commanded good and forbade evil, and upheld justice. Whereas, the Romans commanded evil and forbade what pleases Allah, the Exalted. A part of hypocrisy is that a person not only commits evil deeds themselves and abstains from righteous deeds, but they encourage others to do the same. They want others to be in the same boat as them, so that they find some comfort in their evil character. They not only drown themselves but take others down with them. Muslims must know that a person will be held accountable for every other person who commits a sin because of their invitation. This person will be treated as if they committed the sin, even though they only invited others towards it. This has been confirmed in a narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 203. This is why some have said that blessed is the person whose evil dies with them, because their sins will increase if others act on their evil advice, even though they are no longer alive. The elderly leader also added that they were defeated because the Muslims stood up at night to pray to Allah, the Exalted. They fasted during the day, they fulfilled their promises, they commanded good and forbade evil, and upheld justice. Whereas, the Romans spread corruption on the earth. Corruption is when a person abuses the blessings they possess, especially their social influence, in order to gain worldly things, such as power and wealth. It affects a Muslim's duties towards Allah, the Exalted, and leads to much sins against people, such as oppression. A narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 4019, warns that when the general public cheats each other financially, Allah, the Exalted, punishes them by appointing oppressive leaders over them. One aspect of this oppression is corruption which causes the general public great distress. The same narration warns that when the general public break their covenant of sincere obedience to Allah, the Exalted, then they will be overpowered by their enemies who will illegally confiscate their wealth and property from them. Again, this is an aspect of corruption where people of influence, such as government officials, freely take the belongings of others without any fear of the consequences. When the general public becomes corrupt, then their leaders and other people in influential social positions are inspired to act in the same way, believing this behavior is accepted by the general public. This leads to corruption on a national level. But if the general public obeyed Allah, the Exalted, and avoided mistreating others through corruption, then their leaders and those in an influential social position would not dare act in a corrupt way, full well, knowing the general public would not stand for it. And according to the narration quoted earlier, if the general public remain obedient to Allah, the Exalted, he would protect them from corrupt officials by appointing people into influential positions who are just in their affairs. Instead of taking the immature path of blaming others for the widespread corruption observed in the world, Muslims should truly reflect on their own behavior and if necessary, adjust their attitude. Otherwise, corruption in society will only increase with the passing of time. No one should believe that as they are not in an influential social position, they have no effect on the corruption which occurs in society. As proven by this discussion, corruption occurs because of the negative behavior of the general public, and it therefore can only be removed by the good behavior of the general public. Chapter 13 Arad, verse 11 Indeed, Allah will not change the condition of a people until they change what is in themselves. The elderly leader also added that they were defeated because the Muslims stood up at night to pray to Allah, the Exalted. They fasted during the day, they fulfilled their promises, they commanded good and forbade evil, and upheld justice. Whereas, the Romans drank alcohol, took part in illegal relationships, broke their promises, oppressed others, commanded evil and forbade what pleases Allah, the Exalted, and spread corruption on earth. After hearing this reply, Harakal, the Roman king, confirmed that he had spoken the truth. A final point to understand is that none of these characteristics are linked to warfare, yet they were listed as the reasons for the Muslim victory and Roman defeat. This indicates that a person's day-to-day -day activities influences their success and peace in all aspects of their life.
Meaning, a Muslim cannot only behave as a Muslim during the prayers, which takes less than an hour of a day to complete. They must instead practice on the teachings of Islam with every breath. Otherwise, they will not achieve success and peace in all aspects of their life. This reality is obvious if one turns the pages of history, obvious, yet so overlooked by Muslims today. Strictly following the truth. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, was extremely strict with his leaders and soldiers, thereby ensuring they did not cross the limits of Islam, even if their actions appeared justified. He achieved this by commanding all to adhere strictly to the teachings of the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. For example, once a messenger sent by one of his leaders brought with him the severed head of one of the leaders of the Romans. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, became enraged with this action and when he was told that this was how the Romans treated the Muslims during war, he rebuked them by asking them that should he follow the customary practices of the Romans and Persians, thereby abandoning the teachings of Islam. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, page 692. Muslims should not follow and adopt the customary practices of non-Muslims. The more Muslims do this, the less they will follow the teachings of the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. This is quite evident in this day and age, as many Muslims have adopted the cultural practices of other nations, which has caused them to become distant from the teachings of Islam. For example, one only needs to observe the modern Muslim wedding, to observe how many non-Muslim cultural practices have been adopted by Muslims. What makes this worse is that many Muslims cannot differentiate between Islamic practices based on the Holy Quran and traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and the cultural practices of non-Muslims. Because of this non-Muslims cannot differentiate between them either, which has caused great problems for Islam. For example, Honor killings is a cultural practice which has nothing to do with Islam, yet because of the ignorance of Muslims and their habit of adopting non-Muslim cultural practices, Islam is blamed every time an honor killing occurs in society. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, removed the social barriers in the form of castes and brotherhoods in order to unite people, yet ignorant Muslims have resurrected them by adopting the cultural practices of non-Muslims. Simply put, the more cultural practices Muslims adopt, the less they will act on the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. The Power of Allah, the Exalted One of the major reasons why the Muslims fought so hard in the face of impossible circumstances and succeeded was due to their knowledge of the supreme power and will of Allah, the Exalted. They understood that their deaths were decreed for a specific and unchangeable time, Therefore fighting or fleeing would not change this. Whatever they were destined to encounter would occur even if they remained hidden in their homes. So it did not make sense to shy away from striving in the cause of Allah, the Exalted, and His obedience. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, indicated the infinite and absolute power and authority of Allah, the Exalted, in a narration found in Jami at Termidi, number 2516. This narration advises that the entire creation cannot benefit a person if Allah, the Exalted, did not desire them to do so. Similarly, the entire creation together could not harm someone if Allah, the Exalted, did not desire them to. This means only what Allah, the Exalted, decides happens within the universe. It is important to note that this advice does not indicate one should abandon using means such as medicine, but it means that one can use the means as they have been created by none other than Allah, the Exalted. But they must understand that Allah, the Exalted, is the only one who decides the outcome of all things. For example, there are many sick people who take medicine and recover from their illness. But they are others who take medicine and do not recover. This indicates that another factor decides the end result namely, the will of Allah, the Exalted. Chapter 9 at Torba, verse 51. Say, never will we be struck except by what Allah has decreed for us. 
The one who understands this knows that anything that affected them could not have been avoided. And those things which missed them could never have been obtained. It is important to note that whatever the end result, even if it is against a person's desire, they should remain patient and truly believe Allah, the exalted, has chosen the best for them, even if they do not observe the wisdom behind the outcome. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 216 But perhaps you hate a thing and it is good for you, and perhaps you love a thing and it is bad for you. And Allah knows while you know not. When one truly understands this truth, they stop relying on the creation, knowing they cannot innately harm or benefit them. Instead, they turn to Allah, the exalted, seeking his support and protection through sincere obedience by fulfilling his commands, refraining from his prohibitions and by facing destiny with patience. This leads a Muslim to trusting in Allah, the exalted. It also encourages one to only fear Allah, the exalted, as they know the creation cannot harm them without the will of Allah, the exalted. Recognizing that all things which occur within one's life and the universe originate from Allah, the exalted, is a part of understanding the oneness of Allah, the exalted. This is a topic which has no end and goes beyond only superficially believing that there is none worthy of worship except Allah, the exalted. When this is fixed in one's heart, then they only hope in Allah, the exalted, knowing he is the only one who can help them. They will only submit and obey Allah, the exalted, in all aspects of their life. In reality, a person only obeys another in order to receive protection from harm or gain some benefit. Only Allah, the exalted, can grant this therefore, only he deserves to be obeyed and worshipped. If anyone chooses the obedience of another over the obedience of Allah, the exalted, this shows they believe that this other can bring them some sort of benefit or protect them from harm. This is a sign of the weakness of their faith. The source of all things which occur is Allah, the exalted, so Muslims should only obey him. Chapter 35 Fatih, verse 2 Whatever Allah grants to people of mercy, none can withhold it, and whatever he withholds none can release it thereafter. It is important to note that obeying a person which encourages the obedience of Allah, the exalted, in reality is obeying Allah, the exalted. For example, obeying the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Chapter 4 and Nisa, verse 80. He who obeys the Messenger has obeyed Allah. Perception. One of the major reasons why the Muslims fought so hard in the face of impossible circumstances and succeeded was due to their certainty of faith. Through gaining and acting on Islamic knowledge, they were able to perceive the superiority of the hereafter compared to this material world, and as a result they did not shy away from sincerely obeying Allah, the exalted, even if this meant certain death. They understood that sacrificing the moment in this world for the sake of eternity in the hereafter, and the drop of this world for the sake of the ocean of the hereafter, was the wise thing to do. It is important for Muslims to develop the correct perception so that they can increase their obedience to Allah, the Exalted, which involves fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions and facing destiny with patience. This is what the righteous predecessors possessed, and it encouraged them to avoid the excess luxuries of the material world and instead prepare for the hereafter. This is an important characteristic to possess and it can be explained with a worldly example. Two people are extremely thirsty and come across a cup of murky water. They both desire to drink it, even though it is not pure, and even if it means they have to argue over it. As their thirst grows the more focused on the cup of murky water, they become, to the point they lose focus on everything else. But if one of them shifted their focus and observed a river of pure water which was only a short distance ahead, they would immediately lose focus on the cup of water to the point they would no longer care about it and no longer argue over it. And instead they would endure their thirst patiently knowing a river of pure water is close. The person who is unaware of the river would probably believe the other person is crazy after observing their change in attitude. This is the case of the two types of people in this world. One group greedily focuses on the material world. 
The other group has shifted their focus to the hereafter and the pure and eternal blessings therein. When one shifts their focus to the bliss of the hereafter, worldly problems do not seem like such a big deal. Therefore, patience becomes easier to adopt. But if one keeps their focus on this world, then it will seem like everything to them. They will argue, fight, love and hate for it. Just like the person in the example mentioned earlier, who only focuses on the cup of murky water. This correct perception is only achieved through gaining and acting on Islamic knowledge found within the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. Chapter 41 Fasila, verse 53. We will show them our signs in the horizons and within themselves until it becomes clear to them that it is the truth. How to succeed? One of the major reasons Muslims were able to overthrow two of the greatest superpowers in history, the Romans and Persians, is linked to the behavior of these superpowers. The majority of their leaders and the common masses were drowned in injustice and sins, and the Roman Christians had abandoned the teachings of their divine scripture. When a society reaches this level of decadence, then it is only a matter of time before they are destroyed. History has painted this reality vividly for those who desire the truth. It is important for Muslims to understand a simple yet profound lesson, namely, they will never succeed in this world or the next in worldly or religious matters through the disobedience of Allah, the Exalted. Since the dawn of time to this age and till the end of time no person has ever achieved true success, nor will they ever through the disobedience of Allah, the Exalted. This is quite obvious when one turns the pages of history. Therefore, when a Muslim is in a situation which they desire to achieve a positive and successful outcome from, they should never choose to disobey Allah, the Exalted, irrespective of how tempting or easy it may seem to be. Even if one is advised by their close friends and relatives to do so, as there is no obedience to the creation if it means disobedience to the Creator. And in truth, they will never be able to protect them from Allah, the Exalted, and His punishment in either this world or the next. The same way Allah, the Exalted, grants success to those who obey Him, He removes a successful outcome from those who disobey Him, even if this removal takes time to witness. A Muslim should not be fooled, as this will occur sooner or later. The Holy Quran has made it extremely clear that an evil plan or action only encompasses the doer, even if this punishment is delayed. Chapter 35 Fatir, verse 43 But the evil plot does not encompass except its own people. Therefore, no matter how difficult the situation and choice, Muslims should always choose the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, in both worldly and religious matters, as this alone will lead to true success in both worlds, even if this success is not obvious immediately. Turning the Hearts It is important note that even though parts of the Islamic Empire increased through fighting yet, the goal was never to gain land or power, unlike all other empires in history. The aim was to give the people of foreign lands the opportunity to hear the teachings of Islam, which was being prevented by foreign powers, so that they could willingly either accept or reject Islam. As Islam is a faith which must be accepted by the heart, forcing people to accept Islam through the sword is simply not possible. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah verse 256 There shall be no compulsion in acceptance of the religion. The right course has become distinct from the wrong. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, commanded his leaders and soldiers to respect and fulfill the rights of the citizens of the newly conquered lands who chose to reject Islam. They gave the same rights to those who accepted Islam all Muslims are owed, even though they might have recently fought against the Muslims. By implementing the teachings of Islam, just and peaceful societies were formed, and through this many people accepted Islam, after witnessing its widespread benefits and truths. Whether people accepted Islam or not, the Muslims gained the loyalty of the citizens as they acted with justice. Dangers of Speech Umar ibn Khattab once came upon Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with them, while the latter was pulling his own tongue. Umar, may Allah be pleased him, implored him to stop to which he replied that his tongue had brought him to dangerous places. 
This has been discussed in a narration found in Imam Malik's Mawata, Book 56, Narration Number 12. In a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, Number 2501, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, declared that whoever is silent is saved. This means the one who is silent from vain or evil speech and only speaks good words will be saved by Allah, the Exalted, in both worlds. This is important to understand, as the main reason people will enter hell is because of their speech. This has been warned in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2616. In fact, it only takes a single evil word to cause a person to plunge into hell on Judgment Day, which has been confirmed in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2314. Speech can be of three types. The first is evil speech, which should be avoided at all costs. The second is vain speech, which only causes one to waste time, which will lead to a great regret on Judgment Day. In addition, the first step of sinful speech is often vain speech. So it is safer to avoid this type of speech. The final type is good speech, which should always be adopted. Based on these aspects, two thirds of speech should be removed from one's life. In addition, the one who speaks too much will only reflect on their actions and the hereafter a little, as this requires silence. This will prevent one from assessing their deeds, which inspires one to perform more righteous deeds and sincerely repent from their sins. This person will then be prevented from changing for the better. Finally, those who speak too much often discuss worldly things and things which are entertaining and fun. This will cause them to adopt a mentality, whereby they dislike discussing or listening to serious issues like death and the hereafter. This will prevent them from preparing adequately for the hereafter, which will lead to a great regret and a potential punishment. All of this can be avoided if one simply remains silent from sinful and vain speech and instead only speaks good words. Therefore, the one who is silent in this way will be saved from trouble in this world and from punishment in the next world. Honoring Neighbors Abu Bakr once passed by Abdur Rahman ibn Awf, may Allah be pleased with them, while the latter was arguing with his neighbor. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, told him not argue with his neighbor, as they will remain with a person after others leave them. This has been discussed in Imam Suyuti's Tariq al kulafa page 95. This indicates the importance of being kind to one's neighbor. In a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6014, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that he was encouraged to treat neighbors kindly to such an extent that he thought that a neighbor would become an heir of every Muslim. Unfortunately, this duty is often neglected, even though treating one's neighbors kindly is an important aspect of Islam. First of all, it is important to note that a person's neighbor in Islam includes all those people who are living within 40 houses in each direction to a Muslim's home. This is confirmed in a narration found in Imam Bukhari's Adab al-Mufrad, number 109. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, once connected belief in Allah, the Exalted, and Judgment Day to treating a neighbor kindly in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 174. This narration alone is enough to indicate the seriousness of treating neighbors kindly. A narration found in Imam Bukhari's Adab al-Mufrad, number 119, warns that a woman who fulfilled her obligatory duties and offered much voluntary worship would go to hell because she mistreated her neighbors through her speech. If this is the case for the one who harms their neighbor through words, can one imagine the seriousness of physically harming one's neighbor? A Muslim must be patient when mistreated by their neighbor. In fact, a Muslim should treat them kindly in cases like this. Repaying good with good is not difficult. A good neighbor is the one who repays harm with good. A Muslim should respect the private space of their neighbor's property, but at the same time greet them and offer them help without being too intrusive. They should be supported by whatever means is available to a person, such as financial or emotional support. A Muslim should always conceal the faults of their neighbors. The one who conceals the faults of others will have their faults concealed by Allah, the Exalted. 
And the one who exposes the faults of others, Allah, the Exalted, will expose their faults and publicly disgrace them. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4880. All difficulties. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, once advised that a Muslim is rewarded for everything, even a pain caused by a stone, the breaking of their sandal strap or something which they thought was lost and then they found it in their garment. This has been discussed in Imam Suyuti's Tariq al kulafa page 99. In a narration found in Imam Bukhari's Adab al-Mufrad, number 492, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that a Muslim does not face any type of physical difficulty, irrespective of its size, such as a prick of a thorn, or any emotional difficulty, such as stress, except Allah, the Exalted, erases their sins because of it. This refers to minor sins, as major sins require sincere repentance. This outcome occurs when a Muslim remains patient from the onset of the difficulty until the end of their life. This is important to understand as many people believe they can complain initially and then show patience after. This is not true patience, instead it is only acceptance which occurs with the passing of time. This has been indicated in a narration found in Sunan and Nasai, number 1870. In addition, Patience needs to be shown throughout one's life, as a person can destroy their reward by showing impatience down the line. A Muslim should remember that it is far better to have their minor sins erased through these difficulties, than to reach the day of judgment while still possessing them. A Muslim should constantly repent and strive to perform righteous deeds in order to erase their minor sins. And if they encounter any physical or emotional difficulties, they should remain patient, hoping for their minor sins to be erased, and to obtain an uncountable reward. Chapter 39 as zuma verse 10 Indeed the patient will be given their reward without account, i.e., limit. Using things correctly. During his caliphate, Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, had a house which acted as the public treasury, which was initially located in the outskirts of Medina. Later on, it was moved to the central part of Medina, within his home. He never appointed a guard over it, and instead secured it with a lock. Whenever any public wealth would come to him, he would store it in the public treasury, but had the habit of swiftly distributing it equally to the needy. After his death, Umar ibn Qatab, may Allah be pleased with him, entered the public treasury with the two trustees who were appointed over it by Abu Bakr. Abdur Rahman ibn Awf and Uthman ibn Affan, may Allah be pleased with them. After entering it they found nothing inside, as Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, disliked storing wealth. This has been discussed in Imam Suyuti's Tariq al kulafa page 67. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, understood a fact that is ignored by many today. Namely, wealth is only useful when it is used in ways pleasing to Allah, the Exalted. Hoarding or misusing it prevents this benefit. In reality, in most cases nothing in this material world in itself is good or bad, such as wealth. What makes a thing good or bad is the way it is used. It is important to understand that the very purpose of everything which was created by Allah, the Exalted, was for it to be used correctly according to the teachings of Islam. When something is not used correctly, it in reality becomes useless. For example, wealth is useful in both worlds when it is used correctly, such as being spent on the necessities of a person and their dependents. But it can become useless and even a curse for its bearer if it is not used correctly, such as being hoarded or spent on sinful things. Simply hoarding wealth causes wealth to lose value. How can paper and metal coins one tucks away be useful? In this respect, there is no difference between a blank piece of paper and a note of money. It is only useful when it is used correctly. So if a Muslim desires all their worldly possessions to become a blessing for them in both worlds, all they have to do is use them correctly according to the teachings found in the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. But if they use them incorrectly, then the same blessing will become a burden and curse for them in both worlds. It is as simple as that. Remaining focused. 
When Khalid bin Walid headed for Syria, Al Muthanna ibn Haratha, may Allah be pleased with them, was appointed in charge of the Iraq expedition. He continued marching forward until he reached the capital of the Persian Empire. He desired to enlist some of the former apostates who had now repented and returned to the fold of Islam in order to finish the expedition of Iraq. He sought permission from Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, but did not receive a response for some time and then decided to visit him in person. When he reached Medina, Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, was on his deathbed. Even though he was facing death, it did not deter him from focusing his efforts on serving the people. He ordered Umar ibn Khattab to fulfill the request of al muthanna may Allah be pleased with them, and urged them both to remain firm on the sincere obedience of Allah, the Exalted, irrespective of the calamity that might befall them. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, pages 614-615. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, remaining focused on serving Islam and the people, even on his deathbed, indicates his steadfast nature. In a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 159, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, gave a short but far-reaching piece of advice. He advised people to sincerely declare their belief in Allah, the Exalted, and then remain steadfast on it. Remaining steadfast on one's faith means that they must strive in the sincere obedience of Allah, the Exalted, in all aspects of their life. It consists of fulfilling the commands of Allah, the Exalted, which relate to Him, such as the obligatory fasts and those which relate to people, such as treating others kindly. It includes refraining from all the prohibitions of Islam, which are between a person and Allah, the Exalted, and those involving others. A Muslim must also face destiny with patience truly believing Allah, the Exalted, chooses what is best for his servants. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 216 But perhaps you hate a thing and it is good for you, and perhaps you love a thing and it is bad for you. And Allah knows while you know not. Steadfastness can include refraining from both types of polytheism. The major type is when one worships something other than Allah, the Exalted. The minor type is when one shows off their good deeds to others. This has been warned in a narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 3989. Therefore, an aspect of steadfastness is to always act for the sake of Allah, the Exalted. It includes obeying Allah, the Exalted, at all times instead of obeying and pleasing oneself or others. If a Muslim disobeys Allah, the Exalted, by pleasing themselves or others, they should know neither their desires nor people will protect them from Allah, the Exalted. On the other hand, the one who is sincerely obedient to Allah, the Exalted, will be protected from all things by him, even if this protection is not apparent to them. Remaining steadfast on one's faith includes following the path set out by the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and not adopting a path which deviates from this. The one who strives to adopt this path will not need anything else, as this is enough to keep them steadfast on their faith. As people are not perfect, they will undoubtedly make mistakes and commit sins. So being steadfast in matters of faith does not mean one has to be perfect, but it means they must strive to adhere strictly to the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, as outlined earlier and to sincerely repent if they commit a sin. This has been indicated in chapter 41 Fusilat, verse 6. So take a straight course to him and seek his forgiveness. This is further supported by a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1987, which advises to fear Allah, the Exalted, and to erase a minor sin which has occurred by performing a righteous deed. In another narration found in Imam Malik's Mawata, Book 2, Narration Number 37, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised Muslims to try their best to remain steadfast on the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, even though they will not be able to do it perfectly. Therefore, a Muslim's duty is to fulfill the potential they have been given through their intention and physical actions in the steadfast obedience of Allah, the Exalted. They have not been commanded to achieve perfection, as this is not possible. 
It is important to note that one cannot remain steadfast in the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, through their physical actions without purifying their heart first. As indicated in a narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 3984, the limbs of the body will only act in a pure way if the spiritual heart is pure. Purity of heart is only achieved by gaining and acting on the teachings of the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. Steadfast obedience requires one to control their tongue as it expresses the heart. Without controlling the tongue, steadfast obedience to Allah, the Exalted, is not possible. This has been advised in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2407. Finally, if any deficiency in the steadfast obedience of Allah, the Exalted, occurs, one must make sincere repentance to Allah, the Exalted, and seek the forgiveness of people if it involves their rights. Chapter 46 Al-Akaf, verse 13. Indeed those who have said, Our Lord is Allah, and then remained on a right course, there will be no fear concerning them, nor will they grieve. Seeking Advice During his final illness, Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, sought the advice of the senior companions, may Allah be pleased with them, in respect to nominating the next Caliph of Islam. Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, pages 724-725. Muslims should only consult a few people in respect to their affairs. They should select these few people according to the advice of the Holy Quran. Chapter 16 and now, verse 43. So, ask the people of the message if you do not know. This verse reminds Muslims to consult those who possess knowledge as consulting an ignorant person only leads to further trouble. Just like a person would be foolish to consult a car mechanic over their physical health, a Muslim should only consult those who possess knowledge about it and the Islamic teachings linked to them. In addition, a Muslim should only consult those who fear Allah, the Exalted. This is because they will never advise others to disobey Allah, the Exalted. Whereas, those who do not fear or obey Allah, the Exalted, might possess knowledge and experience, but they will easily advise others to disobey Allah, the Exalted, which only increases one's problems. In reality, those who fear Allah, the Exalted, possess true knowledge and only this knowledge will guide others through their problems successfully. Chapter 35 Fatir, verse 28 Only those fear Allah from among his servants who have knowledge for the greater good. During his final illness, Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, sought the advice of the senior companions, may Allah be pleased with them, in respect to nominating the next Caliph of Islam. Each companion, may Allah be pleased with them, who was consulted, confirmed that Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, was the right man for the job, as he was undoubtedly the best of them, second only to Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him. Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, pages 724-725. The first thing to note is that Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, was not considering the next caliph based on worldly reasons such as family ties, friendship, etc. He did not appoint a relative like his son, desiring thereby to carry on his name. Unlike the leaders of today, his decision was solely for the pleasure of Allah, the Exalted, and based on who was best for the job. Since the passing of the righteous predecessors, the strength of the Muslim nation has weakened dramatically. It is logical that the greater the number of people in a group, the stronger the group will become, yet Muslims have somehow defied this logic. The strength of the Muslim nation has only decreased as the number of Muslims have increased. One of the main reasons this has occurred is connected to chapter 5 al maida verse 2 of the Holy Quran. And cooperate in righteousness and piety, but do not cooperate in sin and aggression. Allah, the Exalted, clearly commands Muslims to aid each other in any matter which is good and not support each other in any matter which is bad. This is what the righteous predecessors acted on, but many Muslims have failed to follow in their footsteps. Many Muslims now observe who is doing an action, instead of observing what they are doing. 
If the person is linked to them, for example, a relative, they support them even if the thing is not good. Similarly, if the person has no relationship with them, they turn away from supporting them, even if the thing is good. This attitude completely contradicts the traditions of the righteous predecessors. They would support others in good irrespective of who was doing it. In fact, they went so far on acting on this verse of the Holy Quran that they would even support those they did not get on with, as long as it was a good thing. The other thing connected to this is that many Muslims fail to support each other in good as they believe the person they are supporting will gain more prominence than them. This condition has even affected scholars and Islamic educational institutes. They make lame excuses not to aid others in good as they do not have a relationship with them and they fear their own institution will be forgotten and those they help will gain further respect in society. But this is completely wrong as one only needs to turn the pages of history to observe the truth. As long as one's intention is to please Allah, the exalted, supporting others in good will increase their respect within society. Allah, the exalted, will cause the hearts of the people to turn to them, even if their support is for another organization, institution or person. For example, when the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, departed this world Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, could have easily challenged for the caliphate and would have found plenty of support in his favor. But he knew the right thing to do was to nominate Abu Bakr Siddiq, may Allah be pleased with him, as the first caliph of Islam. Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, did not worry about being forgotten by society if he supported another person. He instead obeyed the command in the verse mentioned earlier and supported what was right. This is confirmed in the narrations found in Sahih Bukhari, Numbers 3667 and 3668. The honor and respect of Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, within society only increased by this action. This is obvious to those who are aware of Islamic history. Muslims must reflect on this deeply, change their mentality and strive to aid others in good irrespective of who is doing it and not hold back fearing their support will cause them to be forgotten within society. Those who obey Allah, the exalted, will never be forgotten in both this world and the next. In fact, their respect and honor will only grow in both worlds. Fearing leadership. When Abu Bakr made his decision to appoint Umar ibn Qatar, may Allah be pleased with them, as the next caliph, the latter blankly refused out of fear for the trials leadership brings with it. But Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, insisted until he forced Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, to agree. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, page 728. In a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2376, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned that craving for wealth and status is more destructive to one's faith than the destruction caused by two hungry wolves which are set free on a herd of sheep. This shows that hardly any of a Muslim's faith remains secure if they crave after wealth and fame in this world, just as hardly any of the sheep will be saved from two hungry wolves. So this great similitude contains a severe warning against the evil of craving after excess wealth and social status in the world. A person's craving for fame and status is arguably more destructive to one's faith than craving for excess wealth. A person will often spend their beloved wealth on obtaining fame and prestige. It is rare for someone to obtain status and fame and still remain firm on the correct path whereby they prioritize the hereafter over the material world. In fact, a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6723, warns that a person who seeks status in society, such as leadership, will be left to deal with it themselves. But if someone receives it without asking for it, they will be aided by Allah, the Exalted, in remaining obedient to Him. This is the reason the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, would not appoint a person who requested to be appointed in a position of authority or even showed desire for it. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6923. Another narration found in Sahih Bukhari, 
Number 7148 warns that people will be keen to obtain status and authority, but it will be a great regret for them on the day of judgment. This is a dangerous craving as it forces one to strive intensely to obtain it and then strive further in order to hold on to it, even if it encourages them to commit oppression and other sins. The worst type of craving for status is when one obtains this through religion. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has warned in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2654, that this person will go to hell. Therefore, it is safer for a Muslim to avoid the craving for excess wealth and high social status, as they are two things which can lead to the destruction of their faith by distracting them from preparing adequately for the hereafter. Obeying in good things. During his final illness, Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, publicly addressed the people of Medina and informed him of his decision to appoint Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, as the next Caliph of Islam. They all declared that they would listen and obey Umar, may Allah be pleased with him. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, page 728. According to one account, before naming Umar ibn Khattab, Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with them, asked the people if they would be content with the person he chose. Ali ibn Abu Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, stood up and declared they would not be pleased unless it was Umar, may Allah be pleased with him. This has been discussed in Imam Suyuti's Tariq al-Kulafa, page 71. In a narration found in Sahih Muslim number 196, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that Islam is sincerity towards the leaders of society. This includes kindly offering them the best advice and supporting them in their good decisions by any means necessary, such as financial or physical help. According to a narration found in Imam Malik's Mawata, book number 56, narration number 20, fulfilling this duty pleases Allah, the Exalted. Chapter 4 and Nisa, verse 59. O you who have believed, obey Allah and obey the Messenger and those in authority among you. This makes it clear that it is a duty to obey the leaders of society. But it is important to note, this obedience is a duty as long as one does not disobey Allah, the Exalted. There is no obedience to the creation if it leads to the disobedience of the Creator. In cases like this, revolting against leaders should be avoided as it only leads to the harm of innocent people. Instead, the leaders should be gently advised good and forbidden evil according to the teachings of Islam. One should advise others to act accordingly and always supplicate for the leaders to remain on the correct path. If the leaders remain straight, the general public will remain straight also. To be deceitful towards the leaders is a sign of hypocrisy, which one must avoid at all times. Sincerity also includes striving to obey them in matters which unite society on good and warning against anything which causes disruption in society. Accepting destiny. During his final illness, people visited Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, and inquired whether he called a doctor. He replied that the doctor had already seen him and said, I do whatever I want. This has been discussed in Imam al-Asfahani's Hilyat al awliya number 53. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, was referring to Allah, the Exalted. He adopted contentment with the decree and choice of Allah, the Exalted, as he understood that all his decrees are best for those involved, even if the wisdoms behind them are hidden. It is important for Muslims to understand a simple thing which can aid them with patiently facing destiny and the difficulties it brings. A person happily takes a bitter medicine which their doctor prescribes fully trusting in their knowledge, experience and choice, all the while believing that their doctor knows what is best for them. This is true even though they are only human and prone to errors. Yet, many Muslims fail to place this same level of trust in Allah, the Exalted, even though his knowledge is infinite and his choice is always the wisest. Muslims should try to accept destiny and the troubles it brings, just like they take the bitter medicine without complaining knowing it is best for them. They should understand that the troubles and difficulties they face are best for them, 
even if they do not understand or observe the wisdoms in them, just like they do not understand the science behind the bitter medicine they happily take. Even though in most cases, they will never understand the science behind the bitter medicine they take, a time will certainly come, whether in this world or in the hereafter, when the wisdom behind the bitter difficulties they faced will be revealed to them. So a Muslim should anticipate this time patiently, knowing all will be revealed shortly. Pondering deeply over this can increase one's patience when dealing with difficulties. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 216 But perhaps you hate a thing and it is good for you, and perhaps you love a thing and it is bad for you. And Allah knows while you know not. Beyond Justice during his final illness, Abu Bakr told his daughter, Aisha, may Allah be pleased with them, to return the few items he was given from the public treasury during his caliphate to Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him. They were a camel whose milk he and his family used to drink, a bowl in which they prepared food and some clothes they used to wear. This has been discussed in Imam Suyuti's Tariq al-Kulafa, page 66. These things were allocated to him, as he was busy leading the Muslims. Instead of allowing his family to inherit them from him, he returned them to the next caliph. In a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 4721, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that those who acted with justice will be sitting on thrones of light close to Allah, the Exalted, on Judgment Day. This includes those who are just in their decisions, in respect to their families and those under their care and authority. It is important for Muslims to always act with justice in all occasions. One must show justice to Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions and by facing destiny with patience. They must use all the blessings they have been granted in the correct way according to the teachings of Islam. This includes being just to their own body and mind by fulfilling their rights of food and rest, as well as using each limb according to its true purpose. Islam does not teach Muslims to push their body and minds beyond their limits, thereby causing them self-harm. One should be just in respect to people by treating them how they wish to be treated by others. They should never compromise on the teachings of Islam by committing injustice to people in order to obtain worldly things. This will be a major cause of people entering hell, which has been indicated in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6579. They should remain just even if it contradicts their desires and the desires of their loved ones. Chapter 4 and Nisa, verse 135. O you who have believed, be persistently standing firm in justice, witnesses for Allah, even if it be against yourselves or parents and relatives. Whether one is rich or poor, Allah is more worthy of both point one so follow not personal inclination, lest you not be just. One must be just towards their dependents by fulfilling their rights and necessities according to the teachings of Islam, which has been advised in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 2928. They should not be neglected nor handed over to others such as school and mosque teachers. A person should not take on this responsibility if they are too lazy to act with justice in regards to them. To conclude, no person is free of acting with justice as the minimum is acting with justice in respect to Allah, the Exalted, and oneself. Best Conduct During his final illness, Abu Bakr told his daughter, Aisha, may Allah be pleased with them to distribute his paltry wealth to his inheritors according to the Holy Quran and to include his unborn child, as his wife was pregnant at the time. He suspected the unborn child was a girl and after his death, she was born. This has been discussed in Imam Suyuti's Tariq al-Kulafa, pages 71 to 72. This indicates how concerned Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, was in respect to treating his relatives with kindness and justice. A branch of Islam which is often overlooked by Muslims. In a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2612, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that the one who possesses complete faith is the one who is best in conduct and most kind to their family. Unfortunately, 
Some have adopted the bad habit of treating non-relatives in a kind manner while mistreating their own family. They behave in this manner as they do not understand the importance of treating one's own family kindly and as they fail to appreciate their family. A Muslim will never achieve success until they fulfill both aspects of faith. The first is fulfilling their duties towards Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions, and by facing destiny with patience according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. The second is to fulfill the rights of people, which includes treating them kindly. None have more right to this kind treatment than one's own family. A Muslim must aid their family in all matters which are good, and warn them against bad things and practices in a gentle way, according to the teachings of Islam. They should not blindly support them in bad things simply because they are their relatives, neither should they fail to help them in good matters, because of some ill feelings towards them, as this contradicts Islamic teachings. Chapter 5 al maida verse 2 And cooperate in righteousness and piety, but do not cooperate in sin and aggression. The best way to guide others is through a practical example, as this is the tradition of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him, and is much more effective than just verbal guidance. Finally, one should generally choose gentleness in all matters especially when dealing with their family. Even if they commit sins they should be warned in a gentle manner and still be aided in matters which are good, as this kindness is more effective in bringing them back to the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, than treating them harshly. Preparing for Death During his final illness, Aisha recited a poem to her father, Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with them. But he directed her attention to the words of Allah, the Exalted, chapter 50 kaf, verse 19. And the intoxication of death will bring the truth, that is what you were trying to avoid. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, pages 732 to 733. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, was reminding her and by extension others the importance of preparing for death. Death is something which is certain to occur, but the time is unknown. So it therefore makes sense that a Muslim who believes in the hereafter prioritizes preparing for it, over preparing for things which might not occur, such as marriage, children, or their retirement. It is strange how many Muslims have adopted the opposite mentality, even though they testify that the world is temporary and uncertain, whereas the hereafter is permanent, and they are certain to reach it. No matter how one behaves, they will be judged regarding their deeds. A Muslim should not be fooled into believing that they can and will prepare for the hereafter in the future, as this attitude only causes them to delay further until their death occurs and they leave this world with regrets that will not aid them. So the important thing is not that people will die, as this is unavoidable, but the key is acting in such a way that one is fully prepared for it. The only way to prepare for it correctly is by acting on the teachings of Islam, namely, fulfilling the commands of Allah, the Exalted, refraining from His prohibitions and facing destiny with patience. This is only possible when one prioritizes preparing for the hereafter over preparing for things which might not occur. Sending ahead good. During his final illness, Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, advised his family to wash the clothes he was wearing and enshroud him in them, instead of buying a new garment as his shroud. When he was requested for permission to buy a new shroud for him, he replied that the living were more deserving of new garments than the dead. Even though Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, was the caliph of the Muslim nation, yet he chose to lead a simple life, a life of poverty, just like the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. He was too busy striving to benefit the people, to worry about his own needs. By sacrificing his own comfort, he aimed to make the lives of his people comfortable. The paltry salary he took from the treasury over his two years as caliph was also returned to the public treasury, thereby ensuring he served the Muslims solely for the pleasure of Allah, the Exalted. He took nothing from this world and the world took nothing from him. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, 
The Biography of Abu Bakr, as Siddiq, pages 734 to 735. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, concentrated more on preparing for his final journey to the hereafter than to accumulate, hoard, and enjoy the luxuries of this world. How far are the leaders of today and the common Muslims from this blessed attitude? In a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6514, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned that two things abandon a deceased at their grave and only one thing remains with them. The two things which abandon them are their family and wealth, and the only thing which remains with them are their deeds. Throughout history, people have always concentrated the majority of their efforts to obtaining wealth and a happy family. Even though Islam does not prohibit these things, as they may be required to fulfill one's responsibilities for example, wealth is required to support one's dependents. Islam only discourages Muslims from striving for them beyond their needs and prioritizing them over more important duties, such as performing righteous deeds. One must strive to obtain the needed wealth to fulfill their responsibilities, according to the teachings of Islam, and obtain a family which will encourage them to prepare for the hereafter. These are both considered good deeds when utilized in such a manner. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6373. This is the sign of an intelligent person who gives priority to the thing which will endure and support them in their moment of need, namely, righteous deeds. On the other hand, the one who allows their wealth and relatives to preoccupy them from fulfilling the commands of Allah, the Exalted, and refraining from his prohibitions, are described as losers in the Holy Quran. Chapter 63 al munafikin verse 9 O you who have believed, let not your wealth and your children divert you from the remembrance of Allah. And whoever does that, then those are the losers. Some may incorrectly believe they are close to Allah, the Exalted, as He has bestowed them with great wealth and family. But Allah, the Exalted, clears their confusion by declaring that the one who is dearer and nearer to him are those who believe and perform righteous deeds. Chapter 34 Saba, verse 37 And it is not your wealth or your children that bring you nearer to us in position, but it is by being one who has believed and done righteousness. In another place of the Holy Quran Allah, the Exalted, warns mankind that their wealth and relatives will not benefit them in the hereafter unless they reach the hereafter with a sound heart. Chapter 26 Ash-Shu'ara, verses 88 to 89 The day when there will not benefit anyone wealth or children, but only one who comes to Allah with a sound heart. The definition of the sound heart is lengthy simply put one cannot obtain it until they sincerely fulfill the commands of Allah, the Exalted, refrain from his prohibitions and face destiny with patience according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. One's wealth can only benefit them in the hereafter if they send it ahead of them by spending it on ongoing charity projects. This is confirmed by the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1376. The same narration informs mankind that a righteous child praying for the forgiveness of their deceased parent will be accepted also. Unfortunately, in this day and age, many children are too busy seeking their inheritance to supplicate for their deceased parents. It is important to understand that raising a righteous child who supplicates for their deceased parent is not possible to achieve if the parents do not perform righteous deeds themselves during their lives. Secondly, it is not the way of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, or his companions, may Allah be pleased with them all, to abstain from performing righteous deeds and hope others will pray for them after they depart from this world. One should strive for righteous deeds while they are alive, and then hope others will pray for them after they pass away. It is important to understand that only the wealth one sends forward will benefit them. This can be achieved by spending on fulfilling one's responsibilities, such as the education of their children. All wealth spent incorrectly will become a burden for the owner and may well lead to their punishment. 
Those who withhold the obligatory charity out of greed have been warned of dreadful punishments. For example, a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 1403, warns that a person who commits this grave sin on the day of judgment will encounter a huge poisonous snake which will wrap around them and bite them continuously. Chapter 3 Ali Imran, verse 180 And let not those who greedily withhold what Allah has given them of his bounty ever think that it is better for them. Rather, it is worse for them. Their necks will be encircled by what they withheld on the day of resurrection. A narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 1658, warns that on the day of judgment, the gold and silver a person owned will be heated up in the flames of hell, and their bodies will be branded with it if they fail to donate the obligatory charity due on it. Any wealth left behind by the deceased will be left to others to enjoy while the deceased is held accountable for collecting it. It is important to note, if a person knowingly leaves wealth to someone who is not fit to possess it, and thus misuses it, then the deceased may well be held accountable for this also. Conversely, if one leaves wealth behind to someone who spends it correctly, then the deceased will face much regret on the day of judgment when they observe the great reward given to the one who spent it correctly. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, made it clear in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 7420, that in reality a person can only use their wealth in three ways. The first is the wealth which is spent on their food. The second is the wealth spent on their clothes, and the final wealth is what they spend in ways pleasing to Allah, the exalted. All other wealth is left behind for other people to enjoy, while the deceased is held accountable for collecting it. Hoarding and incorrectly spending wealth inspires one to love the material world and dislike the hereafter, as they dislike leaving their much-loved wealth behind, which will occur when they die. The one who dislikes the hereafter will not adequately prepare for it. In addition, if one desires to adopt true piety, then they must be ready to spend their wealth for the sake of Allah, the Exalted. Chapter 3 Ali Imran, verse 92 Never will you attain the good reward until you spend in the way of Allah from that which you love. In reality, wealth is a strange companion as it only benefits someone when it leaves them meaning when it is spent in the correct way. A person would be labelled a fool if they went on a long trip without any provisions. Similarly, the one who does not send their wealth ahead in the form of provisions for their long journey to the hereafter is also foolish. There is no doubt that one of the greatest pains a person feels at the time of death is when they realise that they are leaving behind their hard-earned wealth and journeying towards the hereafter empty-handed. A Muslim should avoid this outcome at all costs. Performing righteous deeds is the only way one prepares for their grave, as no other things of comfort will be found there. It is in fact the means for preparing one's eternal home in the hereafter. Therefore, this preparation should take priority over preparing for the temporal material world. A person would be labelled a fool if they had two homes and dedicated the majority of their efforts on beautifying the home which they will spend less time in. Similarly, if a Muslim dedicates more time and effort in beautifying their temporal home in this world over the eternal home of the hereafter, they too are simply foolish. This is the attitude of some, even though they admit and believe their stay in this world is short and for an unknown length whereas, their stay in the hereafter will be eternal. This attitude indicates a lack of certainty of faith, and it is therefore vital for anyone who shares this mentality to seek and act on Islamic knowledge in order to strengthen their certainty of faith before they reach the hereafter, bereft of all good. The one who prepares for their grave with sincere obedience to Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling his commands, refraining from his prohibitions, and by facing destiny with patience will find that their good deeds provide comfort for them, whereas, the sins there accumulated will only make their stay in the dark grave worse. A Muslim should therefore perform good deeds during their strength and ability before their time of weakness arrives. Each Muslim should recognize the reality indicated in the main narration and act correctly with their possessions before they reach a time when their request to be given more time to perform righteous deeds will be denied. Chapter 63 Al-Munafikan verses 10 to 11 
and spend in the way of Allah, from what we have provided you before death approaches one of you, and he says, My Lord, if only you would delay me for a brief term so I would give charity and be of the righteous. But never will Allah delay a soul when its time has come. They should reflect now on their deeds, so that they can sincerely repent from sins and strive harder to perform righteous deeds before a day arrives when reflecting will not benefit them. Chapter 89 Al-Fajr, verse 23 And brought within view that day is hell, that day man will remember but how i.e. what good to him will be the remembrance. Let each one ponder over those who passed away before them, and their inability to perform more righteous deeds, to comfort them in their moment of need. Make haste before this time arrives, and prepare for the inevitable. Chapter 15 al hijjah verse 99 And worship your Lord until there comes to you the certainty, i.e., death. A final counsel. During his final illness, Abu Bakr summoned Umar ibn Qatab, may Allah be pleased with them, and gave him some final advice, which has been discussed in Imam al-Asfahani's, Hiliyat al awliya number 59. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, advised him to firstly fear Allah, the Exalted, at all times. Piety, fearing Allah, the Exalted, cannot be achieved without gaining and acting on Islamic knowledge so that one can fulfill the commands of Allah, the Exalted, refrain from his prohibitions and face destiny with patience according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Chapter 35 Fatir, verse 28 only those fear Allah from among his servants who have knowledge. In a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2451, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon, advised that a Muslim cannot become pious until they avoid something which is not harmful to their religion, out of caution that it will lead to something which is harmful. Therefore, an aspect of piety is to avoid things which are doubtful, not just unlawful. This is because doubtful things takes a Muslim one step closer to the unlawful, and the closer one is to the unlawful, the easier it is to fall into it. It is why a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1205, advises that the one who avoids unlawful and doubtful things will protect their religion and honor. If one observes those who have become misguided in society, in most cases, this occurred gradually, not in one sudden step. Meaning, the person first indulged in doubtful things before falling into the unlawful. This is the reason why Islam stresses the need to avoid unnecessary and vain things in one's life, as they can lead them to the unlawful. For example, vain and useless speech which is not classified sinful by Islam often leads to evil speech, such as backbiting, lying and slander. If a person avoids the first step by not indulging in vain speech, they will undoubtedly avoid evil speech. This process can be applied to all things which are vain, unnecessary, and especially, doubtful. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, also advised him that Allah, the Exalted, had set obligations that must be done by day, which he will not accept if they are completed at night. And he had set obligations that must be done at night, which he will not accept if they are done during the day. And he does not accept voluntary deeds until the obligatory deeds are performed first. This advice indicates the importance of adhering to the teachings of Islam and avoiding charting one's own course in life. In a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4606, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned that any matter which is not based on Islam will be rejected. If Muslims desire lasting success in both worldly and religious matters, they must strictly adhere to the teachings of the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Even though, certain actions which are not directly taken from these two sources of guidance, can still be considered a righteous deed, it is important to prioritize these two sources of guidance over all else. Because the fact is that the more one ACTS on things which are not taken from these two sources, even if it is a righteous deed, the less they will act on these two sources of guidance. An obvious example is how many Muslims have adopted cultural practices into their lives which do not have a foundation in these two sources of guidance. Even if these cultural practices are not sins, they have preoccupied Muslims from learning and acting on these two sources of guidance as they feel satisfied with their behavior. 
This leads to ignorance of the two sources of guidance, which in turn will only lead to misguidance. This is why a Muslim must learn and act on these two sources of guidance, which have been established by the leaders of guidance, and only then act on other voluntary righteous deeds if they have the time and energy to do so. But if they choose ignorance and made up practices, even if they are not sins over learning and acting on these two sources of guidance, they will not achieve success. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, also advised him that a person's scale on judgment day will weigh heavy in their favor when they follow the truth in this world, even though it was heavy upon them to do so. And a person's scale on judgment will be light in their favor when they follow falsehood in this world. In a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1971, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, discussed the importance of truthfulness and avoiding lies. The first part advises that truthfulness leads to righteousness, which in turn leads to paradise. When a person persists on truthfulness, they are recorded by Allah, the Exalted, as a truthful person. It is important to note that truthfulness has three levels. The first is when one is truthful in their intention and sincerity. Meaning, they act only for the sake of Allah, the Exalted, and do not benefit others for an ulterior motive such as fame. This in fact is the foundation of Islam, as every action is judged on one's intention. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 1. The next level is when one is truthful through their words. This in reality means they avoid all types of verbal sins, not just lies. As the one who indulges in other verbal sins, cannot be a real truthful person. An excellent way of achieving this is by acting on a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2317, which advises that a person can only make their Islam excellent when they avoid getting involved in the things which do not concern them. The majority of verbal sins occur because a Muslim discusses something which does not concern them. The final stage is truthfulness in actions. This is achieved through the sincere obedience of Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions, and being patient with destiny, according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, without cherry-picking or misinterpreting the teachings of Islam which suit one's desires. They must adhere to hierarchy and priority order set by Allah, the Exalted, in all actions. The consequences of the opposite of these levels of truthfulness, namely, lying, according to the main narration under discussion, is that it leads to disobedience which in turn leads to the fire of hell. When one persists on this attitude, they will be recorded as a great liar by Allah, the Exalted. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, also advised him that a servant must be balanced between fear and hope, fear of hell and hope of obtaining paradise. The servant should not consider their devotion as valuable, nor should they despair of the mercy and favor of Allah, the Exalted. In a long divine narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 7405, Allah, the Exalted, advises that he ACTS and treats his servant according to their perception of him. This means if a Muslim has good thoughts and expects good from Allah, the Exalted, he in turn will not disappoint them. Similarly, if a person harbors negative thoughts about Allah, the Exalted, such as believing they will not be forgiven, then Allah, the Exalted, may act according to their belief. It is important to note, there is a vast difference between true hope in Allah, the Exalted, which this narration refers to, and wishful thinking. Wishful thinking is when one fails to strive in the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions, and by facing destiny with patience, and then expects Allah, the Exalted, to forgive them. This is not true hope, it is merely wishful thinking. This is like a farmer who fails to plant any seeds, fails to water their crop, and still hopes to reap a large harvest. True hope is when one strives to obey Allah, the Exalted, and whenever they slip up they sincerely repent and then hope for the mercy and forgiveness of Allah, the Exalted. This is like a farmer who plants seeds, waters their crop, dedicates effort to keeping the crop healthy and then hopes for a large harvest. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has summarized this explanation in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2459. 
Generally speaking, a Muslim should harbor more fear of Allah, the Exalted, during their life as it prevents sins which is superior to hope, which inspires one to perform righteous deeds especially, the voluntary type. But during periods of illness and difficulty, and especially at the time of death, a Muslim should have nothing but hope in the mercy of Allah, the Exalted, even if they have spent their life disobeying Him, as this has specifically been commanded by the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 2877. Final words. After requesting to be buried next to the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, his final words was a supplication from the Holy Quran, which again highlights his great attachment to the Book of Allah, the Exalted. Chapter 12 Yusuf, verse 101. Cause me to die a Muslim and join me with the righteous. Then he departed this material world at the age of 63, the same age the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, passed away. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, pages 735 to 738. Every Muslim openly declares that they desire the companionship of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, Peace and blessings be upon him, the other holy prophets, peace be upon him then, and the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, in the hereafter. They often quote the narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 3688, which advises that a person will be with those they love in the hereafter. And because of this, they openly declare their love for these righteous servants of Allah, the exalted. But it is strange how they desire this outcome and claim love for the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. Yet they barely know him as they are too busy to study his life, character and teachings. This is foolish, as how can one truly love someone they do not even know? In addition, when these people are asked for proof of their love for the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, on Judgment Day, what will they say? What will they present? The proof of this declaration is studying and acting on the life, character and teachings of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. A declaration without this evidence will not be accepted by Allah, the Exalted. This is quite obvious as no one understood Islam better than the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, did, and this was not their attitude. They declared love for the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and supported their claim through actions by following in his footsteps. This is why they will be with him in the hereafter. Those who believe love is in the heart and does not require it to be shown through actions, is as foolish as the student who hands back a blank exam paper to their teacher, claiming that knowledge is in their mind, so they do not need to practically write it down on paper, and then still expects to pass. The one who behaves in such a manner does not love the righteous servants of Allah, the exalted, only their own desires, and they have undoubtedly been fooled by the devil. Finally, it is important to note that members of other religions also claim love for their holy prophets, peace be upon them. But as they fail to follow in their footsteps and act on their teachings, they will certainly not be with them on judgment day. This is quite obvious if one ponders over this fact for a moment. A truthful eulogy. After Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, passed away, Medina sank into sadness, similar to the sadness it faced during the death of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Ali ibn Abu Talib stood outside the home of Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with them, and gave the following eulogy. O oh Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with you. You were the closet companion and friend of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. You were a comfort to him, and the one he trusted the most. If he had a secret, he would tell it to you. And if he needed to consult someone regarding a matter, he would consult you. You were the first of your people to embrace Islam, and you were the most sincere of them in faith. Your faith was stronger than any other person's, as was the degree to which you feared Allah, the Exalted. And you were wealthier than anyone else in religious knowledge. You cared most for both the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and Islam. Of all people, you were the best companion to the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. You possessed the best qualities, you had the best past, you ranked highest, and you were closest to him. 
And of all people you resembled the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, the most in terms of his guidance and demeanor. Your ranking was higher than anyone else's, and the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, honored you and held you in higher esteem than anyone else. On behalf of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and Islam, may Allah reward you with the best of rewards. When the people disbelieved in the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, you believed in him. Throughout his life, you were both his eyes with which he saw and his ears with which he heard. Allah the Exalted has named you truthful in his book when he said, And the one who has brought the truth, the Prophet Muhammad peace and blessings be upon him, and who believed in it, Abu Bakr may Allah be pleased with him, those are the righteous. Chapter 39 as Zuma, verse 33. When people were stingy in their support for the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, you comforted him. And when people sat still, you stood side by side with him, facing the same hardships that he faced. In times of hardship, you were truly a good and noble companion of his. You were the second of the two, his companion in the cave, and the one upon whom tranquility descended. If you do not aid him, Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Allah has already aided him when those who disbelieved had driven him out of Mecca as one of two, when they were in the cave and he, Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, said to his companion, Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, do not grieve, indeed Allah is with us. And Allah sent down his tranquility upon him and supported him with soldiers, i.e. angels you did not see. Chapter 9 at Torba, verse 40. You were his companion during the migration to Medina, and you were his successor regarding the religion of Allah, the Exalted, and his nation. And a truly good successor you proved to be when the people apostatized. You did what no other caliph of a holy prophet, peace be upon them, did before you. You stood up firmly and bravely when his other companions, may Allah be pleased with them, lost their resolve and became soft. And when they became weak, you adhered to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. You truly were as the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, said, weak in your body, but strong regarding the commands of Allah, the Exalted, humble in yourself, but lofty in your ranking with Allah, the Exalted, well esteemed in the eyes of people, honored and great in their hearts. Not a single one of them had any reason to dislike you, to be suspicious of you or hold you in contempt. You always treated the weak and humble as strong and honorable, making sure you gave them what was rightfully theirs. And in this regard, you treated relatives and strangers equally. Of all people, you respected those who were most obedient to Allah, the Exalted, and who feared Him the most. In your overall character, you embodied truth and compassion. Your speech was always characterized by the qualities of wisdom and decisiveness. And you always struck a noble balance between gentleness and firmness. You always based your decision on knowledge and once you made your decisions, you always kept a firm resolve to execute them. Indeed, to Allah the Exalted, we belong and to Him is our return. We are pleased with Him and submit to His decrees. And by Allah the Exalted, other than the death of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Muslims have never been afflicted with a greater calamity than the calamity of your death. You were always a protector, a sanctuary, and a source of honor for this religion. May Allah, the Exalted, join you with the company of his Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. And may he not deprive us of your reward, and may he not let us go astray after you. After hearing his eulogy, the people responded by declaring that Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, had spoken the truth. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, pages 736 to 738. Conclusion It is clear when studying the blessed life of Abu Bakr Siddiq, may Allah be pleased with him, that he dedicated all his efforts in pleasing Allah, the Exalted. He supported his verbal declaration of faith by practically obeying and following the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. He did not cherry-pick the commands which suited his desires, 
Rather, he submitted completely to Allah, the Exalted, and diligently implemented every command of Allah, the Exalted, and refrained from every prohibition. His single aim was to please Allah, the Exalted, and all his words and actions were directed to this noble goal. This attitude encouraged him to spiritually detach from the material world, which involves using the blessings one has been granted in ways pleasing to Allah, the Exalted, instead of according to one's own desires. And he spiritually attached to the hereafter, by dedicating his efforts towards practically preparing for it. It was this characteristic which made him and the other companions, may Allah be pleased with them, the best group after the holy prophets, peace be upon them. This truth has been discussed in Imam Abu Naim al-Asfahani's, Hilyat al awliya W.A. Tabaka al-Azfiya, narration 278. Therefore, Muslims must follow in his footsteps by learning and acting on the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, so that they too achieve peace and success in both worlds. In addition, when studying his life, it is clear that the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, did not reach the future generations easily. They reached them through the blood, tears, sweat, and sacrifices of the companions, may Allah be pleased with them. Unfortunately, this fact is often overlooked by Muslims today, as the teachings of Islam are so readily available nowadays. One can imagine how disappointing Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, would be, if he could see how the majority of Muslims dismiss the teachings of Islam, even though he and the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, sacrificed everything so that Islam could reach the future generations. No doubt, the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, will receive their rewards for their sacrifices, but Muslims must acknowledge the fact that they are indebted to them. This acknowledgement must be shown in actions, not just words. This involves sincerely learning and acting on the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. This is the only way one acknowledges, honors and loves the companions, may Allah be pleased with them. Words without actions is closer to hypocrisy than love. Finally, every Muslim openly declares that they desire the companionship of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, the other Holy Prophets, peace be upon him them, and the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, in the hereafter. They often quote the narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 3688, which advises that a person will be with those they love in the hereafter. And because of this, they openly declare their love for these righteous servants of Allah, the Exalted. But it is strange how they desire this outcome and claim love for the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him and his companions, may Allah be pleased with them, Yet they barely know them as they are too busy to study their lives, characters and teachings. How can one truly love a people they do not even know? In addition, when these people are asked for proof of their love for the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him and his companions, may Allah be pleased with them, on Judgment Day, what will they say? What will they present? The proof of this declaration is studying and acting on their lives, characters and teachings. A declaration without this evidence will not be accepted by Allah, the Exalted. This is quite obvious, as no one understood Islam better than the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, did, and this was not their attitude. They declared love for the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and supported their claim through actions by following in his footsteps. This is why they will be with him in the hereafter. Those who believe love is in the heart and does not require it to be shown through actions, is as foolish as the student who hands back a blank exam paper to their teacher, claiming that knowledge is in their mind, so they do not need to practically write it down on paper, and then still expects to pass. The one who behaves in such a manner does not love the righteous servants of Allah, the exalted, only their own desires, and they have undoubtedly been fooled by the devil. Finally, it is important to note that members of other religions also claim love for their holy prophets, peace be upon them. But as they fail to follow in their footsteps and act on their teachings, they will certainly not be with them on judgment day. This is quite obvious if one ponders over this fact for a moment. All praise is due to Allah, Lord of the worlds, and may peace and blessings be upon his final messenger, Muhammad, his noble family and companions.